Chapter One of the Four Feathers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Becky Cook. The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason. Chapter One A Crimean Night. Lieutenant Such was the first of General Feversham's guests to reach Broad Place. He arrived about five o'clock on an afternoon of sunshine in mid June and the old red brick house, lodged on a southern slope of the Surrey Hills, was glowing from a dark forest depth of pines with the warmth of a rare jewel. Lieutenant Such limped across the hall where the portraits of the Feversham's rose one above the other to the ceiling, and went out on the stone-flagged terrace at the back. There he found his host sitting erect like a boy, and gazing southward towards the Sussex Downs. "'How's the leg?' asked General Feversham, as he rose briskly from his chair. He was a small, wiry man, and, in spite of his white hairs, alert. But the alertness was out of the body. A bony face with a high, narrow forehead and steel-blue, inexpressive eyes suggested a barrenness of mind. "'It gave me trouble during the winter,' replied Such. "'But that was to be expected.' General Feversham nodded, and for a little while both men were silent. From the terrace the ground fell steeply to a wide, level plain of brown earth and emerald fields and clumps of trees. From this plain voices rose through the sunshine, small but very clear. Far away toward Horsham a coil of white smoke from a train snaked rapidly in and out amongst the trees, and on the horizon rose the downs, patched with white chalk. "'I thought that I should find you here,' said Such. "'It was my wife's favorite corner.' replied Feversham in a quite motionless voice. She would sit here by the hour. She had a queer liking for wide and empty spaces. Yes, said Such. She had imagination. Her thoughts could people them. General Feversham glanced at his companion as though he hardly understood. But he asked no questions. What he did not understand he habitually let slip from his mind is not worth comprehension. He spoke at once upon a different topic. There will be a leaf out of our table to-night. Yes, Collins, Barberton, and Vaughan went this winter. Well, we are all permanently shelved upon the world's half-pay list as it is. The obituary column is just the last formality which gazettes us out of the service altogether. And such stretched out an east as crippled leg, which fourteen years ago that day had been crushed and twisted in the fall of a scaling ladder. I am glad that you came before the others continued Feversham. I would like to take your opinion. This day is more to me than the anniversary of our attack upon the Redan, at the very moment when we are standing under arms in the dark. To the west of the quarries, I remember, interrupted Such with a deep breath. How should one forget? At that very moment Harry was born in this house. I thought, therefore, that if he did not object he might join us to-night. He happens to be at home." He will, of course, enter the service, and he might learn something, perhaps, which afterwards will be of use. One never knows. By all means, said Such, with alacrity, for since his visits to General Feversham were limited to the occasion of these anniversary dinners, he had never yet seen Harry Feversham. Such had for many years been puzzled as to the qualities in General Feversham which had attracted Muriel Graham, a woman as remarkable for the refinement of her intellect as for the beauty of her person and he could never find an explanation. He had to be content with his knowledge that for some mysterious reason she had married this man so much older than herself, and so unlike her in character. Personal courage and an indomitable self-confidence were the chief, indeed the only, qualities which sprang to light in General Feversham. Lieutenant Such went back in thought over twenty years, as he sat on his garden chair, to a time before he had taken part as an officer of the Naval Brigade, and that unsuccessful onslaught on the Redan. He remembered a season in London to which he had come fresh from the China station, and he was curious to see Harry Feversham. He did not admit that it was more than the natural curiosity of a man who, disabled in comparative youth, had made a hobby out of the study of human nature. He was interested to see whether the lad took after his mother, or his father, that was all. So that night Harry Feversham took a place at the dinner-table, and listened to the stories which his elders told while Lieutenant Such watched him. The stories were all of that dark winter in the Crimea, 
and a fresh story was always in the telling before its predecessor was ended. They were stories of death, of hazardous exploits, of the pinch of famine and the chill of snow, but they were told in clipped words, and with a matter-of-fact tone, as though the men of who related them were only conscious of them as far-off things, and there was seldom a comment more pronounced than a mere, that's curious, or an exclamation more significant than a laugh. But Harry Feversham sat listening as though the incidents thus carelessly narrated were happening actually at that moment and within the walls of that room. His dark eyes, the eyes of his mother, turned with each story from speaker to speaker, and waited wide, open, and fixed, until the last word was spoken. He listened fascinated and enthralled, and so vividly did the changes of expression shoot and quiver across his face that it seemed to such the lad must actually hear the drone of bullets in the air, actually resist the stunning shock of a charge, actually ride down in the thick of a squadron to where guns screeched out a tongue of flame from a fog. Once a major of artillery spoke of the suspense of the hours between the parading of the troops before a battle and the first command to advance, and Harry's shoulders worked under the intolerable strain of those lagging minutes. But he did more than work his shoulders. He threw a single, furtive, wavering glance backwards, and Lieutenant Such was startled, and indeed more than startled. He was pained, for this, after all, was Muriel Graham's boy. The look was too familiar a one to Such. He had seen it on the faces of recruits during their first experience of a battle, too often for him to misunderstand it, and one picture in particular rose before his mind. An advancing square at Inkerman, and a tall, big soldier rushing forward from the line in the eagerness of his attack, and then stopping suddenly, as though he suddenly understood that he was alone, and had to meet alone the charge of a mounted Cossack. Such remembered very clearly the fatal, wavering glance which the big soldier had thrown backward toward his companions, a glance accompanied by a queer, sickly smile. He remembered, too, with equal vividness its consequence, for though the soldier carried a loaded musket and a bayonet locked to the muzzle, he had without an effort of self-defense received the Cossack's lance thrust in his throat. Such glanced hurriedly about the table, afraid that General Feversham, or that some of his guests should have remarked the same look and the same smile upon Harry's face. But no one had eyes for the lad. Each visitor was waiting too eagerly for an opportunity to tell a story of his own. Such drew a breath of relief and turned to Harry. But the boy was sitting with his elbows on the cloth and his head propped between his hands, lost to the glare of the room and its glitter of silver, constructing again out of the swift succession of anecdotes a world of cries and wounds, and maddened riderless chargers and men writhing in a fog of cannon smoke. The curtest, least graphic description of the biting days and nights in the trenches set the lad shivering. Even his face grew pinched as though the iron frost of that winter was actually eating into his bones. Such touched him lightly on the elbow. "'You renew those days for me,' said he. "'Though the heat is dripping down the windows, I feel the chill of the Crimea.' Harry roused himself from his absorption. "'The stories renew them,' said he. "'No, it is you listening to the stories.' And before Harry could reply, General Feversham's voice broke sharply in from the head of the table. "'Harry! Look at the clock!' At once all eyes were turned upon the lad. The hands of the clock made the acutest of angles. It was close upon midnight, and from eight, without so much as a word or a question, he had sat at the dinner-table listening. Yet even now he rose with reluctance. "'Must I go, father?' he asked, and the general's guests intervened in a chorus. The conversation was clear gain to the lad, a first taste of powder which might stand him in good stead afterwards. "'Besides, it's the boy's birthday,' added the major of artillery. "'He wants to stay. That's plain. You wouldn't find a youngster of fourteen sit all these hours without a kick of the foot against the table-leg, unless the conversation entertained him. Let him stay, Feversham.' For once General Feversham relaxed the iron discipline under which the boy lived. "'Very well,' said he. Harry shall have a single hour's furlough from his bed. A single hour won't make much difference. Harry's eyes turned toward his father, and just for a moment rested upon his face with a curious steady gaze. It seemed to such that they uttered a question, and, rightly or wrongly, he interpreted the question into words. Are you blind? 
But General Feversham was already talking to his neighbors, and Harry quietly sat down, and again propping his chin upon his hands, listened with all his soul. Yet he was not entertained. Rather, he was enthralled. He sat quiet under the compulsion of a spell. His face became unnaturally white, his eyes unnaturally large, while the flames of the candle shone ever redder and more blurred through a blue haze of tobacco smoke, and the level of the wine grew steadily lower in the decanters. Thus half of that one hour's furlough was passed, and then General Feversham, himself jogged by the unlucky mention of a name, suddenly blurted out in his jerky fashion, "'Lord Wilmington! One of the best names in England, if you please. Did you ever see his house in Warwickshire? Every inch of the ground, you would think, would have a voice to bid him play the man, if only in remembrance of his father's. It seemed incredible, and mere camp rumour, but the rumour grew.' If it was whispered at the Alma, it was spoken aloud at Inkerman. It was shouted at Balaclava. Before Sebastopol, the hideous thing was proved. Wilmington was acting as Galloper to his general. I believed upon my soul the general chose him for the duty so that the fellow might set himself right. There were three hundred yards of bullet-swept flat ground, and a message to be carried across them. Had Wilmington toppled off his horse on the way, why, there were the whispers silenced for ever. Had he ridden through alive, he earned distinction besides. But he didn't dare. He refused. Imagine it, if you can. He sat shaking on his horse and declined. You should have seen the general. His face turned the color of that burgundy. No doubt you have a previous engagement, he said in the politest voice you ever heard. Just that, not a word of abuse. A previous engagement on the battlefield. For the life of me, I could hardly help laughing. But it was a tragic business for Wilmington. He was broken, of course, and slunk back to London. Every house was close to him. He dropped out of his circle like a lead bullet you let slip out of your hand into the sea. The very women in Piccadilly spat if he spoke to them, and he blew his brains out in a back bedroom off the haymarket. Curious, that, eh? He hadn't the pluck to face the bullets when his name was at stake. Yet he could blow his own brains out afterwards. Lieutenant Such chanced to look at the clock as the story came to an end. It was now a quarter to one. Harry Feversham still had a quarter of an hour's furlough, and that quarter of an hour was occupied by a retired surgeon general with a great wagging beard, who sat nearly opposite to the boy. "'I can tell you of an incident still more curious,' he said. "'The man in this case had never been under fire before, but he was of my own profession. Life and death were part of his business.' nor was he really in any particular danger. The affair happened during a hill campaign in India. We were encamped in a valley, and a few pathans used to lie out on the hillside at night and take long shots into the camp. A bullet ripped through the canvas of the hospital tent. That was all. The surgeon crept out to his own quarters, and his orderly discovered him half an hour afterward, lying in his blood stone dead. Hit? exclaimed the major. Not a bit of it, said the surgeon. He had quietly opened his instrument case in the dark, taken out a lancet, and severed his femoral artery. Sheer panic, do you see, at the whistle of a bullet. Even upon these men, case hardened to horrors, the incident related in its bald simplicity wrought its effects. From some there broke out a half-uttered exclamation of disbelief. Others moved restlessly in their chairs with a sort of physical discomfort, because the man had sunk so far below humanity. Here an officer gulped his wine, there a second shook his shoulders as though to shake the knowledge off as a dog shakes water. There was only one in all that company who sat perfectly still in the silence which followed upon the story. That one was the boy, Harry Feversham. He sat with his hands now clenched upon his knees, and leaning forward a little across the table toward the surgeon, his cheeks white as paper, his eyes burning, and burning with ferocity. He had the look of a dangerous animal in the trap. His body was gathered, his muscles taut. Such had a fear that the lad meant to leap across the table and strike with all his strength in the savagery of despair. He had indeed reached out a restraining hand when General Feversham's matter-of-fact voice intervened, and the boy's attitude suddenly relaxed. Queer, incomprehensible things happen. Here are two of them. You can only say they are truth, and pray God you may forget them. But you can't explain, for you can't understand." Such was moved to lay his hand upon Harry's shoulder. "'Can you?' he asked, and regretted the question almost before it was spoken. 
but it was spoken, and Harry's eyes turned swiftly toward Sutch, and rested upon his face, not, however, with any betrayal of guilt, but quietly, inscrutably. Nor did he answer the question, although it was answered in a fashion by General Feversham. "'Harry, understand!' exclaimed the general with a sort of indignation. "'How should he? He's a Feversham!' The question which Harry's glance had mutely put before, such in the same mute way repeated, "'Are you blind?' his eyes asked of General Feversham. Never had he heard an untruth so demonstrably untrue. A mere look at father and the son proved it so. Harry Feversham wore his father's name, but he had his mother's dark and haunted eyes, his mother's breadth of forehead, his mother's delicacy of profile, his mother's imagination. It needed perhaps a stranger to recognize the truth. The father had been so long familiar with the son's aspect that it had no significance to his mind. "'Look at the clock, Harry.' The hour's furlough had run out. Harry rose from his chair and drew a breath. "'Good night, sir,' he said, and walked to the door. The servants had long since gone to bed, and as Harry opened the door, the hall gaped black like the mouth of night. For a second or two the boy hesitated upon the threshold, and seemed almost to shrink back into the lighted room as though, in that dark void, peril awaited him. And peril did, the peril of his thoughts. He stepped out of the room and closed the door behind him. The decanter was sent again upon its rounds. There was a popping of soda-water bottles. The talk revolved again, and its accustomed grooved. Harry was in an instant forgotten by all but such. The lieutenant, although he prided himself upon his impartial and disinterested study of human nature, was the kindliest of men. He had more kindliness than observation by a great deal. Moreover, there were special reasons which caused him to take an interest in Harry Feversham. He sat for a little while with the air of a man profoundly disturbed. Then acting upon an impulse, he went to the door, opened it noiselessly, as noiselessly passed out, and without so much as a click of the latch closed the door behind him. And this is what he saw. Harry Feversham, holding in the centre of a hall the lighted candle high above his head, and looking up toward the portraits of the Feversham's as they mounted the walls and were lost in the darkness of the roof. A muffled sound of voices came from the other side of the door panels, but the hall itself was silent. Harry stood remarkably still, and the only thing which moved at all was the yellow flame of the candle as it flickered apparently in some faint draught. The light wavered across the portraits, glowing here upon a red coat, glittering there upon a corslet of steel for there was not one man's portrait upon the walls which did not glisten with the colors of a uniform, and there were portraits of many men. Father and son, the Feversham's, had been soldiers from the very birth of the family. Father and son, in lace collars and bucket boots, in Romilly's wigs and steel breastplates, in velvet coats with powder on their hair, in shakos and swallowtails, in high stocks and frogged coats, they looked down upon this last Feversham, summoning him to the like service. They were men of one stem. No distinction of uniform could obscure their relationship. Lean-faced men, hard as iron, rugged in feature, thin-lipped with firm chins and straight, level mouths, narrow foreheads, and the steel-blue, inexpressive eyes. Men of courage and resolution, no doubt, but without subtleties or nerves or that burdensome gift of imagination. Sturdy men, a little wanting in delicacy, hardly conspicuous for intellect. To put it frankly, men rather stupid, all of them, in a word, first-class fighting men, but not one of them a first-class soldier. But Harry Feversham plainly saw none of their defects. To him they were one and all pretentious and terrible. He stood before them in the attitude of a criminal before his judges, reading his condemnation in their cold, unchanging eyes. Lieutenant Such understood more clearly why the flame of the candle flickered, there was no draught in the hall, but the boy's hand shook, and finally, as though he heard the mute voices of his judge's delivering sentence and admitted its justice, he actually bowed to the portraits on the wall. As he raised his head, he saw Lieutenant Such in the embrasure of the doorway. He did not start. He uttered no word. He let his eyes quietly rest upon Such and waited. Of the two, it was the man who was embarrassed. Harry he said, and in spite of his embarrassment he had the tact to use the tone and the language of one addressing not a boy, but a comrade equal in years. 
We meet for the first time tonight. But I knew your mother a long time ago. I like to think that I have the right to call her by that much misused word, friend. Have you anything to tell me? Nothing, said Harry. The mere telling sometimes lightens a trouble. It is kind of you. There is nothing. Lieutenant Such was rather at a loss. The lad's loneliness made a strong appeal to him, for lonely the boy could not but be, set apart as he was, no less unmistakably in mind as in feature, from his father and his father's fathers. Yet what more could he do? His tact again came to his aid. He took his card-case from his pocket. You will find my address upon this card. Perhaps some day you will give me a few days of your company. I can offer you on my side a day or two's hunting. A spasm of pain shook for a fleeting moment in the boy's steady, inscrutable face. It passed, however, swiftly as it had come. "'Thank you, sir,' Harry said monotonously, repeated. "'You are very kind. "'And if you ever want to talk over a difficult question with an older man, "'I am at your service.' He spoke purposely in a formal voice, lest Harry, with a boy's sensitiveness, should think he laughed. Harry took the card and repeated his thanks. Then he went upstairs to bed. Lieutenant Such waited uncomfortably in the hall until the light of the candle had diminished and disappeared. Something was amiss, he was very sure. There were words which he should have spoken to the boy, but he had not known how to set about the task. He returned to the dining-room, and with a feeling that he was almost repairing his omissions, he filled his glass and called for silence. "'Gentlemen,' he said, "'this is June fifteenth. There is a great applause and much rapping on the table. It is the anniversary of our attack upon the Redan. It is also Harry Feversham's birthday. For us, our work is done. I ask you to drink the health of one of the youngsters who are ousting us. His work lies before him. The traditions of the Feversham family are very well known to us. May Harry Feversham carry them on. May he add distinction to a distinguished name. At once all the company was on its feet. Harry Feversham! The name was shouted with so hearty a good will that the glasses on the table rang. Harry Feversham! Harry Feversham! The cry was repeated and repeated, while old General Feversham sat in his chair with a face aflush with pride, and a boy a minute afterward in a room high up in the house heard the muffled words of a chorus, For he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, and so say all of us and believe the guests upon this Crimean night were drinking his father's health. He turned over in his bed and lay shivering. He saw in his mind a broken officer slinking at night in the shadows of the London streets. He pushed back the flap of a tent, and stood over a man lying stone dead in his blood, with an open lancet clenched in his right hand. And he saw that face, the broken officer, and the face of the dead surgeon were one, and that one face, the face of Harry Feversham. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of The Four Feathers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Gary Ullman The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason Chapter 2 Captain Trench and a Telegram Thirteen years later, and in the same month of June, Harry Feversham's health was drunk again, but after a quieter fashion and in a smaller company. The company was gathered in a room high up in a shapeless block of buildings which frowns like a fortress above Westminster. A stranger crossing St. James Park southwards over the suspension bridge at night who chanced to lift his eyes and see suddenly the tiers of lighted windows towering above him to so precipitous a height might be brought to a stop with the fancy that here in the heart of london was a mountain and the gnomes at work upon the tenth floor of this building harry had taken a flat during his year's furlough from his regiment in india and it was in the dining-room of this flat that the simple ceremony took place the room was furnished in a dark and restful fashion, and since the chill of the weather belied the calendar, a comfortable fire blazed in the hearth. A bay window, over which the blinds had not been lowered, commanded London. 
There were four men smoking about the dinner table. Harry Feversham was unchanged, except for a fair moustache, which contrasted with his dark hair and the natural consequences of growth. He was now a man of middle height, long-limbed, and well-knit like an athlete. But his features had not altered since that night when they had been so closely scrutinized by Lieutenant Such. Of his companions, two were brother officers on leave in England like himself whom he had that afternoon picked up at his club captain trench a small man growing bald with a small sharp resourceful face and black eyes of a remarkable activity and lieutenant willoughby an officer of quite a different stamp a round forehead a thick snub nose and a pair of vacant and protruding eyes gave to him an aspect of invincible stupidity he spoke but seldom and never to the point but rather to some point long forgotten which he had since been laboriously revolving in his mind and he continually twisted a moustache of which the ends curled up towards his eyes with a ridiculous ferocity a man whom one would dismiss from mind as of no consequence upon a first thought and take again into one's consideration upon a second for he was born stubborn as well as stupid, and the harm which his stupidity might do, his stubbornness would hinder him from admitting. He was not a man to be persuaded, having a few ideas he clung to them. It was no use to argue with him, for he did not hear the argument. But behind his vacant eyes, all the while he turned over his crippled thoughts and was satisfied. The fourth at the table was Durant's a lieutenant of the east surrey regiment and feversham's friend who had come in answer to a telegram this was june of the year eighteen eighty two and the thoughts of civilians turned towards egypt with anxiety those of soldiers with an eager anticipation arebi pasha in spite of threats was steadily strengthening the fortifications of alexandria and already a long way to the south the other, the great danger, was swelling like a thundercloud. A year had passed since a young, slight, and tall Dongawali, Muhammad Ahmed, had marched through the villages of the White Nile, preaching with the fire of Wesley the coming of a savior. The passionate victims of the Turkish tax-gatherer had listened, had heard the promise repeated in the whispers of the wind in the withered grass, had found the holy names imprinted even upon the eggs they gathered up in eighteen eighty two mohammed had declared himself that saviour and had won his first battles against the turks there will be trouble said trench and the sentence was the text on which three of the four men talked in a rare interview however the fourth harry feversham spoke upon a different subject i am glad you are all able to dine with me to-night i telegraphed to castleton as well an officer of ours he explained to durrance but he was dining with a big man in the war office and leaves for scotland afterwards so that he could not come i have news of a sort the three men leaned forward their minds still full of the dominant subject but it was not about the prospect of war that Harry Feversham had news to speak. I only reached London this morning from Dublin, he said, with a shade of embarrassment. I have been some weeks in Dublin. Durrance lifted his eyes from the tablecloth and looked quietly at his friend. Yes, he asked steadily. I have come back engaged to be married. Durrance lifted his glass to his lips. Well, here's luck to you, Harry, he said, and that was all. The wish, indeed, was almost curtly expressed, but there was nothing wanting in it to Feversham's ears. The friendship between these two men was not one in which affectionate phrases had any part. There was, in truth, no need of such. Both men were securely conscious of it. They estimated it at its true, strong value. It was a helpful instrument which would not wear out put into their hands for a hard, lifelong use. But it was not, and never had been, spoken of between them. Both men were grateful for it, as for a rare and undeserved gift. Yet both knew that it might entail an obligation of sacrifice. 
but the sacrifices were they needful would be made and they would not be mentioned it may be indeed that the very knowledge of their friendship strength constrained them to a particular reticence in their words to one another thank you jack said feversham i am glad of your good wishes it was you who introduced me to ethne i cannot forget it durant set his eyes down without any haste there followed a moment of silence during which he sat with his eyes upon the tablecloth and his hands resting on the table edge yes he said in a level voice i did you a good turn then he seemed on the point of saying more and doubtful how to say it but captain trench's sharp quick practical voice a voice which fitted the man who spoke saved him his pains will this make any difference asked trench feversham replaced his cigar between his lips you mean shall i leave the service he asked slowly i don't know and durant seized the opportunity to rise from the table and cross to the window where he stood with his back to his companions feversham took the abrupt movement for a reproach and spoke to Durrance's back, not to Trench. I don't know, he repeated. It will need thought. There is much to be said. On the one side, of course, there's my father, my career, such as it is. On the other hand, there is her father, Dermod Eustace. He wishes you to chuck your commission, asked Willoughby. He has no doubt the Irishman's objection to constituent authority, said Trench, with a laugh. But need you subscribe to it feversham it is not merely that it was still to rance's back that he addressed his excuses dermod is old his estates are going to ruin and there are other things you know jack the direct appeal he had to repeat and even then durance answered it absently yes i know and he added like one quoting a catchword if you want any whiskey rap trice on the floor with your foot the servants understand precisely said feversham he continued carefully weighing his words and still intently looking across the shoulders of his companions to his friend beside there is ethne herself dermod for once did an appropriate thing when he gave her that name for she is of her country and more of a county she has the love of it in her bones i do not think that she could be quite happy in india or indeed in any place which was not within reach of donegal the smell of its peat its streams and the brown friendliness of its hills one has to consider that he waited for an answer and getting none went on durrance however had no thought of reproach in his mind he knew that feversham was speaking he wished very much that he would continue to speak for a little while but he paid no heed to what was said he stood looking steadfastly out of the windows over against him was the glare from paul mall striking upward to the sky and the chains of light banked one above the other as the town rose northward and a rumble as of a million carriages was in his ears at his feet very far below lay st james park silent and black a quiet pool of darkness in the midst of glitter and noise durrance had a great desire to escape out of this room into its secrecy but that he could not do without remark therefore he kept his back turned to his companion and leaned his forehead against the window and hoped his friend would continue to talk for he was face to face with one of the sacrifices which must not be mentioned and which no sign must betray feversham did continue and if durrance did not listen on the other hand captain trench gave to him his closest attention but it was evident that harry feversham was giving reasons seriously considered he was not making excuses and in the end captain trench was satisfied well i drink to you feversham he said with all the proper sentiments i too old man said willoughby obediently following his senior's lead thus they drank their comrades health and as their empty glasses rattled on the table there came a knock upon the door the two officers looked up durrance turned about from the window feversham said come in 
and his servant brought in to him a telegram. Feversham tore open the envelope carelessly, as carelessly read through the telegram, and then sat very still with his eyes upon the slip of pink paper and his face grown at once extremely grave. Thus he sat for an appreciable time, not so much stunned as thoughtful, and in the room there was a complete silence. Feversham's three guests averted their eyes. Durrance turned again to his window. Willoughby twisted his moustache and gazed intently upward at the ceiling. Captain Trench shifted his chair round and stared into the glowing fire, and each man's attitude expressed a certain suspense. It seemed that sharp upon the heels of Feversham's good news was calamity had come knocking at the door. There is no answer, said Harry, and fell to silence again. Once he raised his head and looked at Trench as though he had a mind to speak, but he thought the better of it, and so dropped again to the consideration of this message. And in a moment or two the silence was sharply interrupted, but not by any one of the expected motionless three men seated within the room. The interruption came from without, from the parade ground at Wellington Barracks, the drums and fifes sounding the tattoo shrilled through the open window with a startling clearness like a sharp summons and diminished as the band marched away across the gravel and again grew loud feversham did not change his attitude but the look upon his face was now that of a man listening and listening thoughtfully just as he had read thoughtfully in the years which followed that moment was to recur again and again to the recollection of each of harry's three guests the lighted room with the bright homely fire the open window overlooking the myriad lamps of london harry feversham seated with the telegram spread before him the drums and fifes calling loudly and then dwindling to music very small and pretty music which beckoned where a moment ago it had commanded all these details made up a picture of which the colors were not to fade by any lapse of time although its significance was not apprehended now it was remembered that feversham rose abruptly from his chair just before the tattoo ceased he crumpled the telegram loosely in his hands tossed it into the fire and then leaning his back against the chimney piece and upon one side of the fireplace said again I don't know. As though he had thrust that message, whatever it might be from his mind, it was summing up in this infinite way the argument which had gone before. Thus that long silence was broken and a spell was lifted, but the fire took hold upon the telegram and shook it, so that it moved like a thing alive and in pain. It twisted, and part of it unrolled, and for a second lay open and smooth of creases, lit up by the fire and as yet untouched so that two or three words sprang as it were out of the yellow glare of fire and were legible then the flame seized upon that smooth part too and in a moment shriveled it into black tatters but captain trench was all this while staring into the fire you return to dublin i suppose said durrance he had moved back again into the room like his companions he was conscious of an unexplained relief to dublin no i go to donegal in three weeks time there is to be a dance it is hoped you will come i am not sure that i can manage it there is just a chance i believe should trouble come in the east that i may go out on the staff the talk thus came round again to the chances of peace and war and held in that quarter till the boom of the westminster clock told that the hour was eleven captain trench rose from his seat on the last stroke willoughby and durrance followed his example i shall see you to-morrow said durrance to feversham as usual replied harry and his three guests descended from his rooms and walked across the park together at the corner of pall mall however they parted company Durrance mounting St. James Street, while Trench and Willoughby crossed the road into St. James Square. There Trench slipped his arm through Willoughby's, to Willoughby's surprise, for Trench was an undemonstrative man. You know Castleton's address, he asked. 
Abermall Street, Willoughby answered, and had added the number. He leaves Euston at twelve o'clock. It is now ten minutes past eleven. Are you curious, Willoughby? I confess to curiosity. I am an inquisitive, methodical person, and when a man gets a telegram bidding him tell Trench something and he tells Trench nothing, I am curious as a philosopher to know what that something is. Castleton is the only other officer of our regiment in London. It is likely, therefore, that the telegram came from Castleton. Castleton, too, was dining with a big man from the war office. I think that if we take a hansom to Albemarle Street, we shall catch Castleton upon his doorstep. Mr. Willoughby, who understood very little of Trench's meaning, nevertheless cordially agreed to the proposal. I think it would be prudent, said he, and he hailed the passing cab. A moment later, the two men were driving to Albemarle Street. End of chapter 2「ルプロ」。Remembering a day now two years since, when by a curious whim of old Dermod Eustace he had been fetched against his will to the house by the Lennon River in Donegal, and there to his surprise had been made acquainted with Dermod's daughter Ethne, for she surprised all who had first held speech with the father. Durrance had stayed for a night in the house, and through that evening she had played upon her violin. Seated with her back toward her audience, as was her custom when she played, lest a look or a gesture should interrupt the concentration of her thoughts. The melodies which she had played rang in his ears now, for the girl possessed the gift of music, and the strings of her violin spoke to the questions of her bow. There was in particular an overture, the Melusine Overture, which had the very sob of the waves. Durrance had listened, wondering, for the violin had spoken to him of many things of which the girl who played it could know nothing. It had spoken of long perilous journeys and the faces of strange countries, of the silver way across moonlit seas, of the beckoning voices from the under edges of the desert. It had taken a deeper, a more mysterious tone. It had told of great joys, quite unattainable. And of great griefs, too, eternal, and with a sort of nobility by reason of their greatness, and of many unformulated longings beyond the reach of words, but with never a single note of mere complaint. So it had seemed to Durrance that night as he sat listening while Ethne's face was turned away. So it seemed to him now, when he knew that her face was still to be turned away for all his days. He had drawn a thought from her playing which he was at some pains to keep definite in his mind. The true music cannot complain. Therefore it was that as he rode the next morning into the row, his blue eyes looked out upon the world from his bronzed face with not a jot less of his usual friendliness. He waited at half past nine by the clump of lilacs and laburnums at the end of the sand. But Harry Feversham did not join him that morning, nor indeed for the next three weeks. Ever since the two men had graduated from Oxford, it had been their custom to meet at this spot an hour, when both chanced to be in town, and Durrance was puzzled. It seemed to him that he had lost his friend as well. Meanwhile, however, the rumors of war grew to an uncertainty, and when at last Feversham kept the tryst, Durrance had news. I told you luck might run my way. Well, she has. I go out to Egypt on General Graham's staff. There's talk we may run down the Red Sea to Selkin afterward. The exhilaration of his voice brought an unmistakable envy into Feversham's eyes. It seemed strange to Durrance, even at that moment of his good luck, 
that Harry Faversham should envy him, strange and rather pleasant, but he interpreted the envy in the light of his own ambitions. It is rough on you, he said sympathetically, that your regiment has to stay behind. Faversham rode by his friend's side in silence. Then, as they came to the chairs beneath the trees, he said, That was expected. The day you dined with me, I sent in my papers. That night, said Durrance, turning in his saddle, after we had gone? Yes, said Faversham, accepting the correction. He wondered whether it had been intended. But Durrance rode silently forward. Again, Harry Faversham was conscious of a reproach in his friend's silence, and again he was wrong, for Durrance suddenly spoke heartily and with a laugh. I remember you gave us your reasons that night, but for the life of me I can't help wishing that we had been going out together. When do you leave for Ireland? Tonight. So soon? They turned their horses and rode westward again down the alley of trees. The morning was still fresh, the limes and chestnuts had lost nothing of their early green, and since the May was late that year, its blossoms still hung delicately white like snow upon the branches, and shone red against the dark rhododendrons. The park shimmered in a haze of sunlight, and the distant roar of the streets was as the tumbling of river water. It is a long time since we bathed in Sanford Lasher, said Durrance or froze in the Easter vacations in the big snow gully on Great End, returned Feversham. Both men had the feeling that on this morning a volume in their book of life was ended, and since the volume had been a pleasant one to read, and they did not know whether its successors would sustain its promise, they were looking backward through the leaves before they put it finally away. You must stay with us, Jack, when you come back, said Feversham. Durrance had schooled himself not to wince, and he did not, even at that anticipatory us. If his left hand tightened upon the thongs of his reins, the sign could not be detected by his friend. If I come back, said Durrance, you know my creed. I could never pity a man who died on active service. I would very much like to come by that end myself. It was a quite simple creed, consistent with the simplicity of the man who uttered it. It amounted to no more than this, than to die decently was worth a great many years of life, so that he uttered it without melancholy or any sign of foreboding. Even so, however, he had a fear that perhaps his friend might place another interpretation upon the words, and he looked quickly into his face. He only saw again, however, that puzzling look of envy in Feversham's eyes. You see, there are worse things which can happen, he continued. Disablement, for instance. Clever men could make a shift, perhaps, to put up with it. But what in the world should I do if I had to sit in a chair all my days? It makes me shiver to think of it. And he shook his broad shoulders to unsaddle that fear. Well, this is the last ride. Let us gallop. And he let out his horse. Feversham followed his example. And side by side they went racing down the sand. At the bottom of the row they stopped shook hands, and with the curtis of nods parted. Feversham rode out of the park. Durrance turned back and walked his horse up toward the seats beneath the trees. Even as a boy in his home at Southpool in Devonshire, upon a wooded creek of the Salcom estuary, he had always been conscious of a certain restlessness, a desire to sail down that creek and out over the levels of the sea, a dream of queer outlandish countries and peoples beyond the dark familiar woods. And the restlessness had grown upon him, so that Gessens, even when he had inherited it with its farms and lands, had remained always in his thoughts as a place to come home to, rather than an estate to occupy a life. He purposely exaggerated that restlessness now, and purposely set against it words which Feversham had spoken, and which he knew to be true. Ethne Eustace would hardly be happy outside her county of Donegal. Therefore, even had things fallen out differently, as he phrased it, there might have been a clash. Perhaps it was as well that Harry Feversham was to marry Ethne, and not another than Feversham. Thus, at all events, he argued as he rode, until the riders vanished from before his eyes, and the ladies in their colored frocks beneath the cool of the trees. 
The trees themselves dwindled to ragged mimosas, the brown sand at his feet spread out in a widening circumference and took the bright color of honey, and upon the empty sand black stones began to heap themselves shapelessly like coal and to flash in the sun like mirrors. He was deep in his anticipations of the Sudan, when he heard his name called out softly in a woman's voice, and, looking up, found himself close by the rails. "'How do you do, Mrs. Adair?' said he, and he stopped his horse. Mrs. Adair gave him her hand across the rails. She was Durrance's neighbor at Southpool, and by a year or two his elder, a tall woman, remarkable for the many shades of her thick brown hair and the peculiar pallor on her face. But at this moment the face had brightened. There was a hint of color in the cheeks. I have news for you, said Durrance. Two special items. One, Harry Feversham is to be married. To whom? asked the lady eagerly. You should know it was in your house in Hill Street that Harry first met her, and I introduced him. He has been improving the acquaintance in Dublin. But Mrs. Adair already understood, and it was plain that the news was welcome. Ethne Eustace, she cried. Will they be married soon? There is nothing to prevent it. I am glad, and the lady sighed as though with relief. What is your second item? As good as the first. I go out on General Graham's staff. Mrs. Adair was silent. There came a look of anxiety into her eyes, and the color died out of her face. You are very glad, I suppose, she said slowly. Durrance's voice left her in no doubt. I should think I was. I go soon, too, and the sooner the better. I will come and dine some night, if I may, before I go. My husband will be pleased to see you, said Mrs. Adair, rather coldly. Durrance did not notice the coldness, however. He had his own reasons for making the most of the opportunity which had come his way, and he urged his enthusiasm, and laid it bare in words more for his own benefit than with any thought of Mrs. Adair. Indeed, he had always rather a vague impression of the lady. She was handsome in a queer foreign way, not so uncommon along the coast of Devonshire and Cornwall, and she had good hair, and was always well dressed. Moreover, she was friendly and at that point Durrance's knowledge of her came to an end. Perhaps her chief merit in his eyes was that she had made friends with Ethne Eustace, but he was to become better acquainted with Mrs. Adair. He rode away from the park with the old regret in his mind that the fortunes of himself and his friend were this morning finally severed. As a fact, he had that morning set the strands of a new rope a-weaving, which was to bring them together again in a strange and terrible relationship. Mrs. Adair followed him out of the park and walked home very thoughtfully. Durrance had just one week wherein to provide his equipment and arrange his estate in Devonshire. It passed in a continuous hurry of preparation, so that his newspaper lay each day unfolded in his rooms. The general was to travel overland to Brindisi, and so on an evening of wind and rain toward the end of July, Durrance stepped from the Dover Pier into the mail boat for Calais. In spite of the rain and the gloomy night, a small crowd had gathered to give the general a send-off. As the ropes were cast off, a feeble cheer was raised, and before the cheer had ended, Durrance found himself beset by a strange illusion. He was leaning upon the bulwarks, idly wondering whether this was his last view of England and with a wish that some one of his friends had come down to see him go, when it seemed to him suddenly that his wish was answered, for he caught a glimpse of a man standing beneath a gas lamp, and that man was of the stature and wore the likeness of Harry Feversham. Durrance rubbed his eyes and looked again, but the wind made the tongue of light flicker uncertainly within the glass. The rain, too, blurred the quay. He could only be certain that a man was standing there. He could only vaguely distinguish beneath the lamp the whiteness of a face. It was an illusion, he said to himself. Harry Feversham was, at that moment, most likely listening to Ethne playing the violin under a clear sky in a high garden of Donegal. But even as he was turning from the bulwarks, there came a lull of the wind. The lights burned bright and steady on the pier and the face leaped from the shadows distinct in feature and expression. Durrance leaned out over the side of the boat. Harry, he shouted, at the top of a wandering voice, 
but the figure beneath the lamp never stirred. The wind blew the lights again this way and that. The paddles churned the water, and the mail boat passed beyond the pier. It was an illusion, he repeated. It was a coincidence. It was the face of a stranger very like to Harry Feversham's. It could not be Feversham's, because the face which Durrance had seen so distinctly for a moment was a haggard, wistful face, a face stamped with an extraordinary misery, the face of a man cast out from among his fellows. Durrance had been busy all that week. He had clean forgotten the arrival of that telegram and the suspense which the long perusal of it had caused. Moreover, his newspaper had lain unfolded in his rooms, but his friend Harry Feversham had come to see him off. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of the Four Feathers. This is a LiverVox recording. All LiverVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LiverVox.org. Recording by John Prestwich. The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason. Chapter Four. The Ball at Lennon House. Yet Feversham had travelled to Dublin by the night mail after his ride from Durrance in the Row. He had crossed Lauswilly on the following forenoon by a little cargo steamer, which once a week steamed up the London River as far as Ramelton. On the quay side, Ethne was waiting for him in her dog cart. She gave him the hand and the smile of a comrade. You are surprised to see me, she said, noting the look upon his face. I always am, he replied, for always you exceed my thoughts of you. And the smile changed upon her face. It became something more than the smile of a comrade. I shall drive slowly, she said, as soon as his traps had been packed into the cart. I brought no groom on purpose. There'll be guests coming tomorrow. We have only today. She drove along the wide causeway by the riverside and turned up the steep, narrow street. Feversham sat quietly by her side. It was his first visit to Ramelton, and he gazed about him, noting the dark thicket of tall trees which climbed on the far side of the river, the old grey bridge, the noise of the water about it as it sang over shallows, and the drowsy white of the town. With a great curiosity and almost pride of ownership, since it was here that Ethne lived, and all these things were part and parcel of her life, she was at that time a girl of twenty-one, tall, strong, and supple of limb, and with a squareness of shoulder proportionate to her height. She had none of the exaggerated slope which her grandmothers esteemed, yet she lacked no grace of womanhood on that account, and in her walk she was light-footed as a deer. Her hair was dark brown, and she wore it coiled upon the nap of her neck. A bright color burned in her cheeks, and her eyes, of a very clear gray, met the eyes of those to whom she talked with a most engaging frankness. And in character, she was the counterpart of her looks. She was honest. She had a certain simplicity the straightforward simplicity of strength which comprises much gentleness and excludes violence. Of her courage there is a story still told in Ramelton, which Feversham could never remember without a thrill of wonder. She had stopped at a door on a steep hill leading down to the river, and the horse which she was driving took fright at the mere clatter of pale the reins were lying loose at the moment they fell on the ground before ethne could seize them she was thus seated helpless in the dog-cart and the horse was tearing down to where the road curves sharply over the bridge the thing which she did she did quite coolly she climbed over the front of the dog-cart as it pitched and raced forward down the hill and balancing herself along the shafts reached the reins at the horse's neck and brought the horse to a stop ten yards from the curve but she had too the defects of her qualities although feversham was not yet aware of them ethne during the first part of this drive was almost as silent as her companion 
and when she spoke it was with an absent air as though she had something of more importance in her thoughts it was not until she had left the town and was out upon the straight undulating road to letterkenny that she turned quickly to feversham and uttered it i saw this morning that your regiment was ordered from india to egypt you could have gone with it had i not come in your way there would have been chances of distinction i have hindered you and i am very sorry of course you could not know that there was any possibility of your regiment going but i can understand it is very hard for you to be left behind i blame myself feversham sat staring in front of him for a moment then he said in a voice suddenly grown hoarse you need not how can i help it i blame myself the more she continued because i do not see things quite like other women for instance supposing that you had gone to egypt and that the worst had happened i should have felt very lonely of course all my days but i should have known quite surely that when those days were over you and i would see much of one another she spoke without any impressive lowering of the voice but in the steady level tone of one stating the simplest imaginable fact feversham caught his breath like a man in pain but the girl's eyes were upon his face and he sat still staring in front of him with, without so much as a contraction of the forehead but it seemed that he could not trust himself to answer he kept his lips closed and ethne continued you see i can put up with this absence of people i care about a little better perhaps than most people i do not feel that i have lost them at all and she cast about for a while as if her thoughts were difficult to express you know how things happened she resumed one goes along in a dull sort of way and then suddenly a face springs out from the crowd of one's acquaintances and you know it at once and certainly for the face of a friend or rather you recognize it though you had never seen it before it is almost as though you had come upon some one long looked for and now gladly recovered well such friends they are few no doubt but after all only a few really count such friends one does not lose whether they are absent or even dead unless said feversham slowly one has made a mistake suppose the face in the crowd is a mask what then one may make mistakes ethne shook her head decisively of that kind no one may seem to have made mistakes and perhaps for a long while but in the end one would be proved not to have made them and the girl's implicit faith took hold upon the man and tortured him so that he could no longer keep silent ethne he cried you don't know but at the moment ethne reined in the horse laughed and pointed with her whip they had come to the top of a hill a couple of miles from ramelton the road ran between stone walls enclosing open fields upon the left and a wood of oaks and beeches on the right a scarlet letter-box was built into the left-hand wall and at that ethne's whip was pointed i wanted to show you that she interrupted it was there i used to post my letters to you during the anxious times and so feversham let slip his opportunity of speech the house is behind the trees to the right she continued the letter-box is very convenient said feversham yes said ethne and she drove on and stopped again where the wall had crumbled that's where i used to climb over to post the letters there's a tree on the other side of the wall as convenient as the letter-box and i used to run down the half-mile of avenue at night there might have been thieves exclaimed feversham there were thorns said ethne and turning through the gates she drove up to the porch of the long irregular grey house well we have still a day before the dance i suppose the whole countryside is coming said feversham it daren't do anything else said ethne with a laugh my father would send the police to fetch them if they stayed away just as he fetched your friend mr durrance here by the way mr durrance has sent me a present a guarnerius violin the door opened and a thin lank old man with a fierce peaked face like a bird of prey came out upon the steps 
His face softened, however, into a friendliness when he saw Feversham, and a smile played upon his lips. A stranger might have thought that he winked, but his left eyelid continually drooped over the eye. How do you do, he said. Glad to see you. Must make yourself at home. If you want any whiskey, stamp twice on the floor with your foot. The servants understand. And with that he went straightway back into the house. The biographer of Dermon Eustace would need to bring a wary mind to his work. For though the old master of Lennon House had not lain twenty years in his grave, he is already swollen into a legendary character. Anecdotes have grown upon his memory like barnacles, and any man in those parts with a knack for invention has only to foist his stories upon Dermon to ensure a ready credence. There are, however, definite facts. He practiced an ancient and tyrannous hospitality, keeping open house upon the road to letter key, and forcing bed and board even upon strangers, as Durrance had once discovered. He was a man of another century, who looked out with a glowering, angry eye upon the topsy-turvy world, and would not be reconciled to it except after much alcohol. He was a sort of intoxicated Corianilus, believing that the people should be shepherded with a stick, yet always mindful of his manners, even to the lowliest of women. It was said of him with pride by the townsfolk of Ramelton that even at his worst, when he came galloping down the steep cobbled street, mounted on a big white mare of seventeen hands, with his inseparable collie dog for his companion, a gaunt, gray-faced, gray-haired man, with a drooped eye, swaying with drink, yet by a miracle keeping his saddle, he had never ridden down any one except a man. There are two points to be added. He was rather afraid of his daughter, who wisely kept him doubtful whether she was displeased with him or not, and he had conceived a great liking for Harry Feversham. Harry saw little of him that day, however. Dermon retired into the room, which he was pleased to call his office, while Feversham and Ethne spent the afternoon fishing for salmon in the Lennon River. It was an afternoon restful as a Sabbath, and the very birds were still. From the house the lawn fell steeply, shaded by trees and dappled by the sunlight, to a valley at the bottom of which flowed the river swift and black under overarching boughs. There was a fall where the water slid over rocks with a smoothness so unbroken that it looked solid except just at one point. There a spur stood sharply up, and the river broke back upon itself in an amber wave through which the sun shone. Opposite this spur they sat for a long while, talking at times, but for the most part listening to the roar of the water and watching its perpetual flow. And at last the sunset came and the long shadows. They stood up, looked at each other with a smile, and so walked slowly back to the house. It was an afternoon which Feversham was long to remember, for the next night was the night of the dance, and as the band struck up the opening bars of the fourth waltz, Ethne left her position at the drawing-room door, and taking Feversham's arm, passed out into the hall. The hall was empty, and the front door stood open to the cool of the summer night. From the ballroom came the swaying lilt of the music and the beat of the dancer's feet. Ethne drew a breath of relief at her reprieve from her duties, and then dropping her partner's arm, crossed to a side table. The post is in, she said. There are letters, one, two, three, for you, and a little box. She held the box out to him as she spoke, a little white jeweler's cardboard box, and was at once struck by its absence of weight. It must be empty, she said, yet it was most carefully sealed and tied. Feversham broke the seal and unfastened the string. The box had been forwarded from his lodgings, and he was not familiar with the handwriting. There is some mistake, he said, as he shook the lid open, and then he stopped abruptly. Three white feathers fluttered out of the box, swayed and rocked for a moment in the air, and then, one after another, settled gently down upon the floor. 
They lay like flakes of snow upon the dark polished boards, but they were not whiter than Harry Feversham's cheeks. He stood and stared at the feathers until he felt a light touch upon his arm. He looked and saw Ethne's gloved hand upon his sleeve. What does it mean? she asked. There was some perplexity in her voice but nothing more than perplexity. The smile upon her face and the loyal confidence in her eyes showed she had never a doubt that his first word would lift it from her. What does it mean? That there are things which cannot be hid, I suppose, said Feversham. For a little while Ethne did not speak. The languorous music floated into the hall, and the trees whispered from the garden through the open door. Then she shook his arm gently, uttered a breathless little laugh, and spoke, though she was pleading with a child. I don't think you understand, Harry. There are three white feathers. They were sent to you in jest. Oh, of course in jest. But it is a cruel kind of jest. They were sent in deadly earnest. He spoke now, looking her straight in the eyes. Ethne dropped her hand from his sleeve. Who sent them, she asked. Feversham had not given a thought to that matter. The message was all in all, the men who had sent it so unimportant. But Ethne reached out her hand and took the box from him. There were three visiting cards lying at the bottom, and she took them out and read them aloud. Captain Trench, Mr. Castleton, Mr. Willoughby. Do you know these men? All three are officers of my old regiment. The girl was dazed. She knelt down upon the floor and gathered the feathers into her hand with a vague thought that merely a touch of them would help her to comprehension. They lay upon the palm of her white glove, and she blew gently upon them, and they swam up into the air and hung fluttering and rocking. As they floated downward, she caught them again, and so she slowly felt her way to another question. Were they justly sent? she asked. Yes, said Harry Feversham. He had no thought of denial or evasion. He was only aware that the dreadful thing for so many years dreadfully anticipated had at last befallen him. He was known for a coward. The word which had long blazed upon the wall of his thoughts in letters of fire was now written large in the public places. He stood as he had once stood before the portraits of his fathers, mutely accepting calm damnation. It was the girl who denied, as she still kneeled upon the floor. I do not believe that it is true, she said. You could not look me in the face so steadily were it true. Your eyes would seek the floor, not mine. Yet it is true. Three little white feathers, she said slowly, and then, with a sob in her throat, This afternoon, you were under the elms down by the Lennon River. Do you remember, Harry, just you and I? And then come three little white feathers, and the world's at an end. Oh, don't, cried Harry, and his voice broke upon the word. Up till now he had spoken with a steadiness matching the steadiness of his eyes, but these last words of hers, the picture which they invoked in his memories, the pathetic simplicity of her utterance, caught him by the heart. But Ethne seemed not to hear the appeal. She was listening with her face turned toward the ballroom. The chatter and laughter of the voices there grew louder and nearer. She understood that the music had ceased. She rose quickly to her feet, clenching the feathers in her hand, and opened a door. It was the door of her sitting room. Come, she said. Harry followed her into the room, and she closed the door, shutting out the noise. Now, she said, will you tell me, if you please, why the feathers have been sent? She stood quietly before him. Her face was pale, but Feversham could not gather from her expression any feeling which she might have beyond a desire and a determination to get to the truth. She spoke, too, with the same quietude. He answered, as he had answered before, directly and to the point, without any attempt at mitigation. A telegram came. It was sent by Castleton. It reached me when Captain Trench and Mr. Willoughby were dining with me. It told me that my regiment would be ordered on active service in Egypt. Castleton was dining with a man likely to know, and did not question the accuracy of his message. He told me to tell Trench. I did not. I thought the matter over with the telegram in front of me. Castleton was leaving that night for Scotland, and he would go straight 
from scotland to rejoin the regiment he would not therefore see trench for some weeks at the earliest and by that time the telegram would very likely be forgotten or its date confused i did not tell trench i threw the telegram into the fire and that night sent in my papers but trench found out somehow durrance was at dinner too good good god durrance he suddenly broke out most likely he knows like the rest it came upon him as something shocking and strangely knew that his friend durrance who as he knew very well had been wont rather to look up to him in all likelihood counted him a thing of scorn but he heard ethne speaking after all what did it matter whether durrance knew whether every man knew from the south pole to the north since she ethne knew and is this all she asked surely it is enough said he i think not she answered and she lowered her voice a little as she went on we agreed didn't we that no foolish misunderstanding should ever come between us we were to be frank and to take frankness each from the other without offence so be frank with me please she pleaded i could i think claim it as a right at all events i ask for it as i shall never ask for anything else in all my life there was a sort of explanation in his act harry feversham remembered but it was so futile when compared with the overwhelming consequence ethne had unclenched her hands the three feathers lay before his eyes upon the table they could not be explained away he wore coward like a blind man's label besides he could never make her understand however she wished for the explanation and had a right to it she had been generous in asking for it with generos with a generosity not very common amongst women so feversham gathered his wits and explained all my life i have been afraid that some day i should play the coward and from the very first i knew that i was destined for the army i kept my fear to myself there was no one to whom i could tell it my mother was dead and my father he stopped for a moment with a deep intake of breath he could he could see his father that lonely iron man sitting at this very moment in his mother's favorite seat upon the terrace and looking over the moonlit fields toward sussex downs he could imagine him dreaming of honors and distinctions worthy of the feversham's to be gained immediately by his son in the egyptian campaign surely that old man's stern heart would break beneath this blow the magnitude of the bad thing which he had done the misery which it would spread were becoming very clear to harry feversham he dropped his head between his hands and groaned aloud my father he resumed would nay could never have understood i know him when danger came his way it found him ready but he did not foresee that was my trouble always i foresaw and peril to be encountered any risk to be run i foresaw something else besides my father would talk in his matter-of-fact way for hours of waiting before the actual commencement of a battle after the troops had been pardoned and mere anticipation of the suspense and the strain of those hours was a torture to me i foresaw the possibility of cowardice then one evening when my father had his old friends about him on one of his crimean nights two dreadful stories were told one of an officer the other of a surgeon who had both shirked i was now confronted with the fact of cowardice i took those stories up to bed with me they never left my memory they became a part of me i saw myself behaving now as one now as the other of those two men had behaved perhaps in the crisis of a battle bringing ruin upon my country certainly dishonoring my father and all the dead men whose portraits hung ringed in the hall i tried to get the best of my fears i hunted but with a map of the countryside in my mind i foresaw every hedge every pit every treacherous bank yet you rode straight interrupted ethne mr durrance told me so did i said feversham vaguely well perhaps i did 
once the hounds were off durrance never knew what the moments of waiting before the coverts were drawn meant to me so when this telegram came i took the chance it seemed to offer and resigned he ended his explanation he had spoken warily having something to conceal how earnestly she might ask for frankness he must at all costs for her sake hide something from her but at once she suspected it you were were you afraid too of disgracing me was i in any way the cause that you resigned feversham looked her in the eyes and lied no if you had not been engaged to me you would still have sent in your papers yes ethne slowly stripped a glove off her hand feversham turned away i think that i am rather like your father she said i don't understand and in the silence which followed upon her words feversham heard something whirl and rattle upon the table he looked and saw that she had slipped her engagement ring off her finger it lay upon the table the stones winking at him and all this all that you have told to me she exclaimed suddenly with her face very stern you would have hidden from me you would have married me and hidden it had not these three feathers come the words had been on her lips from the beginning but she had not uttered them lest by a miracle he should after all have some unimagined explanation which would re-establish him in her thoughts she had given him every chance now however she struck and laid bare the worst of his disloyalty feversham flinched and he did not answer but allowed his silence to consent ethne however was just she was in a way curious too she wished to know the very bottom of the matter before she thrust it into the back of her mind but yesterday she said you were going to tell me something i stopped you to point out the letter-box and she laughed in a queer empty way was it about the feathers yes answered feversham wearily what did these persistent questions matter since the feathers had come since her ring lay flickering and winking on the table yes i think what you were saying rather compelled me i remember said ethne interrupting him rather hastily about seeing much of one another afterwards we will not speak of such things again and feversham swayed upon his feet as though he would fail i remember too you said one could make mistakes you were right i was wrong one can do more than seem to make them you will if you please take back your ring feversham picked up the ring and held it in the palm of his hand standing very still he had never cared for her so much he had never recognized her value so thoroughly as at this moment when he lost her she gleamed in the quiet room wonderful most wonderful from the bright flowers in her hair to the white slipper on her foot it was incredible to him that he should ever have won her yet he had and disloyally had lost her then her voice broke in again upon his reflections these too are yours will you take them please she was pointing to her fan to the feathers upon the table feversham obediently reached out his hand and then drew it back in surprise there are four he said ethne did not reply and looking at her fan feversham understood it was a fan of ivory and white feathers she had broken off one of those feathers and added it on her own account to the three the thing which she had done was cruel no doubt but she wished to make an end a complete irrevocable end though her voice was steady and her face despite its pallor calm she was really tortured with humiliation and pain all the details of harry feversham's courtship the interchange of looks the letters she had written and received the words which she had spoken tingled and smarted unbearably in her recollections their lips had touched she recalled it with horror she desired never to see harry feversham after this night therefore she added her fourth feather to the three harry feversham took the feathers as she bade him without a word of remonstrance and indeed with a sort of dignity which even at that moment surprised her all the time too he had kept his eyes steadily upon hers he had answered her questions simply there had been nothing abject in his matter so that ethne already began to regret the last thing which she had done however 
it was done feversham had taken the four feathers he held them in his fingers as though he was about to tear them across but he checked the action he looked suddenly towards her and kept his eyes upon her face for some little while then very carefully he put the feathers into his breast pocket ethne at this time did not consider why she only thought that here was the irrevocable end we should be going back i think she said we have been some time away you will give me your arm in the hall she looked at the clock only eleven o'clock she said wearily when we dance here we dance till daylight we must show brave faces until daylight and with her hand resting upon his arm they passed into the ballroom end of chapter four Chapter 5 of The Four Feathers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason. Chapter 5 The Pariah. Habit assisted them. The irresponsible chatter of the ballroom sprang automatically to their lips. The appearance of enjoyment never failed from off their faces, so that no one at Lennon House that night suspected that any swift cause of severance had come between them. Harry Feversham watched Ethne laugh and talk as though she had never a care, and was perpetually surprised, taking no thought that he wore the like mask of gaiety himself. When she swung past him, the light rhythm of her feet almost persuaded him that her heart was in the dance. It seemed that she could even command the color upon her cheeks. Thus they both wore brave faces, as she had bidden. They even danced together. But all the while Ethne was conscious that she was holding up a great load of pain and humiliation which would presently crush her, and Feversham felt those four feathers burning at his breast. It was wonderful to him that the whole company did not know of them. He never approached a partner without the notion that she would turn upon him with the contemptuous name which was his upon her tongue. Yet he felt no fear on that account. He would not indeed have cared had it happened, had the word been spoken. He had lost Ethne. He watched her, and looked in vain amongst her guests, as indeed he surely knew he would, for a fit comparison. There were women, pretty, graceful, even beautiful, but Ethne stood apart by the particular character of her beauty. The broad forehead, the perfect curve of the eyebrows, the great steady clear grey eyes, the full red lips, which could dimple into tenderness and shut level with resolution, and the royal grace of her carriage marked her out to Feversham's thinking and would do so in any company. He watched her in a despairing amazement that he had ever had a chance of owning her. Only once did her endurance fail, and then only for a second. She was dancing with Feversham, and as she looked toward the windows, she saw that the daylight was beginning to show very pale and cold upon the other side of the blinds. Look, she said, and Feversham suddenly felt all her weight upon his arms. Her face lost its color and grew tired and very gray. Her eyes shut tightly and then opened again. He thought that she would faint. The morning at last, she exclaimed, and then in a voice as weary as her face, I wonder whether it is right that one should suffer so much pain. Hush, whispered Feversham. Courage. A few minutes more, only a very few. He stopped and stood in front of her until her strength returned. "'Thank you,' she said gratefully, and the bright wheel of the dance caught them in its spokes again. It was strange that he should be exhorting her to courage, she thanking him for help, but the irony of this queer momentary reversal of their position occurred to neither of them. Ethne was too tired by the strain of those last hours, and Feversham had learned from that one failure of her endurance. From the drawn aspect of her face, and the depths of pain in her eyes, how deeply he had wounded her. He no longer said, I have lost her. He no longer thought of his loss at all. 
he heard her words, I wonder whether it is right that one should suffer so much pain. He felt that they would go ringing down the world with him, persistent in his ears, spoken upon the very accent of her voice. He was sure that he would hear them at the end, above the voices of any who should stand above him when he died, and hear in them his condemnation, for it was not right. The ball finished shortly afterwards. The last carriage drove away, and those who were staying in the house sought the smoking-room or went upstairs to bed according to their sex. Feversham, however, lingered in the hall with Ethne. She understood why. "'There is no need,' she said, standing with her back to him as he lighted a candle. "'I have told my father. I told him everything.' Feversham bowed his head in acquiescence. "'Still I must wait and see him,' he said. Ethne did not object, but she turned and looked at him quickly, with her brows drawn in a frown of perplexity. To wait for her father under such circumstances seemed to argue a certain courage. Indeed, she felt herself some apprehension as she heard the door of the study open and Dermod's footsteps on the floor. Dermod walked straight up to Harry Feversham, looked for once in a way what he was, a very old man, and stood there staring into Feversham's face with a muddled and bewildered expression. Twice he opened his mouth to speak, but no words came. In the end he turned to the table and lit his candle and Harry Feversham's. Then he turned back toward Feversham, and rather quickly, so that Ethne took a step forward as if to get between them. But he did nothing more than stare at Feversham again, and for a long time. Finally, he took up his candle. Well, he said, and stopped. He snuffed the wick with the scissors and began again. Well, he said, and stopped again. Apparently his candle had not helped him into any suitable expressions. He stared into the flame, now instead of into Feversham's face, and for an equal length of time he could think of nothing whatever to say, and yet he was conscious that something must be said. In the end he said, lamely, "'If you want any whiskey, stamp twice on the floor with your foot. The servants understand.' Thereupon he walked heavily up the stairs. The old man's forbearance was perhaps not the least part of Harry Feversham's punishment. It was broad daylight when Ethne was at last alone within her room. She drew up the blinds and opened the windows wide. The cool, fresh air of the morning was as a draught of spring water to her. She looked out upon a world as yet unillumined by colours, and found therein an image of her days to come. The dark, tall trees looked black. The winding paths, a singular dead white, the very lawns were dull and grey, though the dew lay upon them like a network of frost. It was a noisy world, however, for all its aspect of quiet, for the blackbirds were calling from the branches and the grass, and down beneath the overhanging trees the linen flowed in music between its banks. Ethne drew back from the window. She had much to do that morning before she slept, for she designed with her natural thoroughness to make an end at once of all her associations with Harry Feversham. She wished that from the moment when next she waked she might never come across a single thing which could recall him to her memory, and with a sort of stubborn persistence she went about the work. But she changed her mind. In the very process of collecting together the gifts which he had made to her, she changed her mind, for each gift that she looked upon had its history, and the days before this miserable night had darkened on her happiness came one by one slowly back to her as she looked. She determined to keep one thing which had belonged to Harry Feversham, a small thing, a thing of no value. At first she chose a penknife, which he had once lent to her, and she had forgotten to return. But the next instant she dropped it, and rather hurriedly, for she was, after all, an Irish girl, and though she did not believe in superstitions, 
where superstitions were concerned, she preferred to be on the safe side. She selected his photograph in the end and locked it away in a drawer. She gathered the rest of his presents together, packed them carefully in a box, fastened the box, addressed it and carried it down to the hall where the servants might dispatch it in the morning. Then coming back to her room, she took his letters, made a little pile of them on the hearth and set them alight. They took some while to consume, but she waited, sitting upright in her armchair while the flame crept from sheet to sheet, discoloring the paper, blackening the writing like a stream of ink, and leaving in the end only flakes of ashes like feathers, and white flakes like white feathers. The last sparks were barely extinguished when she heard a cautious step on the gravel beneath her window. It was broad daylight, but her candle was still burning on the table at her side, and with a quick, instinctive movement she reached out her arm and put the light out. Then she sat very still and rigid, listening. For a while she heard only the blackbirds calling from the trees in the garden and the throbbing music of the river. Afterward she heard the footsteps again, cautiously retreating, and in spite of her will, in spite of her formal disposal of the letters and the presents, she was mastered all at once, not by pain or humiliation, but by an overpowering sense of loneliness. She seemed to be seated high on an empty world of ruins. She rose quickly from her chair, and her eyes fell upon a violin case. With a sigh of relief she opened it, and a little while after one or two of the guests who were sleeping in the house chanced to wake up and heard floating down the corridors the music of a violin played very lovingly and low. Ethne was not aware that the violin which she held was the Guarnerius violin which Durrance had sent to her. She only understood that she had a companion to share her loneliness. End of chapter 5「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. » Recording by Becky Cook Chapter 6 Harry Feversham's Plan It was the night of August 30th. A month had passed since the ball at Lennon House, but the uneventful countryside of Donegal was still busy with the stimulating topic of Harry Feversham's disappearance. The townsmen in their climbing street and the gentry at their dinner tables gossiped to their hearts' contentment. It was asserted that Harry Feversham had been seen on the very morning after the dance, and at five minutes to six, though according to Mrs. Brian O'Brien it was ten minutes past the hour, still in his dress clothes and with a white suicide's face, hurrying along the causeway by the Lennon Bridge. It was suggested that a dragnet would be the only way to solve the mystery. Mr. Dennis Rafferty, who lived on the road to Rathmullen, indeed went so far as to refuse salmon on the plea that he was not a cannibal, and the saying had a general vogue. Their conjectures as to the cause of the disappearance were no nearer the truth, for there were only two who knew, and those two went steadily about the business of living as though no catastrophe had befallen them. They held their heads a trifle more proudly, perhaps. Ethne might have become a little more gentle, Dermod a little more irascible, but these were the only changes, so gossip had the field to itself. But Harry Feversham was in London, as Lieutenant Such discovered on the night of the 30th. All that day the town had been perturbed by rumors of a great battle fought at Cassassin in the desert east of Ismalia. Messengers had raced ceaselessly through the streets, shouting tidings of victory and tidings of disaster. There had been a charge by moonlight of General Drury Lowe's cavalry brigade, which had rolled up Arabi's left flank and captured his guns. It was rumored that an English general had been killed, that the York and Lancaster regiment had been cut up. London was uneasy, and at eleven o'clock at night a great crowd of people had gathered beneath the gas lamps in Pall Mall, watching with pale upturned faces the lighted blinds of the war office. The crowd was silent and impressively still. Only if a figure moved for an instant across the blinds, a thrill of expectation passed from man to man, and the crowd swayed in a continuous movement from edge to edge. Lieutenant Such, careful of his wounded leg, was standing on the outskirts with his back to the parapet of the Junior Carlton Club, when he felt himself touched upon the arm. 
He saw Harry Feversham at his side. Feversham's face was working and an extraordinarily white. His eyes were bright like the eyes of a man in a fever, and such at the first was not sure that he knew or cared who it was to whom he talked. "'I might have been out there in Egypt tonight,' said Harry in a quick, troubled voice. "'Think of it! I might have been out there, sitting by a campfire in the desert talking over the battle with Jack Durrance, or dead, perhaps. What would it have mattered? I would have been in Egypt tonight.' Feversham's unexpected appearance, no less than his wandering tongue, told such that somehow his fortunes had gone seriously wrong. He had many questions in his mind, but he did not ask a single one of them. He took Feversham's arm and led him straight out of the throng. "'I saw you in the crowd,' continued Feversham. "'I thought that I would speak to you because—' "'Do you remember, a long time ago you gave me your card? I have always kept it, because I have always feared that I would have reason to use it.' You said that if one was in trouble, the telling might help. Such stopped his companion. We will go in here. We can find a quiet corner in the upper smoking room. And Harry looked up, saw that he was standing by the steps of the Army and Navy Club. Good God, not there! He cried in a sharp, low voice, and moved quickly into the roadway, where no light fell directly on his face. Such limped after him. Nor tonight. It is late. Tomorrow, if you will, in some quiet place and after nightfall. I do not go out in the daylight. Again, Such asked no questions. I know a quiet restaurant, he said. If we dine there at nine, we shall meet no one whom we know. I will meet you just before nine tomorrow night at the corner of Swallow Street. They dined together accordingly on the following evening at a table in the corner of the Criterion Grill Room. Feversham looked quickly about him as he entered the room. I dine here often when I am in town, said Such. Listen! The throbbing of the engines working the electric light could be distinctly heard. Their vibrations could be felt. "'It reminds me of a ship,' said Such, with a smile. "'I can almost fancy myself in the gun-room again. We will have dinner. Then you should tell me your story.' "'You have heard nothing of it?' asked Feversham suspiciously. "'Not a word.' And Feversham drew a breath of relief. It had seemed to him that everyone must know. He imagined contempt on every face which passed him in the street. Lieutenant Such was even more concerned this evening than he had been the night before. He saw Harry Feversham clearly now in a full light. Harry's face was thin and haggard with lack of sleep. There were black hollows beneath his eyes. He drew his breath and made his movements in a restless, feverish fashion. His nerves seemed strung to breaking point. Once or twice, between the courses, he began his story, but Such would not listen until the cloth was cleared. Now, said he, holding out his cigar case, Take your time, Harry. Thereupon Feversham told him the whole truth, without exaggeration or omission, forcing himself to a slow, careful matter-of-fact speech, so that in the end such almost fell into the illusion that it was just the story of a stranger which Feversham was recounting merely to pass the time. He began with the Crimean night at the Broad Place, and ended with the ball at Lennon House. I came back across Low Swilly early that morning, he said in conclusion, and travelled at once to London. Since then I have stayed in my rooms all day, listening to the bugles calling in the barrack yard beneath my windows. At night I prowl about the streets, or lie in bed waiting for the Westminster clock to sound each new quarter of an hour. On foggy nights, too, I can hear the steam sirens on the river. "'Do you know when the ducks start quacking in St. James's Park?' he asked with a laugh. "'At two o'clock to the minute.' Such listened to the story without interruption. But halfway through the narrative he changed his attitude, and in a significant way— up to the moment when Harry told of his concealment of the telegram, Such had sat with his arms upon the table in front of him, and his eyes upon his companion. Thereafter he raised a hand to his forehead, and so remained with his face screened while the rest was told. Feversham had no doubt of the reason. Lieutenant Such wished to conceal the scorn he felt, and he could not trust the muscles of his face. Feversham, however, mitigated nothing, but continued steadily, and truthfully to the end. But even after the end was reached, such did not remove his hand, nor for some little while did he speak. When he did speak, his words came upon Feversham's ears with a shock of surprise. There was no contempt in them, and though his voice shook, it shook with great contrition. "'I am much to blame,' he said. "'I should have spoken that night at Broad Place, and I held my tongue. I shall hardly forgive myself.' The knowledge that it was Muriel Graham's son who had thus brought ruin and disgrace upon himself was uppermost in the lieutenant's mind. He felt that he had failed in the discharge of an obligation, 
self-imposed, no doubt, but a very real obligation nonetheless. You see, I understood, he continued remorsefully. Your father, I'm afraid, never would. He never will, interrupted Harry. No, no, Such agreed. Your mother, of course, had she lived, would have seen clearly. But few women, I think, except your mother. Brute courage! Women make a god of it. That girl, for instance. And again Harry Feversham interrupted. You must not blame her. I was defrauding her into marriage. Suppose that you had never met her. Would you still have sent in your papers? I think not, said Harry slowly. I want to be fair. Disgracing my name and those dead men in the hall I think I would have risked. I could not risk disgracing her. And Lieutenant Such thumped his fist despairingly upon the table. If only I had spoken at Broad Place. Harry, why didn't you let me speak? I might have saved you many unnecessary years of torture. Good heavens! What a childhood you must have spent with that fear all alone with you. It makes me shiver. It makes me shiver to think of it. I might even have saved you from this last catastrophe. For I understood. I understood. Lieutenant Such saw more clearly into the dark places of Harry Feversham's mind than Harry Feversham did himself, and because he saw so clearly he could feel no contempt. The long years of childhood and boyhood and youth lived apart in Broad Place in the presence of the uncomprehending father and the relentless dead men on the walls had done the harm. There had been no one in whom the boy could confide. The fear of his cowardice had sapped incessantly at his heart. He had walked about with it. He had taken it with him to his bed. It had haunted his dreams. It had been his perpetual menacing companion. It had kept him from intimacy with his friends, lest an impulsive ward should betray him. Lieutenant Such did not wonder that in the end it had brought about this irretrievable mistake. For Lieutenant Such understood. "'Did you ever read Hamlet?' he asked. "'Of course,' said Harry in reply. "'Ah, but did you consider it? The same disability is clear in that character.' The thing which he foresaw, which he thought over, which he imagined in the act and in the consequences, that he shrank from upbraiding himself even as you have done. Yet, when the moment of action comes, sharp and immediate, does he fail? No, he excels, and just by reason of that foresight. I have seen men in the Crimea, tortured by their imaginations before the fight. Once the fight had begun, you must search amongst the Oriental fanatics for their match. Am I a coward? Do you remember the lines? Am I a coward, who calls me villain, breaks my pate across, plucks off my beard and blows it in my face? There's the case in a nutshell, if only I had spoken on that night. One or two people passed the table on the way out. Such stopped and looked around the room. It was nearly empty. He glanced at his watch and saw that the hour was eleven. Some plan of action must be decided upon that night. It was not enough to hear Harry Feversham's story. There still remained the question— what was Harry Feversham, disgraced and ruined, now to do? How was he to recreate his life? How was the secret of his disgrace to be most easily concealed? "'You cannot stay in London, hiding by day, slinking about by night,' he said with a shiver. "'That's too like—' and he checked himself. Feversham, however, completed the sentence. "'That's too like Wilmington,' said he, quietly, recalling the story which his father had told so many years ago— and which he had never forgotten, even for a single day. But Wilmington's end will not be mine. Of that I can assure you. I shall not stay in London. He spoke with an air of decision. He had indeed mapped out already the plan of action concerning which Lieutenant Such was so disturbed. Such, however, was occupied with his own thoughts. Who knows of the feathers? How many people? he asked. Give me their names. Trench, Castleton, Willoughby, began Feversham. All three are in Egypt— Besides, for the credit of the regiment, they are likely to hold their tongue when they return. Dermod, Eustace, and, and Ethne, they will not speak. You, Durrance, perhaps, and my father. Such leaned back in his chair and stared. Your father? You wrote to him? No, I went into Surrey and told him. Again, remorse for that occasion recognized and not used seized upon Lieutenant Such. Why didn't I speak that night? He said impotently a coward, and you go quietly down to Surrey and confront your father with that story to tell him. You do not even write. You stand up and tell it to him face to face. Harry, I reckon myself as good as another when it comes to bravery, 
but for the life of me I could not have done that. It was not pleasant, said Feversham simply, and this was the only description of the interview between father and son which was vouchsafed to anyone. But Lieutenant Such knew the father, and knew the son. He could guess at all which that one adjective implied. Harry Feversham told the results of his journey into Surrey. My father continues my allowance. I shall need it, every penny of it, otherwise I should have taken nothing. But I am not to go home again. I did not mean to go home for a long while in any case, if at all. He drew his pocket-book from his breast and took from it the four white feathers. These he laid before him on the table. "'You have kept them?' exclaimed Such. "'Indeed, I treasure them,' said Harry quietly. "'That seems strange to you. To you they are the symbols of my disgrace. To me they are much more. They are my opportunities of retrieving it.' He looked about the room, separated three of the feathers, pushed them forward a little on the tablecloth, and then leaned across toward Such. "'What if I could compel Trench, Castleton, and Willoughby to take back from me, each in his turn, the feather he sent? I do not say that it is likely. I do not say even that it is possible. But there is a chance that it may be possible, and I must wait upon that chance. There will be few men leading active lives as these three do who will not at some moment stand in great peril and great need. To be in readiness for that moment is from now my career. All three are in Egypt. I leave for Egypt to-morrow. Upon the face of Lieutenant Such there came a look of great and unexpected happiness. Here was an issue of which he had never thought, and it was the only issue, as he knew for certain, once he was aware of it. This student of human nature disregarded without a scruple the prudence and the calculation proper to the character which he assumed the obstacles in Harry Feversham's way, the possibility that at the last moment he might shrink again, the improbability that three such opportunities would occur. These matters he overlooked. His eyes already shone with pride. The three feathers for him were already taken back. The prudence was on Harry Feversham's side. "'There are endless difficulties,' he said. "'Just to cite one, I am a civilian. These three are soldiers surrounded by soldiers. So much the less opportunity, therefore, for a civilian.' But it is not necessary that the three men should be themselves in peril, objected Such, for you to convince them that the fault is retrieved. Oh, no. There may be other ways, agreed Feversham. The plan came suddenly into my mind, indeed, at the moment when Ethne bade me take up the feathers and added the fourth. I was on the point of tearing them across, when this way out of it sprang clearly in my mind. But I have thought it over since during these last weeks, while I sat listening to the bugles in the barrack-yard and I am sure there is no other way. But it is well worth trying. You see, if the three take back their feathers, he drew a deep breath, and in a very low voice, with his eyes upon the table, so that his face was hidden from such, he added, Why then, she perhaps might take hers back too. Will she wait, do you think? asked such, and Harry raised his head quickly. Oh, no, he exclaimed. I had no thought of that. She has not even a suspicion of what I intend to do nor do I wish her to have one until the intention is fulfilled. My thought was different. And he began to speak with hesitation for the first time in the course of that evening. I find it difficult to tell you. Ethne said something to me the day before the feathers came, something rather sacred. I think that I will tell you, because what she said is just what sends me out upon this errand. But for her words, I would very likely never have thought of it. I find in them my motive and a great hope. They may seem strange to you, Mr. Such, but I ask you to believe that they are very real to me. She said, and it was when she knew no more than that my regiment was ordered to Egypt. She was blaming herself because I had resigned my commission, for which there was no need because, and these were her words, because had I fallen, although she would have felt lonely all her life, she would none the less have surely known that she and I would see much of one another afterwards. Feversham had spoken his words with difficulty, not looking at his companion, and he continued with his eyes still averted. Do you understand? I have a hope that if this fault can be repaired, and he pointed to the feathers, we might still perhaps see something of one another afterwards. It was a strange proposition, no doubt, to be debated across the soiled tablecloth of a public restaurant, but neither of them felt it to be strange or even fanciful. They were dealing with the simple, serious issues, and they had reached a point where they could not be affected by any incongruity in their surroundings. 
Lieutenant Sutch did not speak for some while after Harry Feversham had done, and in the end Harry looked up at his companion, prepared for almost a word of ridicule, but he saw Sutch's right hand outstretched toward him. "'When I come back,' said Feversham, and he rose from his chair. He gathered the feathers together and replaced them in his pocketbook. "'I have told you everything,' he said. "'You see, I wait upon chance opportunities. Three, three may not come in Egypt. They may never come at all, and in that case I shall not come back at all, or they may come only at the very end, and after many years. Therefore I thought that I would like just one person to know the truth thoroughly in case I do not come back. If you hear definitely that I never can come back, I would be glad if you would tell my father. I understand, said Such. But don't tell him everything. I mean, not the last part, not what I have just said about Ethne and my chief motive, for I do not think that he would understand. Otherwise you will keep silence altogether. Promise. Lieutenant Such promised, but with an absent face, and Feversham consequently insisted. You will breathe no word of this to any man or woman, however hard you may be pressed, "'Except to my father under the circumstances which I have explained,' said Feversham. Lieutenant Such promised a second time, and without an instant's hesitation. It was quite natural that Harry should lay some stress upon the pledge, since any disclosure of his purpose might very well wear the appearance of a foolish boast, and Such himself saw no reason why he should refuse it. So he gave the promise and fettered his hands. His thoughts, indeed, were occupied with the limit Harry had set upon the knowledge which was to be imparted to General Feversham. Even if he died with his mission unfulfilled, such was to hide from the father that which was best in the son, at the son's request. And the saddest part of it to such as thinking was that the son was right in so requesting. For what he said was true. The father could not understand. Lieutenant Such was brought back to the causes of the whole miserable business. The premature death of the mother, who could have understood. The want of comprehension in the father, who was left. And his own silence on the Crimean night at Broad Place. "'If only I had spoken,' he said sadly. He dropped the end of his cigar into his coffee cup, and standing up reached for his hat. "'Many things are irrevocable, Harry,' he said. "'But no one ever knows whether they are irrevocable or not until one has found out. It is always worth while finding out.'" The next evening Feversham crossed to Calais. It was night as wild as that on which Durrance had left England, and like Durrance, Feversham had a friend to see him off, for the last thing which his eyes beheld as the packet swung away from the pier was the face of Lieutenant Such beneath the gas lamp. The lieutenant maintained his position after the boat had passed into the darkness and until the throb of its paddles could no longer be heard. Then he limped through the rain to his hotel, aware, and regretfully aware, that he was growing old. It was long since he had felt regret on that account, and the feeling was very strange to him. Ever since the Crimea he had been upon the world's half-pay list, as he had once said to General Feversham, and what with that and the recollection of a certain magical season before the Crimea, he had looked forward to an old age as an approaching friend. Tonight, however, he prayed that he might live just long enough to welcome back Muriel Graham's son with his honor redeemed and his great fault atoned. End of chapter 6《Chapter Seven of the Four Feathers》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Becky Cook. The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason. Chapter Seven The Last Reconnaissance. No one, said Durrance, and he strapped his field glasses into the leather case at his side. No one, sir, Captain Mather agreed. We will move forward. The scouts went on ahead, the troops resumed their formation, the two seven-pounder mountain guns closed up behind, and Durrance's detachment of the Camel Corps moved down from the gloomy ridge of Khor Gwab, thirty-five miles southwest of Suakin, into the plateau of Sinkat. It was the last reconnaissance in strength before the evacuation of the eastern Sudan. All through that morning the camels had jolted slowly up the gully of shale, between red precipitous rocks and when the rocks fell back, between red mountain heaps all crumbled into a desolation of stones. Hardly a patch of grass or the ragged branches of a mimosa had broken the monotony of ruin. And after that arid journey, the green bushes of Sinkat in the valley below comforted the eye with the pleasing aspect of a park. The troopers sat their saddles with a greater alertness. 
They moved in a diagonal line across the plateau towards the mountains of Erkoweet, a silent company on a plain still more silent. It was eleven o'clock. The sun rose toward the center of a colorless, cloudless sky. The shadows of the camel shortened upon the sand, and the sand itself glistened white as the beach of the Scilly Islands. There was no draft of air that morning to whisper amongst the rich foliage, and the shadows of the branches lay so distinct and motionless upon the ground that they might themselves have been strewn there on some past day by a storm. The only sounds that were audible were the sharp clank of weapons, the soft, ceaseless padding of the camel's feet, and at times the whir of a flight of pigeons disturbed by the approaching cavalcade. Yet there was life on the plateau, though of a noiseless kind, for as the leaders rode along the curves of sand, trim and smooth between the shrubs like carriage drives, they would see from time to time, far ahead of them, a herd of gazelles start up from the ground and race silently, a flash of dappled brown and white to the enclosing hills. It seemed that here was a country during this last hour created. Yet this way the caravans passed southwards to Erkoweet and the Khor Baraka. Here the Suakis built their summer houses, said Durrance, answering the thought in his mind. And there Tufik fought and died with his four hundred men, said Mather, pointing forward. For three hours the troops marched across the plateau. It was the month of May, and the sun blazed upon them with an intolerable heat. They had long since lost their alertness. They rode rocking drowsily in their saddles and prayed for the evening and the silver shine of stars. For three hours the camels went mincing on with their queer smirking motions of the head, and then quite suddenly a hundred yards ahead Durant saw a broken wall with window spaces which let the sky through. "'The fort,' said he. Three years had passed since Osmond Digna had captured and destroyed it, but during these three years its roofless ruins had sustained another siege, and one no less persistent. The quick-growing trees had so closely girt, and encroached upon it to the rear and to the right and to the left, that the traveller came upon it unexpectedly, as child Roland upon the dark tower in the plain. In the front, however, the sand still stretched open to the wells, where three great gemiza trees of dark and spreading foliage stood spaced like sentinels. In the shadow to the right front of the fort, where the bushes fringed the open sand with the level regularity of a river bank, the soldiers unsaddled the camels and prepared their food. Durrance and Captain Mather walked around the fort, and as they came to the southern corner, Durrance stopped. Hello, said he. Some Arab has camped here, said Mather, stopping in his turn. The grey ashes of a wood-fire lay in a little heap upon a blackened stone. "'And lately,' said Durrance. Mather walked on, mounted a few rough steps to the crumbled archway of the entrance, and passed into the unroofed corridors and rooms. Durrance turned the ashes over with his boot. The stump of a charred and whitened twig glowed red. Durrance set his foot upon it, and a tiny thread of smoke spurted into the air. "'Very lately,' he said to himself and he followed Mather into the fort. In the corners of the mud-walls, in any fissure, in the very floor, young trees were sprouting. Rearward, a steep glacis and a deep foss defended the works. Durant sat himself down upon the parapet of the wall above the glacis, while the pigeons wheeled and circled overhead, thinking of the long months during which Tufik must daily have strained his eyes from this very spot toward the pass over the hills from Suakin, looking as that other general far to the south had done for the sunlight flashing on the weapons of the help which did not come. Mather sat by his side and reflected in quite another spirit. Already the guards are steaming out through the coral reefs toward Suez. A week and our turn comes, he said. What a god-forsaken country! I come back to it, said Durrance. Why? I like it. I like the people. Mather thought the taste unaccountable, but he knew nevertheless that— However unaccountable in itself, it accounted for his companion's rapid promotion and success. Sympathy had stood Durrance in the stead of much ability. Sympathy had given him patience and the power to understand, so that during these three years of campaign he had left far quicker and far abler men behind him, in his knowledge of the sorely harassed tribes of the eastern Sudan. He liked them. He could enter into their hatred of the old Turkish rule. He could understand their fanaticism and their pretense of fanaticism under the compulsion of Osman Digna's hordes. "'Yes, I shall come back,' he said, "'and in three months' time. For one thing, we know, 
every Englishman in Egypt, too, knows, that this can't be the end. I want to be here when the work's taken in hand again. I hate unfinished things. The sun beat relentlessly upon the plateau. The men, stretched in the shade, slept. The afternoon was as noiseless as the morning. Durrance and Mather sat for some while, compelled to silence by the silence surrounding them. But Durrance's eyes turned at last from the amphitheatre of hills. They lost their abstraction. They became intently fixed upon the shrubbery beyond the glacis. He was no longer recollecting Tufik Bay and his heroic defence, or speculating upon the work to be done in the years ahead. Without turning his head, he saw that Mather was gazing in the same direction as himself. "'What are you thinking about?' he asked suddenly of Mather. Mather laughed and answered thoughtfully. "'I was drawing up the menu, the first dinner I will have when I reach London. I will eat it alone, I think, quite alone, and at the epito. It will begin with the watermelon. And you?' I was wondering why, now that the pigeons have got used to our presence, they should still be wheeling in and out of one particular tree. Don't point to it, please. I mean the tree beyond the ditch, and to the right of the two small bushes. All about them they could see the pigeons quietly perched upon the branches, spotting the foliage like a purple fruit. Only above the one tree they circled and timorously called. We will draw that covert, said Durrance. Take a dozen men, and surround it quietly. He himself remained on the glacis watching the tree and the thick undergrowth. He saw six soldiers creep round the shrubbery from the left, six more from the right. But before they could meet and ring the tree in, he saw the branches violently shaken, and an Arab with a roll of yellowish damar wound about his waist, and armed with a flat-headed spear and a shield of hide, dashed from the shelter and raced out between the soldiers into the open plain. He ran for a few yards only for Mather gave a sharp order to his men, and the Arab, as though he understood that order, came to a stop before a rifle could be lifted to his shoulder. He walked quietly back to Mather. He was brought up on to the glacis, where he stood before Durrance without insolence or servility. He explained in Arabic that he was a man of the Kebabish tribe named Abu Fatma, and friendly to the English. He was on his way to Suakin. "'Why did you hide?' asked Durrance. "'Twas safer.' I knew you for my friends, but, my gentlemen, did you know me for years? Then Durrance said quickly, You speak English. And Durrance spoke in English. The answer came without hesitation. I know a few words. Where did you learn them? In Khartoum. Thereafter he was left alone with Durrance on the glacis, and the two men talked together for the best part of an hour. At the end of that time the Arab was seen to descend the glacis, cross the trench, and proceed toward the hills. Durrance gave the order for the resumption of the march. The water tanks were filled. The men replenished their zamshias, knowing that of all thirst in this world, the afternoon thirst is the very worst, saddled their camels, and mounted to the usual groaning and snarling. The detachment moved northwestward from Sinquet, at an acute angle to its morning's march. It skirted the hills opposite to the pass from which it had descended in the morning. The bushes grew sparse. It came into a black country of stones, scantily relieved by yellow-tasseled mimosas. Durrance called Mather to his side. That Arab had a strange story to tell me. He was Gordon's servant in Khartoum, at the beginning of 1884, eighteen months ago, in fact. Gordon gave him a letter which he was to take to Berber, whence the contents were to be telegraphed to Cairo. But Berber had just fallen when the messenger arrived there. He was seized upon and imprisoned the day after his arrival. But during the one day which he had free, he hid the letter in the wall of a house, and so far as he knows, it has not been discovered. He would have been questioned if it had been, said Mather. Precisely, and he was not questioned. He escaped from Berber at night three weeks ago. The story is curious, eh? And the letter still remains in the wall? It is curious. Perhaps the man was telling lies. He had the chain mark on his ankles, said Durrance. The cavalcade turned to the left into the hills on the northern side of the plateau, and climbed again over shale. A letter from Gordon, said Durrance in a musing voice, scribbled perhaps upon the rooftop of his palace, by the side of his great telescope, a sentence written in haste, and his eye again to the land searching over the palm trees for the smoke of the steamers, and it comes down to the Nile to be buried in a mud wall in Berber. Yes, it's curious and he turned his face to the west in the sinking sun. Even as he looked, the sun dipped behind the hills. 
The sky above his head darkened rapidly to violet. In the west it famed a glory of colors rich and iridescent. The colors lost their violence and blended delicately into one rose hue. The rose lingered for a little, and fading in its turn left a sky of the purest emerald green transfused with light from beneath rim of the world. "'If only they had let us go last year westward to the Nile,' he said with a sort of passion, before Khartoum had fallen, before Berber had surrendered. But they would not. The magic of the sunset was not at all in Durance's thoughts. The story of the letter had struck upon a chord of reverence within him. He was occupied with the history of that honest, great, impracticable soldier, who despised by officials and thwarted by intrigues, a man of few ties and much loneliness, had gone unflaggingly about his work, knowing the while that the moment his back was turned the work was in an instant all undone. Darkness came upon the troops. The camels quickened their pace, the cicadas shrilled from every tuft of grass. The detachment moved down toward the well of Disabil. Durrance lay long awake that night on his camp bedstead, spread out beneath the stars. He forgot the letter in the mud wall. Southward the southern cross hung slanting in the sky. Above him glittered the curve of the great bear. In a week he would sail for England. He would lay awake, counting up the years since the packet had cast off from Dover Pier, and he found that the tale of them was good. Kassassin, tell el Kabir. The rush down the Red Sea, to Kar, to Mai, to Minib. The crowded moments came vividly to his mind. He thrilled even now at the recollection of the Hayden Dawas leaping and stabbing through the breach of McNeil Sariba six miles from Suakin. He recalled the obdurate defences of the Berkshires, the steadiness of the Marines, the rallying of the broken troops. The years had been good years, years of plenty, years which had advanced him to the brevet rank of lieutenant colonel. A week more. Only a week, murmured Mather drowsily. I shall come back, said Durrance with a laugh. Have you no friends? And there was a pause. Yes, I have friends. I shall have three months wherein to see them. Durrance had written no word to Harry Feversham during these years. Not to write letters was indeed a part of the man. Correspondence was a difficulty to him. He was thinking now that he would surprise his friends by a visit to Donegal or he might find them perhaps in London. He would ride once again in the row, but in the end he would come back, for his friend was married, and to Ethne Eustace, and as for himself his life's work lay here in the Sudan. He would certainly come back. And so, turning on his side, he slept dreamlessly while the host of the stars trampled across the heavens above his head. End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight of the Four Feathers》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Becky Cook. The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason. Chapter Eight. Lieutenant Such is Tempted to Lie. Durrance reached London one morning in June, and on that afternoon took the first walk of the exile into Hyde Park where he sat beneath the trees marvelling at the grace of his countrywomen and the delicacy of their apparel. A solitary figure, sunburnt and stamped already with that indefinable expression of the eyes and face which marks the men set apart in the distant corners of the world. Amongst the people who strolled past him, one, however, smiled, and as he rose from his chair Mrs. Adair came to his side. She looked him over from head to foot with a quick and almost furtive glance, which might have told even Durant something of the place which he held in her thoughts. She was comparing him with the picture which she had of him now three years old. She was looking for the small marks of change which those years might have brought about, and with eyes of apprehension. But Durant only noted that she was dressed in black. She understood the question in his mind and answered it. "'My husband died eighteen months ago,' she explained in a quiet voice. "'He was thrown from his horse during a run with the Pitchley.' He was killed at once. I had not heard. Durrance answered awkwardly. I'm very sorry. Mrs. Adair took a chair beside him and did not reply. She was a woman of perplexing silences, and her pale and placid face, with its cold, correct outline, gave no clue to the thoughts with which she occupied them. She sat without stirring. Durrance was embarrassed. He remembered Mr. Adair as a good-humoured man, whose chief quality was his evident affection for his wife. 
but with what eyes the wife had looked upon him he had never up till now considered. Mr. Adair, indeed, had been at the best a shadowy figure in that small household, and Durrance found it difficult even to draw upon his recollections for any full expression of regret. He gave up the attempt, and asked, "'Are Harry Feversham and his wife in town?' Mrs. Adair was slow to reply. "'Not yet,' she said, after a pause. But immediately she corrected herself, and said a little hurriedly, "'I mean, the marriage never took place.' Durrance was not a man easily startled, and even when he was his surprise was not expressed in exclamations. "'I do not think that I understand. Why did it never take place?' he asked. Mrs. Adair looked sharply at him, as though inquiring for the reason of his deliberate tones. "'I do not know why,' she said. "'Ethne can keep a secret if she wishes.' And Durrance nodded his assent. "'The marriage was broken off on the night of a dance at Lennon House.' Durrance turned at once to her. "'Just before I left England three years ago?' "'Yes, then, you knew?' "'No. Well, you have explained to me something which occurred on the very night that I left Dover. What has become of Harry?' Mrs. Adair shrugged her shoulders. "'I do not know. I have met no one who does know. I do not think I have met any one who has seen him since that time. He must have left England.' Durrance pondered on this mysterious disappearance. It was Harry Feversham, then, whom he had seen upon the pier as the channel boat cast off. The man with the troubled and despairing face was, after all, his friend. "'And Miss Eustace?' he asked after a pause, with a queer timidity. "'She has married since?' Again Mrs. Adair took her time to reply. "'No,' said she. "'Then she is still at Ramelton.' Mrs. Adair shook her head. "'There was a fire at Lennon House a year ago.' Did you ever hear of a constable called Bastable? Indeed I did. He was the means of introducing me to Miss Eustace and her father. I was travelling from Londonderry to Letterkenny. I received a letter from Mr. Eustace, whom I did not know, but who knew from my friends at Letterkenny that I was coming past his house. He asked me to stay the night with him. Naturally enough I declined, with the result that Bastable arrested me on a magistrate's warrant as soon as I landed from the ferry. That is the man— said Mrs. Adair, and she told Durrance the story of the fire. It appeared that Bastable's claim to Dermod's friendship rested upon his skill in preparing a particular brew of toddy, which needed a single oyster simmering in the saucepan to give it its perfection of flavor. About two o'clock of a June morning the spirit lamp on which the saucepan stood had been overset. Neither of the two confederates in drink had their wits about them at the moment, and the house was half burnt, and the rest of it ruined by water before the fire could be got under. There are consequences still more distressing than the destruction of the house, she continued. The fire was a beacon warning to Damod's creditors for one thing, and Damod, already overpowered with debts, fell in a day upon complete ruin. He was drenched by the water hoses besides, and took a chill which nearly killed him, from the effects of which he has never recovered. You will find him a broken man. The estates are let, and Ethne is now living with her father in a little mountain village in Donegal. Mrs. Adair had not looked at Durrance while she spoke. She kept her eyes fixed steadily in front of her, and indeed she spoke without feeling on one side or the other, but rather like a person constraining herself to speech, because speech was a necessity. Nor did she turn to look at Durrance when she had done. "'So she has lost everything,' said Durrance. "'She still has a home in Donegal,' returned Mrs. Adair. "'And that means a great deal to her,' said Durrance slowly. "'Yes, I think you are right.' "'It means,' said Mrs. Adair, "'that Ethne, with all her ill luck, has reason to be envied by many other women.' Durrance did not answer that suggestion directly. He watched the carriages drive past. He listened to the chatter and the laughter of the people about him. His eyes were refreshed by the women in their light-coloured frocks, and all the time his slow mind was working toward the lame expression of his philosophy. Mrs. Adair turned to him with a slight impatience in the end. "'Of what are you thinking?' she asked. "'That women suffer much more than men when the world goes wrong with them,' he answered, and the answer was rather a question than a definite assertion. "'I know very little, of course. I can only guess. But I think women gather up into themselves what they had been through much more than we do. To them what is past becomes a real part of them, as much as part of them as a limb. To us it's always something external, at the best the rung of a ladder, at the worst a weight on the wheel.' "'Don't you think so, too?' 
I phrase the thought badly, but put it as this way. Women look backwards. We look ahead. So misfortune hits them harder, eh? Mrs. Adair answered in her own way. She did not expressly agree, but a certain humility became audible in her voice. The mountain village at which Ethne is living, she said in a low voice, is called Glenalla. A track strikes upwards towards it from the road halfway between Rathmullen and Ramelton. She rose as she finished the sentence and held out her hand. Shall I see you? Are you still in Hill Street? said Durrance. I shall be for a time in London. Mrs. Adair raised her eyebrows. She looked always by nature for the intricate and concealed motive, so that conduct which sprang from a reason obvious and simple was likely to baffle her. She was baffled now by Durrance's resolve to remain in town. Why did he not travel at once to Donegal, she asked herself, since thither his thoughts undoubtedly preceded him. She heard of his continual presence at his service club, and could not understand. She did not even have a suspicion of his motive when he himself informed her that he had travelled into Surrey, and he had spent a day with General Feversham. It had been an ineffectual day for Durrance. The general kept himself steadily to the history of the campaign from which he had just returned. Only once was he able to approach the topic of Harry Feversham's disappearance, and at the mere mention of his son's name the old general's face set like plaster. It became void of expression, and inattentive as a mask. "'We will talk of something else, if you please,' said he, and Durrance returned to London, not an inch nearer to Donegal. Thereafter he sat under the great tree in an inner courtyard of his club, talking to this man and to that, and still unsatisfied with the conversation. All through that June the afternoons and evenings found him at his post. Never a friend of Feversham's passed by the tree but Durrance had a word for him, and the word led always to a question, but the question elicited no answer except a shrug of the shoulders and, "'Hanged if I know!' Harry Feversham's place knew him no more. He had dropped even out of the speculations of his friends. Toward the end of June, however, an old retired naval officer limped into the courtyard, saw Durrance, hesitated, and began with a remarkable alacrity to move away. Durrance sprang up from his seat. "'Mr. Such,' said he, "'you have forgotten me.' "'Colonel Durrance, to be sure,' said the embarrassed lieutenant. "'It is some while since we met, but I remember you very well now. I think we met—let me see, where was it? An old man's memory, Colonel Durrance, is like a leaky ship. It comes to harbour with its cargo of recollections swamped. Neither lieutenant's present embarrassment nor his previous hesitation escaped Durrance's notice.' "'We met at Broad Place,' said he. "'I wish you to give me news of my friend Feversham. "'Why was his engagement with Miss Eustace broken off? "'Where is he now?' "'The lieutenant's eyes gleamed for a moment with satisfaction. "'He had always been doubtful whether Durrance was aware of Harry's fall into disgrace. "'Durrance plainly did not know. "'There is only one person in the world, I believe,' said Such, "'who can answer both of your questions.' "'Durrance was in no way disconcerted. "'Yes?' "'I have waited here a month for you,' he replied. Lieutenant Such pushed his fingers through his beard and stared down at his companion. "'Well, it is true,' he admitted. "'I can answer your questions, but I will not. "'Harry Feversham is my friend. "'General Feversham is his father, yet he knows only half the truth. "'Miss Eustace was betrothed to him, and she knows no more. "'I pledged my word to Harry that I would keep my silence.' It is not curiosity which makes me ask. I am sure that, on the contrary, it is friendship, said the lieutenant cordially. Nor that entirely. There is another aspect of the matter. I will not ask you to answer my questions, but I will put a third one to you. It is one harder for me to ask than for you to answer. Would a friend of Harry Feversham be at all disloyal to that friendship if— And Durant's flush beneath his sunburn— if he tried his luck with Miss Eustace. The question startled Lieutenant Such. You? he exclaimed, and he stood considering Durrance, remembering the rapidity of his promotion, speculating upon his likelihood to take a woman's fancy. Here was an aspect of the case, indeed, to which he had not given a thought, and he was no less troubled than startled, for there had grown up within him a jealousy on behalf of Harry Feversham, as strong as a mother's for a favorite second son. He had nursed with a most pleasurable anticipation a hope that, in the end, Harry would come back to all that he had once owned like a rethroned king. He stared at Durrance and saw the hope stricken. Durrance looked the man of courage which his record proved him to be, and Lieutenant Such had his theory of women. 
brute courage they make a god of it well asked durrance lieutenant sutch was aware that he must answer he was sorely tempted to lie for he knew enough of the man who questioned him to be certain that the lie would have its effect durrance would go back to the soudan and leave his suit unpressed well sutch looked up at the sky and down upon the flags harry had foreseen that this complication was likely to occur he had not wished that ethne should wait sutch imagined him at this very moment lost somewhere under the burning sun and compared that picture with the one before his eyes the successful soldier taking his ease at his club he felt inclined to break his promise to tell the whole truth to answer both the questions which durrance had first asked and again the pitiless monosyllable demanded his reply well no said sutch regretfully there would be no disloyalty and on that evening durrance took the train for holyhead end of chapter eight Chapter 9 of The Four Feathers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Ullman. The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason. Chapter 9. At Glenola. The farmhouse stood a mile above the village in a wild moorland country. The heather encroached upon its garden, and the bridle path ended at its door. On three sides, an amphitheatre of hills, which changed so instantly to the season that it seemed one could distinguish from day to day a new gradation in their colours, harboured it like a ship. No trees grew upon these hills. The granite cropped out and missed the moss and heather, but they had a friendly, sheltering look, and Durant's came almost to believe that they put on their different draperies of emerald green and purple and russet brown consciously to delight the eyes of the girl they sheltered the house faced the long slope of country to the inlet of the low from the windows the eyes reached down over the sparse thickets the few tilled fields the whitewashed cottages to the tall woods upon the bank and caught a glimpse of bright water and the gulls poising and dipping above it. Durrance rode up the track upon an afternoon and knew the house at once. For as he approached, the music of violin floated towards him from the windows like a welcome. His hand was checked upon the reins, and a particular strong hope about which he had allowed his fancies to play rose up within him and suspended his breath. He tied up his horse and entered it at the gate formless barrack without the house within was a place of comfort the room into which he was shown with its brasses and its gleaming oak and its wide prospect was bright as the afternoon itself durrance imagined it too with the blinds drawn upon a winter's night and the fires red on the hearth and the wind skirling about the hills and rapping on the panes ethne greeted him without the least bark of surprise i thought that you would come she said and a smile shone upon her face. Durrance laughed suddenly as they shook hands, and Ethne wondered why. She followed the direction of his eyes towards the violin which lay upon a table at her side. It was pale in color. There was a mark, too, close to the bridge, where a morsel of worm-eaten wood had been replaced. It is yours, she said. You are in Egypt. I could not well send it back to you there. I have hoped lately, since I knew, returned durrance that nevertheless you would accept it you see i have said ethne and looking straight into his eyes she added i accepted it some while ago there was a time when i needed to be assured that i had sure friends and a thing tangible helped i was very glad to have it durrance took the instrument from the table handling it delicately like a sacred vessel you have played upon it the Mousseline Overture, perhaps, said he. Do you remember that? She returned with a laugh. Yes, I have played upon it, but only recently. For a long time I put my violin away. It talked to me too intimately of many things which I wished to forget. And these words, like the rest, she spoke without hesitation or any down-dropping of the eyes. 
Durrance fetched up his luggage from Rathmullen the next day and stayed at the farm for a week, but up to the last hour of his visit no further reference was made to Harry Feversham by either Ethne or Durrance, although they were thrown much into each other's company, for Dermod was even more broken than Mrs. Adair's description had led Durrance to expect. His speech was all dwindled to monosyllables. His frame was shrunken, and his clothes bagged upon his limbs. His very stature seemed lessened. Even the anger was clouded from his eye. He had become a stay-at-home, dozing for the most part of the day by a fire, even in that July weather. His longest walk was to the little grey church, which stood naked upon a mound some quarter of a mile away and within view of the windows, and even that walk taxed his strength. He was an old man, fallen upon decrepitude, and almost out of recognition, so that his gestures and the rare tones of his voice struck upon Durrance as something painful, like the mimicry of a dead man. His collie dog seemed to age in company, and to see them side by side one might have said in sympathy. Durrance and Ethne were thus thrown much together. By day, in the wet weather or the fine, they trampled the hills while she, with the color glowing in her face and her eyes, most jealous and eager, showed him her country and extracted his admiration. In the evening she would take her violin, and sitting as of old with an averted face, she would bid the strings speak of the heights and depths. Durrance sat watching the sweep of her arm, the absorption of her face, and counting up his chances. He had not brought with him to Glenalla Lieutenant Such's anticipations that he would succeed. The shadow of Harry Feversham might well separate them. For another thing, he knew very well that poverty would fall more lightly upon her than upon most women. He had indeed had proofs of that. Though the Lennon house was altogether ruined and its lands gone from her, Ethne was still amongst her own people. They still looked eagerly for her visits. She was still the princess of that countryside. On the other hand, she took a frank pleasure in his company, and she led him to speak of his three years' service in the East. No detail was too insignificant for her inquiries, and while he spoke, her eyes continually sounded him and the smile upon her lips continually approved. Durrance did not understand what she was after. Possibly no one could have understood, unless he was aware of what had passed between Harry Feversham and Ethne. Durrance wore the likeness of a man, and she was anxious to make sure that the spirit of a man informed it. He was a dark lantern to her. They might be a flame burning within, or might be mere vacancy and darkness. She was pushing back the slide so that she might be sure. She led him to speak of Egypt upon the last day of his visit. They were seated upon the hillside, on the edge of a stream which leaped from ledge to ledge down a miniature gorge of rock and flowed over deep pools between the ledges very swiftly, a torrent of clear black water. I traveled once, for four days amongst the mirages, he said, lagoons still as a mirror and fringed with misty trees, could almost walk your camel up to the knees in them, before the lagoon receded and the sand glared at you, and one cannot imagine that glare. Every stone within view dances and shakes like a heliograph. You can actually see... Yes, actually see the heat flow breast high across the desert, swift as this stream here, only pellicued. So till the sun sets ahead of you level with your eyes, imagine the nights which follow, nights of infinite silence, with a cool friendly wind blowing from horizon to horizon, and your bed spread for you under the great dome of stars. Oh, he cried, drawing a deep breath. But that country grows on you. It's like the Southern Cross. Four overrated stars when first you see them. But in a week, you begin to look for them. And you miss them when you travel north again. He raised himself upon his elbows and turned suddenly towards her. Do you know, I can only speak for myself. 
but I never feel alone in those empty spaces. On the contrary, I always feel very close to the things I care about, and to the few people I care about too. Her eyes shone very brightly upon him, her lips parted in a smile. He moved nearer to her upon the grass, and sat with his feet gathered under him upon one side, and leaning upon his arm. I used to imagine you out there, he said. You would have loved it. From the start, before daybreak, in the dark, to the campfire at night, you would have been at home. I used to think so as I lay awake wondering how the world went with my friends. And you go back there, she said. Durrance did not immediately answer. The roar of the torrent throbbed about them. When he did speak, all the enthusiasm had gone from his voice. He spoke gazing into the stream. To Wadi Halfa? For two years, I suppose so. Ethne kneeled upon the grass at his side. I shall miss you, she said. She was kneeling just behind him as he sat on the ground, and again there fell a silence between them. Of what are you thinking? That you need not miss me he said, and he was aware that she drew back and sank down upon her heels. My appointment at Halfa, I might shorten the term. I might perhaps avoid it altogether. I have still half my furlough. She did not answer, nor did she change her attitude. She remained very still, and Durrance was alarmed, and all his hopes sank. For a stillness of attitude he knew to be with her as definite an expression of distress as a cry of pain with another woman. He turned about towards her. Her head was bent, but she raised it as he turned, and through her lips smiled. There was a look of great trouble in her eyes. Durrance was a man like another. He first thought was whether there was not some obstacle which would hinder her from compliance, even though she herself was willing. There is your father, he said. Yes, she answered, there is my father too. I could not leave him. Nor need you, said he quickly. That difficulty can be surmounted. To tell the truth, I was not thinking of your father at the moment. Nor was I, said she. Durrance turned away and sat for a little while staring down the rocks into a wrinkled pool of water just beneath. It was after all the shadow of Feversham which stretched between himself and her. I know, of course, he said, that you would never feel troubled, as so many do, with half your heart. You would neither easily care nor lightly forget. I remember enough, she returned in a low voice, to make your words rather a pain to me. Some day, perhaps, I may bring myself to tell everything which happened at that ball three years ago, and then you will be better able to understand why I am a little distressed. All that I can tell you now is this. I have a great fear that I was to some degree the cause of another man's room. I do not mean that I was to blame for it. But if I had not been known to him, his career might perhaps never have come to so an abrupt an end. I am not sure, but I am afraid. I asked whether it was so, and I was told no. But I think very likely... That generosity dictated that answer, and the fear stays. I am much distressed by it. I lie awake with it at night, and then you come, whom I greatly value, and you say quietly, Will you please spoil my career too? And she struck one hand sharply onto the other and cried, But that I will not do. And again he answered, There is no need that you should. Wadi Halfa is not the only place where a soldier can find work to his hand. His voice had taken a new hopefulness, for he had listened intently to the words which he had spoken, and he had construed them by the dictionary of his desires. She had not said that friendship bounded all her thoughts of him. Therefore he need not believe it. Women were given to a hinting modesty of speech, at all events the best of them. A man might read a little more emphasis into their tones and underline their words and still be short of their meaning as he argued. A subtle delicacy graced them in nature. Durrance was near to Benedict's mood. One whom I value, I shall miss you. There might be a double meaning in the phrases. When she said that 
she needed to be assured that she had sure friends did she not mean that she needed their companionship but the argument had he been acute enough to see it proved how deep he was sunk in error for what this girl spoke she habitually meant and she habitually meant no more moreover upon this occasion she had particularly weighed her words no doubt she said a soldier can but can this soldier find work so suitable listen please till i have done i was so very glad to hear all that you have told me about your work and your journeys i was still more glad because of the satisfaction with which you told it for it seemed to me as i listened and as i watched that you had found the one true straight channel along which your life could run swift and smoothly and unharassed and so few do that so very few and she wrung her hands and cried and now you spoil it all durant suddenly faced her he ceased from argument he cried in a voice of passion i am for you ethne that's the true straight channel and upon my word i believe you are for me i thought i admit it at one time i would spend my life out there in the east and that the thought contented me but i have schooled myself into contentment for i believe you married ethne ever so slightly flinched and he himself recognized that he had spoken in a voice over loud so that it had something almost of brutality do i hurt you he continued i am sorry but let me speak the whole truth out i cannot afford reticence i want you to know the first and last of it i say now that i love you yes but i could have said it with equal truth five years ago it is five years since your father arrested me at the ferry down there on luff's willy because i wished to press on to letterkenny and not delay a night by stopping with a stranger five years since i first saw you first heard the language of your violin i remember how you sat with your back towards me the light shone on your hair i could just see your eyelashes and the color of your cheeks i remember the sweep of your arm my dear you are for me i am for you but she drew back from his outstretched hands no she said very gently but with a decision he could not mistake she saw more clearly into his mind than he did himself the restlessness of the born traveller the craving for the large and lonely spaces in the outlandish corners of the world in the incurable intermittent fever to be moving ever moving amongst strange people and under strange skies these were deep-rooted qualities of the man passion might obscure them for a while but they would make their appeal in the end and the appeal would torture the home would become a prison desires would so clash within him there could be no happiness that was the man for herself she looked down the slope of the hill across the brown country away on the right waved the woods about ramelton and her feet flashed a strip of the luff and this was her country she was its child and the sister of its people no she repeated as she rose to her feet Durance rose with her. He was still not so much disheartened as conscious of a blunder. He had put his case badly. He should never have given her the opportunity to think that marriage would be an interruption of his career. We will say goodbye here, she said in the open. We shall be none the less good friends, because three thousand miles hinder us from shaking hands. They shook hands as she spoke i shall be in england again in a year's time said durrance may i come back ethne's eyes and her smile consented i should be sorry to lose you altogether she said although even if i did not see you i should know that i had not lost your friendship she added i should also be glad to hear news of you and what you are doing if ever you have the time to spare i may write he exclaimed eagerly yes she answered and her eagerness made her linger a little doubtfully upon the word that is if you think it fair i mean it might be best for you perhaps to get rid of one entirely from your thoughts and durrance laughed and without any bitterness 
so that in a moment Ethne found herself laughing too, though at what she laughed she would have discovered it difficult to explain. Very well, write to me then, and she added dryly, but it will be about other things. And again Durrance read into her words the interpretation he desired, and again she meant just what she said and not a word more. She stood where he left her, a tall, strong-limbed figure of womanhood, until he was gone out of sight. Then she climbed down to the house, and going into her room, took one of her violins from its case. But it was the violin which Durrance had given her, and before she had touched the strings with her bow, she recognized it and put it suddenly away from her in its case. She snapped the case, too. For a few moments, she sat motionless in her chair. Then she quickly crossed the room and, taking her keys, unlocked the drawer. At the bottom of the drawer there lay hidden a photograph, and at this she looked for a long while and very wistfully. Durrance, meanwhile, walked down to the trap which was waiting for him at the gates of the house, and saw that Dermond Eustace stood in the road with his hat upon his head. I will walk a few yards with you, Colonel Durrance, said Dermode. I have a word for your ear. Durrance suited his stride to the old man's faltering step, and they walked behind the dog cart and in silence. It was not the mere personal disappointment which weighed upon Durrance's spirit, but he could not see with Ethne's eyes, and as his gaze took in that quiet corner of Donegal, he was filled with a great sadness, laced all her life should be passed in this seclusion. Her grave dug in the end under the wall of the tiny church, and her memory lingered only in a few white cottages scattered over the moorland, and for a very little while. He was recalled by the pressure of Dermot's hand upon his elbow. There was a gleam of inquiry in the old man's faded eyes, but it seemed that speech itself was a difficulty. You have news for me, he asked, after some hesitation. News of Harry Feversham? I thought that I would ask you before you went away. None, said Dorans. I am sorry, replied Dermod, wistfully, though I have no reason for sorrow. He struck us a cruel blow, Colonel Dorans. I should have nothing but curses for him in my mouth and my heart. A black-throated coward, my reason calls him, and yet I would be very glad to hear how the world goes with him. You are his friend, but you do not know. It was actually of Harry Feversham that Dermot Eustace was speaking, and Durrance, as he remarked, the old man's wistfulness of voice and face was seized with a certain remorse that he allowed Ethne so to thrust his friend out of his thoughts. He speculated upon the mystery of Harry Feversham's disappearance at times as he sat in the evening upon his veranda above the Nile at Wadi Halfa, piecing together the few hints which he had gathered. A black-throated coward, Dermot had called Harry Feversham, and Ethne had said enough to assure him that something graver than any dispute, something which had destroyed all her faith in the man, had put an end to their betrothal, but he could not conjecture at the particular cause, and the only consequence of his perplexed imaginings was the growth of a very real anger within him against the man who had been his friend. So the winter passed, and summer came to the Soudan and the month of May. End of chapter 9「10 of the Four Feathers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Ullman. The Four Feathers by A. E. Mason. The Wells of Obak. In the month of May, Durrance lifted his eyes from the Wadi Hatha and began eagerly to look homeward but in the contrary direction, five hundred miles to the south of his frontier town, 
on the other side of the great nubian desert and the belly of stones the events of real importance to him were occurring without his knowledge on the deserted track between berber and suakin the wells of obak are sunk deep amongst mounds of shifting sand eastward the belt of trees divides the dunes from a hard stony plain built with granite hills westward the desert stretches for fifty-eight waterless miles to mahobe and berber on the nile a desert so flat that the merest tuft of grass knee-high seems at the distance of a mile a tree promising shade for a new day halt and a pile of stones no bigger than one might see by the side of any roadway in repair achieves the statue of a considerable hill in this particular may there could be no spot more desolate than the wells of obak the sun blazed upon it from six in the morning with an intolerable heat and all night the wind blew across it piercingly cold and played with the sand as it would building pyramids house high and levelling them tunnelling valleys silting up long slopes so that the face of the country was continually changed the vultures and the stand grouse held it undisturbed in perpetual tenancy and to make the spot yet more desolate there remained scattered here and there the bleached bones and skeletons of camels to bear evidence that about these wells once the caravans had crossed and halted and the remnants of a house built of branches bent in hoops showed that once arabs had herded their goats and made their habitation there now the sun rose and set and the hot sun pressed upon an empty round of honey-coloured earth silence brooded there like night upon the waters and the absolute stillness made it a place of mystery and expectations yet in this month of may one man sojourned by the wells and sojourned secretly every morning at sunrise he drove two camels swift riding mares of the pure bisharin breed from the belt of trees watered them and sat by the well mouth for the space of three hours then he drove them back again into the shelter of the trees and fed them delicately with the horror upon a cloth and for the rest of the day he appeared no more for five mornings he thus came from his hiding place and sat looking towards the sand dunes and berber and no one approached him but on a sixth as he was on the point of returning to his shelter he saw the figures of a man and a donkey suddenly outlined against the sky upon a crest of the sand the arab seated by the well looked first at the donkey and remarking its gray color half rose to his feet but as he rose he looked at the man who drove it and saw that while his jellab was drawn forward over his face to protect it from the sun his bare legs showed of an elderly blackness against the sand the donkey driver was a negro the arab sat down again and waited with an air of the most complete indifference for the stranger to descend to him he did not even move or turn when he heard the negro's feet treading the sand close behind him salam alaikum said the negro as he stopped he carried a long spear and a short one and a shield of hide these he laid upon the ground and sat by the arab's side the arab bowed his head and returned the salutation alaikum es salam said he and he waited it is about fatama asked the negro the arab nodded an assent two days ago the other continued a man of bisharin musa fedil stopped me in the market-place of berber and seeing that i was hungry gave me food and when i had eaten he charged me to drive this donkey to abu fatma at the wells of obak abu fatma looked carelessly at the donkey as though now for the first time he had remarked it taib he said no less carelessly the donkey is mine and he sat inattentive and motionless as though the negro's business was done and he might go the negro however held his ground i am here to meet musa fadil again on the third morning from now in the market-place of berber give me a token which i may carry back so that he may know i have filled the charge and reward me abu fatma took his knife from the small of his back and picked up a stick from the ground notched it thrice at each end this should be a sign to musa fadil and he handed the stick to his companion 
the negro tied it securely into a corner of his wrap loosened his water skin from the donkey's back filled it at the well and slung it about his shoulders then he picked up his spear and his shield abu fatma watched him labor up the slope of loose sand and disappear again on the further incline of the crest then in his turn he rose and hastily when harry feversham had set out from obak six days before to traverse the fifty-eight miles of barren desert to the nile this great donkey had carried his water skins and food abu fatma drove the donkey down amongst the tree and fastening it to a stem examined its shoulders in the left shoulder a tiny incision had been made and the skin neatly stitched up again with fine thread he cut the stitches and pressing open the two edges of the wound forced out a tiny package a little bigger than a potion stand the package was a goat's bladder and enclosed within the bladder was a note written in arabic and folded very small abu fatma had not been gordon's body servant for nothing he had been taught during his service to read he unfolded the note and this is what was written the houses which were once berber are destroyed and a new town of wide streets is building there is no longer any sound by which i may know the ruins of yusuf's house from the ruins of a hundred houses nor does use of any longer sell rock salt in the bazaar yet wait for me another week the arab of bisharim who wrote the letter was harry feversham wearing the patched juba of the dervishes over his stained skin his hair frizzed on the crown of his head and falling upon the nape of his neck in locks matted and gummed into the semblance of seaweed he went about his search for Yusuf through the wide streets of New Berber with its gaping pits. To the south, and separated by a mile or so of desert, lay the old town where Abu Fatma had slept one night and hidden the letters. A warren of ruined houses facing upon narrow alleys and winding streets. The front walls had been pulled down. The roofs carried away. Only the bare inner walls were left standing so that feversham when he wandered amongst them vainly at night seemed to have come into a long lanes of five courts crumbling into delay and each court was only distinguishable from its neighbour by a degree of ruin already the foxes made their burrows beneath the walls he had calculated that one night would have been the term of his stay in berber he was to have crept through the gate in the dusk of evening and before the grey light had quenched the stars his face should be set towards obak now he must go steadily forward amongst the crowds like a man that has business of moment dreading conversation lest his tongue should betray him listening ever for the name of yusuf to strike upon his ears despair kept him company at times and fear always but from the sharp pangs of these emotions a sort of madness was begotten in him a frenzy of obstinacy a belief fanatical as the dark religion of those amongst whom he moved that he could not fail and the world go on that there could be no justice in the whole scheme of the universe great enough to lay his heavy burden upon the one man least fitted to bear it and then callously to destroy him because he tried fear had him in its grip on that morning three days after he had left abu fatma at the wells when coming over a slope he first saw the sand stretched like a lagoon up to the dark brown walls of the town and the overshadowing foliage of the big date palms rising on the nile bank beyond within these walls were the crowded dervishes it was surely the merest madness for a man to imagine that he could escape a detection there even for an hour was it right he began to ask that a man should even try the longer he stood the more insistent did this question grow the low mud walls grew strangely sinister the welcome green of the waving palms after so many arid days of sun and sand and stones became an ironical invitation to death he began to wonder whether he had not already done enough for honor in venturing so near the sun beat upon him his strength ebbed from him as though his veins were open if he were caught he thought as surely he would be oh very surely he saw the fanatical faces crowding fiercely about him 
were not mutilations practiced he looked about him shivering even in the strong heat and the great loneliness of the place smote upon him so that his knees shook he faced about and commenced to run leaping in a panic alone and unpursued across the naked desert under the sun while from his throat feeble cries broke inarticulately he ran however only for a few yards and it was the very violence of his flight which stopped him these four years of anticipation were as nothing then he had schooled himself in the tongue he had lived in the bazaars to no end he was still the caravan he was still the craven who had sent in his papers the quiet confidence with which he had revealed his plan to lieutenant such over the table in the criterion grill room was the mere vainglory of a man who continually deceived himself and ethne he dropped upon the ground and drawing his coat over his head lay a brown spot indistinguishable from the sand about him and the irregularity in the great waste surface of earth he shut the prospects from his eyes and over the thousands of miles of continent and sea he drew ethne's face towards him a little while and he was back again in donegal the summer night whispered through the open doorway in the hall in a room nearby people danced to the music he saw the three feathers fluttering in the door he read the growing trouble in ethne's face if he could do this thing and the still harder thing which he now knew to lie beyond he might perhaps some day see that face cleared of its trouble there were significant words too in his ears i should have no doubt that you and i would see much of one another afterwards towards the setting of the sun he rose from the ground and walking down towards berber passed between the gates End of chapter 10chapter eleven of the four feathers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by gary Ullman. the four feathers by a e w mason durrance hears news of feversham a month later durrance arrived in london and discovered a letter from ethne awaiting him at his club it told him simply that she was staying with mrs adair and would be glad if he would find the time to call but there was a black border to the paper and the envelope durrance called at hill street the next afternoon and found ethne alone i did not write to wadi halfa she explained at once for i thought that you would be on your way home before my letter could arrive my father died last month towards the end of may i was afraid when i got your letter that you would have this to tell me he replied i am very sorry you will miss him more than i can say said she with a quiet depth of feeling he died one morning early i think i will tell you if you would care to hear and she related to him the matter of dermod's death of which a chill was the occasion rather than the cause for he died of gradual dissolution rather than a definite disease it was a curious story which ethne had to tell for it seemed that just before his death dermod recaptured something of his old masterful spirit we knew that he was dying ethne said he knew it too and at seven o'clock of the afternoon after she hesitated for a moment and resumed after he had spoken for a little while to me he called his dog by name the dog sprang at once on to the bed though his voice had not risen above a whisper and crouching quite close pushed its muzzle with a whine under my father's hand then he told me to leave him and the dog altogether alone i was to shut the door upon him the dog would tell me when to open it again i obeyed him and waited outside the door until one o'clock then a loud sudden howl moaned through the house she stopped for a while this pause was the only sign of distress which she gave and in a moment she was on speaking quite simply without any of the affections of grief 
It was trying to wait outside that door while the afternoon faded and the night came. It was night, of course, long before the end. He would have no lamp left in his room. One imagined him just the other side of that thin door panel, lying very still and silent in the great four-poster bed, with his face towards the hills and the light falling. One imagined the room slipping away into darkness and the window continually looming into a great importance, and the dog by his side and no one else. Right to the very end, he would have it that way, but it was rather hard for me. Durant said nothing in reply, but gave her in full measure what she most needed, the sympathy of his silence. He imagined those hours in the passage, six hours of twilight and darkness. He could picture her standing close by the door, with her ear, perhaps to the panel, and a hand upon her heart to check its loud beating. There was something rather cruel, he thought, in Demard's resolve to die alone. It was Ethne who broke the silence. I said that my father spoke to me just before he told me to leave him. Of whom do you think he spoke? She was looking directly at Durrance as she put the question. From neither her eyes nor the level tone of her voice could he gather anything of the answer. But a sudden throb of hope caught away his breath. Tell me, he said, in a sort of suspense, as he leaned forward in his chair. Of Mr. Feversham, she answered, and he drew back again and rather suddenly. It was evident that this was not the name which he had expected. He took his eyes from her and stared downward at the carpet so that she might not see his face. My father was always very fond of him, she continued gently. I think that I would like to know if you have any knowledge of what he is doing or where he is. Durrance did not answer, nor did he raise his face. He reflected upon the strange, strong hold which Harry Feversham kept upon the affections of those who had once known him well, so that even the man whom he had wronged, upon whose daughter he had brought much suffering, must remember him with kindliness upon his deathbed. The reflection was not without its bitterness to Durrance at this moment, and this bitterness he was afraid that his face and voice might both betray, but he was compelled to speak, for Ethne insisted. You have never come across him, I suppose, she asked. Durrance rose from his seat and walked to the window before he answered. He spoke looking out into the street. But though he thus concealed the expression of his face, a thrill of deep anger sounded through his words, in spite of his efforts to subdue his tones. No, he said, I never have. And suddenly his anger had its way with him. It chose as well as informed his words. And I never wished to, he cried. He was my friend, I know. But I cannot remember that friendship now. I can only think that if he had been the true man we took him for he would not have waited alone in that dark passage during those six hours he turned again to the centre of the room and asked abruptly you are going back to glenola yes you will live there alone yes for a little while there was silence between them then durrance walked round to the back of her chair you once said that you would perhaps tell me why your engagement was broken off but you know, she said, what you said at the window showed that you knew. No, I do not. One or two words your father let drop. He asked me for news of Feversham the last time that I spoke with him, but I know nothing definite. I should like you to tell me. Ethne shook her head and leaned forward with her elbows on her knees. Not now, she said, and silence again followed her words. Durrance broke it again. I have only one more year at Halfa. It would be wise to leave Egypt then, I think. I do not expect much will be done in the Sudan for some little while. I do not think that I will stay there in any case. I mean, even if you should decide to remain alone at Glenola. Ethne made no pretense to ignore the suggestion of his words. We are neither of us children, she said. You have all your life to think of. We should be prudent. Yes, said Durrance with a sudden exasperation. But the right kind of prudence, the prudence which knows that it's worthwhile to dare a good deal, 
ethne did not move she was leaning forward with her back towards him so that he could see nothing of her face and for a long while she remained in this attitude quite silent and very still she asked the question at last and in a very low and gentle voice do you want me so very much and before he could answer she turned quickly towards him try not to she exclaimed earnestly for this one year try not to you have much to occupy your thoughts try to forget me altogether and there was just sufficient regret in her tone the regret at the prospect of losing a valued friend to take all the sting from her words to confirm durrance in his delusion that but for her fear that she would spoil his career she would answer him in very different words mrs adair came into the room before he could reply and thus he carried away with him his delusion he dined that evening at his club and sat afterwards smoking a cigar under the big tree where he sat so persistently a year before in his vain quest for news of harry feversham it was much the same sort of clear night as that on which he had seen lieutenant such limp into the courtyard and hesitate at the sight of him the strip of sky was cloudless and starry overhead the air had the pleasant languor of a summer night in june the lights flashing from the windows and doorways gave to the leaves of the trees the fresh green look of spring and outside in the roadway the carriages rolled with a thunderous hum like the sound of the sea and on this night too there came a man into the courtyard who knew durrance but he did not hesitate he came straight up to durrance and sat down upon the seat at his side durrance dropped the paper at which he was glancing and held out his hand how do you do said he the friend was captain mather i was wondering whether i should meet you when i read the evening paper i knew that it was about the time one might expect to find you in london you have seen i suppose what asked durrance then you haven't replied mather he picked up the newspaper which durrance had dropped and turned over the sheets searching for the piece of news which he required you remember that last reconnaissance we made from suakin very well we halted by the sinkat port at midday there was an arab hiding in the trees at the back of the glacis yes have you forgotten the yarn he told you about gordon's letters and the wall of a house in berber no i had not forgotten then there's something which will interest you said captain mather having folded the paper to his satisfaction handed it to durrance and pointed to a paragraph it was a short paragraph it gave no details it was the merest summary and durrance read it through between the puffs of his cigar the fellow must have gone back to berber after all said he a risky business abu fatma that was the man's name the paragraph made no mention of abu fatma or indeed of any man except captain willoughby the deputy governor of suakin it merely announced that certain letters which the mahdi had sent to gordon summoning him to surrender khartoum and inviting him to be a convert to the modest religion together with copy of gordon's curt replies have been recovered from a wall in berber and brought safely to captain willoughby at suakin they were hardly worth risking a life for said mather perhaps not replied durrance a little doubtfully but after all one is glad they have been recovered perhaps the copies are in gordon's own hand they are at all events of an historic interest in a way no doubt said mather but even so their recovery throws no light upon the history of the siege it can make no real difference to anyone not even to the historian that is true durrance agreed and there was nothing more untrue in the same spot where he had sought for news of feversham news had now come to him only he did not know he was in the dark he could not appreciate that here was news which however little it might trouble the historian touched his life at the springs he dismissed the paragraph from his mind and sat thinking over the conversation which had passed that afternoon between ethne and himself and without discouragement ethne had mentioned 
harry feversham it was true had asked for news of him but she might have been nay she probably had been moved to ask because her father's last words had referred to him she had spoken his name in a perfectly steady voice he remembered and indeed the mere fact that she had spoken it at all might be taken as a sign that it had no longer any power with her there was something hopeful to his mind in her very request that he should try during this one year to admit her from her thoughts for it seemed almost to imply that if he could not she might at the end of it perhaps give to him the answer for which he longed he allowed a few days to pass then called again at mrs adair's house but he found only mrs adair ethne had left london and returned to donegal she had left rather suddenly mrs adair told him and mrs adair had no sure knowledge of the reason of her going durance however had no doubt as to the reason ethne was putting into practice the policy which she had commended to his thoughts he was to try to forget her and she would help him to success so far as she could by her absence from his sight and in attributing this reason to her durrance was right but one thing ethne had forgotten she had not asked him to cease to write to her and accordingly in the autumn of that year the letters began again to come from the sudan she was frankly glad to receive them but at the same time she was troubled for in spite of their careful reticence every now and then a phrase leaped out it might be merely the repetition of some trivial sentence which she had spoken long ago and long ago forgotten and she could not but see that in spite of her prayer she lived perpetually in his thoughts there was a strain of hopefulness too as though he moved in a world painted with new colors and suddenly grown musical ethne had never freed herself from the haunting fear that one man's life had been spoilt because of her she had never faltered from her determination that this should not happen with a second only with durrance's letter before her she could not evade a new and perplexing question by what means was that possibility to be avoided there were two ways by choosing which of them could she fulfil her determination she was no longer so sure as she had been the year before that his career was all in all the question recurred to her again and again she took it out with her on the hillside with the letters and pondered and puzzled over it and got never an inch nearer to a solution even a violin failed her in this strait. End of chapter 11。Chapter 12 of the Four Feathers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wolf. The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason. Chapter 12 Durrance Sharpens His Wits. It was a night of May, and outside the mess room at Wadi Halfa, three officers were smoking on a grass knoll above the Nile. The moon was at its full, and the strong light had robbed even the planets of their lustres. The smaller stars were not visible at all, and the sky washed of its dark color curved overhead, pearly-hued and luminous. The three officers sat in their lounge chairs and smoked silently, while the bullfrogs croaked from an island in mid-river. At the bottom of the small, steep cliff on which they sat, the Nile, so sluggish was its flow, shone like a burnished mirror, and from the opposite bank the desert stretched away to infinite distances. A vast plain with scattered hummocks, a plain white as a hoar frost on the surface of which the stones sparkled like jewels. Behind the three officers of the garrison, the roof of the mess room veranda threw a shadow on the ground. It seemed a solid piece of blackness. One of the three officers struck a match and held it to the end of his cigar. The flame lit up a troubled and anxious face. I hope that no harm has come to him, he said as he threw the match away. 
I wish that I could say I believed it. The speaker was a man of middle age, and the colonel of a Sudanese battalion. He was answered by a man whose hair had gone gray, it is true, but gray hair is frequent in the Sudan, and his unlined face still showed that he was young. He was Lieutenant Calder of the Engineers. Youth, however, in this instance, had no optimism wherewith to challenge Colonel Dawson. He left Halfa eight weeks ago, eh? he said gloomily. Eight weeks today, replied the colonel. It was the third officer, a tall, spare, long-necked major of the Army Service Corps, who alone hazarded a cheerful prophecy. It's early days to conclude Durrance has got scuppered, said he. One knows Durrance. Give him a campfire in the desert and a couple of sheiks to sit round it with him, and he'll buck to them for a month and never feel bored at the end. While here there are letters, and there's an office, and there's a desk in the office, and everything he loathes and can't do with. You'll see Durrance will turn up right enough, though he won't hurry about it. He is three weeks overdue, objected the colonel, and he's methodical after a fashion, I'm afraid. Major Walters pointed out his arm to the white, empty desert across the river. If he had traveled that way, westward, I might agree, he said. But Durrance went east through the mountain country toward Berenice and the Red Sea. The tribes he went to visit were quiet, even in the worst times, when Osman Digna lay before Sokhien. The colonel, however, took no comfort from Walter's confidence. He tugged at his mustache and repeated, He is three weeks overdue. Lieutenant Calder knocked the ashes from his pipe and refilled it. He leaned forward in his chair as he pressed the tobacco down with his thumb, and he said slowly, I wonder. It is just possible that some sort of trap was laid for Durrance. I am not sure. I never mentioned before what I knew, because until lately I did not suspect that it could have anything to do with his delay. But now I begin to wonder. You remember the night before he started? Yes, said Dawson, and he hitched his chair a little nearer. Calder was the one man in Wadi Halfa who could claim something like intimacy with Durrance. Despite their difference in rank, there was no great disparity in the age between the two men. And from the first, when Calder had come inexperienced and fresh from England, but with a great ardor to acquire comprehensive experience, Durrance, in his recitant way, had been at pains to show the newcomer considerable friendship. Calder, therefore, might be likely to know. I too remember that night, said Walters. Durrance dined at the mess and went away early to prepare for his journey. His preparations were made already, said Calter. He went away early, as you say, but he did not go to his quarters. He walked along the river bank to Tufakay. Wadi Halfa was the military station. Tufakay, a little frontier town to the north, separated from Halfa by a mile of river bank. A few Greeks kept stores there. A few bare and dirty cafes faced the street between native cook shops and tobacconists, a noisy little town where the negro from the Dinka country jolted the fellow from the delta, and the air was torn with many dialects, a thronged little town, which yet lacked to European ears one distinctive element of a throng. There was no ring of footsteps. The crowd walked on sand, and for the most part with naked feet so that if for a rare moment the sharp high cries and the perpetual voices ceased, the figures of men and women flitted by noiseless as ghosts. And even at night, when the streets were most crowded and the uproar loudest, it seemed that underneath the noise, and almost appreciable to the ear, there lay a deep and brooding silence, the silence of deserts and the east. Durrance went down to Tufakay at ten o'clock that night, said Calder. I went to his quarters at eleven. He had not returned. He was starting eastward at four in the morning, and there was some detail of business on which I wished to speak to him before he went. So I waited for his return. He came in about a quarter of an hour afterwards and told me at once I must be quick, since he was expecting a visitor. He spoke quickly and rather restlessly. He seemed to be laboring under some excitement. He barely listened to what I had to say, and he answered me at random was quite evident that he was moved, and rather deeply moved, by some unusual feeling, though at the nature of the feeling I could not guess, for at one moment it seemed certainly to be anger, 
and the next moment he relaxed into a laugh, as though in spite of himself he was glad. However, he bundled me out, and as I went, I heard him telling his servant to go to bed, because, though he expected a visitor, he would admit the visitor himself. Well, said Dawson, and who was the visitor? I do not know, answered Calder. The one thing I do know is that when Durance's servant went to call him at four o'clock for his journey, he found Durance still sitting on the veranda outside his quarters, as though he still expected his visitor. The visitor had not come. And Durance left no message? No. I was up myself before he started. I thought that he was puzzled and worried. I thought, too, that he meant to tell me what was the matter. I still think that he had that in his mind, but that he could not decide. For even as he had taken his seat upon his saddle and his camel had risen from the ground, he turned and looked down towards me. But he thought better of it, or worse, as the case may be. At all events, he did not speak. He struck the camel on the flank with his stick, and rode slowly past the post office and out into the desert, with his head sunk upon his breast. I wonder whether he rode into a trap. Who could this visitor have been whom he meets in the street of Tufake, and who must come so secretly to Wadi Halfa? What could have been his business with Durance? Important business, troublesome business. So much is evident. And he did not come to transact it. Was the whole thing a lure to which we have not the clue? Like Colonel Dawson, I am afraid. There was a silence after he had finished, which Major Walters was the first to break. He offered no argument. He simply expressed his unalterable cheerfulness. I don't think Durance has got scuppered, said he, as he rose from his chair. I know what I shall do, said the colonel. I shall send out a strong search party in the morning. And the next morning, as they sat at breakfast on the veranda, he at once proceeded to describe the force which he meant to dispatch. Major Waters, too, it seemed, in spite of his hopeful prophecies, had pondered during the night over Calder's story, and he leaned across the table to Calder. Did you ever inquire whom Durance talked with at Tufake on that night? he asked. I did, and there's a point that puzzles me, said Calder. He was sitting with his back to the Nile and his face toward the glass doors of the mess room, and he spoke to Walters, who was directly opposite. I could not find that he talked to more than one person, and that one person could not by any likelihood have been the visitor he expected. Durant stopped in front of a cafe where some strolling musicians, who had somehow wandered up to Tufake, were playing and singing for their night's lodging. One of them, a Greek, I was told, came outside into the street and took his hat round. Durance threw a sovereign into the hat. The man turned to thank him, and they talked for a little time together. And as he came to this point, he raised his head. A look of recognition came into his face. He laid his hands upon the table ledge and leaned forward with his feet drawn back beneath his chair as though he was on the point of springing up. But he did not spring up. His look of recognition became one of bewilderment. He glanced round the table and saw that Colonel Dawson was helping himself to cocoa, while Major Walter's eyes were on his plate. There were other officers of the garrison present, but not one had remarked his movement and its sudden arrest. Calder leaned back, and staring curiously in front of him and over the Major's shoulder, continued his story. But I can never hear that Durant spoke to anyone else. He seemed, except that one knows to the contrary, merely to have strolled through the village and back again to Wadi Halfa. That doesn't help us much, said the Major. And it's all you know? asked the Colonel. No, not quite all, returned Calder, slowly. I know, for instance, that the man we are talking about is staring me straight in the face. At once, everyone at the table turned toward the mess room. Durance, cried the Colonel, springing up. When did you get back, said the Major. Durance, with the dust of his journey still powdered upon his clothes and a face burnt to the color of red brick, was standing in the doorway and listening with a remarkable intentness to the voices of his fellow officers. It was perhaps noticeable that Calder, who was Durance's friend, neither rose from his chair nor offered any greeting. He still sat watching Durance. He still remained curious and perplexed. But as Durance descended the three steps into the veranda, there came a quick and troubled look of comprehension into his face. "'We expected you three weeks ago,' said Dawson, as he pulled a chair away from an empty place at the table. 
The delay could not be helped, replied Durrance. He took the chair and drew it up. Does my story account for it? asked Calder. Not a bit. It was the Greek musician I expected that night, he explained with a laugh. I was curious to know what stroke of ill luck had cast him out to play the zither for a night's lodging in a cafe at Tufiquet. That was all. And he added slowly, in a softer voice, yes, that was all. Meanwhile, you are forgetting your breakfast, said Dawson, as he rose. What will you have? Calder leaned ever so slightly forward with his eyes, quietly resting on Durrance. Durrance looked round the table, then called the mess waiter. Mosa, get me something cold, said he, and the waiter went back into the mess room. Calder nodded his head with a faint smile, as though he understood that here was a difficulty rather cleverly surmounted. There's tea, coca, and coffee, he said. Help yourself, Durrance. Thanks, said Durrance. I see but I will get Mosa to bring me a brandy and soda, I think. And again, Calder nodded his head. Durrance ate his breakfast and drank his brandy and soda and talked the while of his journey. He had traveled further eastward than he had intended. He had found the Abaday Arabs quiet amongst their mountains. If they were not disposed to acknowledge allegiance to Egypt, on the other hand, they paid no tribute to Mohammed Achmet. The weather had been good ibex and antelope plentiful durance on the whole had reason to be content with his journey and calder sat and watched him and disbelieved every word that he said the other officers went about their duties calder remained behind and waited until durance should finish but it seemed that durance never would finish he loitered over his breakfast and when that was done he pushed his plate away and sat talking there was no end to his questions as to what had passed at Wadi Halfa during the last eight weeks, no limit to his enthusiasm over the journey from which he had just returned. Finally, however, he stopped with a remarkable abruptness and said with some suspicion to his companion, You are taking life easily this morning. I have not had eight weeks of rears of letters to clear off as you have, Colonel. Calder returned with a laugh, and he saw Durrance's face cloud and his forehead contract. True, he said, after a pause. I had forgotten my letters. And he rose from his seat at the table, mounted the steps, and passed into the mess room. Calder immediately sprang up, and with his eyes followed Durrance's movements. Durrance went to a nail which was fixed in the wall close to the glass doors and on a level with his head. From that nail he took down the key of his office, crossed the room, and went out through the farther door. That door he left open and Calder could see him walk down the path between the bushes through the tiny garden in front of the mess, unlatch the gate, and cross the open space of sand toward his office. As soon as Durrance had disappeared, Calder sat down again, and resting his elbows on the table, propped his face between his hands. Calder was troubled. He was a friend of Durrance. He was the one man in Wadi Halfa who possessed something of Durrance's confidence. He knew that there were certain letters in a woman's handwriting waiting for him in his office. He was very deeply troubled. Durrance had aged during these eight weeks. There were furrows about his mouth where only faint lines had been visible when he started out from Halfa, and it was not merely desert dust which had discolored his hair. His hilarity, too, had an artificial air. He had sat at the table constraining himself to the semblance of high spirits. Calder lit his pipe and sat for a long while by the empty table. Then he took his helmet and crossed the sand to Durrance's office. He lifted the latch noiselessly. As noiselessly, he opened the door, and he looked in. Durrance was sitting at his desk with his head bowed upon his arms, and all his letters unopened at his side. Calder stepped into the room and closed the door loudly behind him. At once, Durrance turned his face to the door. Well, said he, I have a paper, Colonel, which requires your signature, said Calder. It's the authority for the alterations in C. Barracks, you remember? Very well. I will look through it and return it to you signed at lunchtime. Will you give it to me, please? He held out his hand toward Calder. Calder took his pipe from his mouth and, standing thus in full view of Durrance, slowly and deliberately placed it into Durrance's outstretched palm. It was not until the hot bowl burnt his hand that Durrance snatched his arm away. The pipe fell and broke upon the floor. Neither of the two men spoke for a few moments, and then Calder put his arm around Durrance's shoulder and asked in a voice gentle as a woman's, How did it happen? Durrance buried his face in his hands. 
the great control which he had exercised till now he was no longer able to sustain he did not answer nor did he utter any sound but he sat shivering from head to foot how did it happen calder asked again and in a whisper durance put another question how did you find out you stood in the mess-room doorway listening to discover whose voice spoke from where when i raised my head and saw you though your eyes rested on my face there was no recognition in them i suspected then when you came down the steps into the veranda i became almost certain when you would not help yourself to food when you reached out your arm over your shoulder so that musa had to put the brandy and soda safely into your palm i was sure i was a fool to try and hide it said durrance course i knew all the time that i couldn't for more than a few hours but even those few hours somehow seemed to gain how did it happen there was a high wind durrance explained took my helmet off it was eight o'clock in the morning i did not mean to move my camp that day and i was standing outside my tent in my shirt sleeves so you see that i had not even the collar of a coat to protect the nape of my neck i was fool enough to run after my helmet and you must have seen the same thing happen a hundred times each time that i stooped to pick it up it skipped away each time that i ran after it it stopped and waited for me to catch it up and before one was aware what one was doing one had run a quarter of a mile i went down i was told like a log just when i had the helmet in my hand how long ago it happened i don't quite know for i was ill for a time and afterwards it was difficult to keep count since one couldn't tell the difference between day and night durrance in a word had gone blind he told the rest of his story he had bidden his followers carry him back to berber and then influenced by the natural wish to hide his calamity as long as he could he had enjoined upon them silence calder heard the story through to the end and then rose at once to his feet there's a doctor he is clever and for a syrian knows a good deal I will fetch him here privately, and we will hear what he says. Your blindness may be merely temporary. The Syrian doctor, however, pursed up his lips and shook his head. He advised an immediate departure to Cairo. It was a case for a specialist. He himself would hesitate to pronounce an opinion, though, to be sure, there was always hope of a cure. Have you ever suffered an injury in the head? he asked. Were you ever thrown from your horse? Were you wounded? No, said Durrance. The Syrian did not disguise his conviction that the case was grave, and after he had departed both men were silent for some time. Calder had a feeling that any attempt in consolation would be futile in itself, and might, moreover, in betraying his own fear that the hurt was irreparable, only discourage his companion. He turned to the pile of letters and looked them through. "'There are two letters here, Durrance,' he said gently, "'which you might perhaps care to hear.' They are written in a woman's hand, and there is an Irish postmark. Shall I open them? No, exclaimed the Durrance, suddenly, and his hand dropped quickly upon Calder's arm. By no means. Calder, however, did not put down the letters. He was anxious, for private reasons of his own, to learn something more of Ethne Eustace than the outside of her letters could reveal. A few rare references made in unusual moments of confidence by Durrance had only informed Calder of her name, and assured him that his friend would be very glad to change it if he could. He looked at Durrance, a man so trained to vigor and activity that his very sunburn seemed an essential quality rather than an accident of the country in which he lived, a man, too, who came to the wild, uncitied places of the world with the joy of one who comes into an inheritance, a man to whom those desolate tracks were home, and the fireside and the hedged fields and made roads merely the other places, and he understood the magnitude of the calamity which had befallen him. Therefore he was most anxious to know more of this girl who wrote to Durrance from Donegal, and to gather from her letters, as from a mirror in which her image was reflected, some speculation as to her character. For if she failed, what had this friend of his any longer left? "'You would like to hear them, I expect,' he insisted. "'You have been away eight weeks.' and he was interrupted by a harsh laugh. "'Do you know what I was thinking when I stopped you?' said Durrance. "'Why, that I would read the letters after you had gone. It takes time to get used to being blind after your eyes have served you pretty well all of your life. 
and his voice shook ever so little. You will have to help me to answer them, Calder, so read them. Please read them. Calder tore open the envelopes and read the letters through and was satisfied. They gave a record of the simple doings of her mountain village in Donegal and in the simplest terms. But the girl's nature shone out in her telling. Her love of the countryside and of the people who dwelt there was manifest. She could see the humor and the tragedy of the small village troubles. There was a warm friendliness for Durance moreover expressed, not so much in a sentence as in the whole spirit of the letters. It was evident that she was most keenly interested in all that he did, that in a way she looked upon his career as a thing in which she had a share, even if it was only a friend's share. And when Calder had ended, he looked again at Durance, but now with a face of relief. It seemed, too, that Durance was relieved. After all, one has something to be thankful for, he cried. Think, suppose that I had been engaged to her. She would never have allowed me to break it off once I had gone blind. What an escape! An escape, exclaimed Calder. You don't understand, but I knew a man who went blind. A good fellow, too, before, mind that, before. But a year after, you couldn't have recognized him. He had narrowed down into the most selfish, exacting, egotistical creature it is possible to imagine. I don't wonder. I hardly see how he could help it. I don't blame him, but it wouldn't make life easier for a wife, would it? A helpless husband who can't cross a road without his wife at his elbow is bad enough, but make him a selfish beast in the bargain, full of questions, jealous of her power to go where she will, curious as to every person with whom she speaks. And what then? My God, I am glad that girl refused me. For that I am most grateful. She refused you? asked Calder, and the relief passed from his face and voice. Twice, said Durrance. What an escape! You see, Calder, I shall be more trouble even than the man I told you of. I am not clever. I can't sit in a chair and amuse myself by thinking, not having any intellect to buck about. I have lived out of doors and hard and that's the only sort of life that suits me. I tell you, Calder, you won't be very anxious for much of my society in a year's time. And he laughed again, and with the same harshness. Oh, stop that, said Calder. I will read the rest of your letters to you. He read them, however, without much attention to their contents. His mind was occupied with the two letters from Ethne Eustace, and he was wondering whether there was any deeper emotion than mere friendship hidden beneath the words. Girls refused men for all sorts of queer reasons which had no sense in them, and very often they were sick and sorry about it afterwards, and very often they meant to accept the men all the time. I must answer the letters from Ireland, said Durrance, when he had finished. The rest can wait. Calder held a sheet of paper upon the desk and told Durrance when he was writing on a slant and when he was writing on the blotting pad, and in this way, Durrance wrote to tell Ethne that a sunstroke had deprived him of his sight. Calder took that letter away, but he took it to the hospital and asked for the Syrian doctor. The doctor came out to him, and they walked together under the trees in front of the building. "'Tell me the truth,' said Calder. The doctor blinked behind his spectacles. "'The optic nerve is, I think, destroyed,' he replied. "'Then there is no hope? None, if my diagnosis is correct.' Calder turned the letter over and over, as though he could not make up his mind what in the world to do with it. Can a sunstroke destroy the optic nerve? He asked at length. A mere sunstroke? No, replied the doctor. But it may be the occasion. For the cause, one must look deeper. Calder came to a stop, and there was a look of horror in his eyes. You mean one must look to the brain? Yes. They walked on for a few paces. A further question was in Calder's mind but he had some difficulty in speaking it, and when he had spoken, he waited for the answer in suspense. Then this calamity is not all. There will be more to follow. Death, or... But that other alternative he could not bring himself to utter. Here, however, the doctor was able to reassure him. No, that does not follow. Calder went back to the mess room and called for a brandy and soda. He was more disturbed by the blow which had fallen upon Durance than he would have cared to own and he put the letter upon the table and thought of the message of renunciation which it contained, and he could hardly restrain his fingers from tearing it across. It must be sent, he knew, 
his, its destruction would be of no more than a temporary avail, yet he could hardly bring himself to post it. With the passage of every minute, he realized more clearly what blindness meant to Durance. A man not very clever, as he himself was ever the first to acknowledge, and always the inheritor of the other places. How much more it meant to him than to the ordinary run of men. Would the girl, he wondered, understand as clearly? It was very silent that morning on the veranda at Wadi Halfa. The sunlight blazed upon desert and river. Not a breath of wind stirred the foliage of any bush. Calder drank his brandy and soda, and slowly that question forced itself more and more into the front of his mind. Would the woman over in Ireland understand? He rose from his chair as he heard Colonel Dawson's voice in the mess room, and taking up his letter walked away to the post office. Durance's letter was dispatched, but somewhere in the Mediterranean it crossed a letter from Ethne, which Durance received a fortnight later at Cairo. It was read out to him by Calder, who had obtained leave to come down from Wadi Halfa with his friend. Ethne wrote that she had, during the last months, considered all that he had said when at Glenella and in London. She had read, too, his letters, and understood that in his thoughts of her there had been no change, and that there would be none. She therefore went back upon her old argument that she would, by marriage, be doing him an injury, and she would marry him upon his return to England. "'That's rough luck, isn't it?' said Durrance, when Calder had read the letter through. "'For here's the one thing I have always wished for, and it comes when I can no longer take it. "'I think you will find it very difficult to refuse to take it,' said Calder. "'I do not know, Miss Eustace, but I can hazard a guess from the letters of hers which I have read to you. "'I do not think that she is a woman who will say yes one day, and then because bad times come to you say no the next.' or allow you to say no for her either. I have a sort of notion that since she cares for you, and you for her, you are doing little less than insulting her if you imagine that she cannot marry you and still be happy. Durrance thought over that aspect of the question and began to wonder. Calder might be right. Marriage with a blind man. It might, perhaps, be possible if upon both sides there was love. And the letter from Ethne proved, did it not? that on both sides there was love. Besides, there was some trivial compensations which might help to make her sacrifice less burdensome. She could still live in her own country and move in her own home, for the linen house could be rebuilt and the estates cleared of their debt. Besides, said Calder, there is always a possibility of a cure. There is no such possibility, said Durrance, with a decision which quite startled his companion. You know that as well as I do. And he added with a laugh, You needn't start so guiltily. I haven't overheard a word of any of your conversations about me. Then what in the world makes you think that there's no chance? The voice of every doctor who has encouraged me to hope. Their words, yes, their words, tell me to visit specialists in Europe and not lose heart. But their voices give the lie to their words. If one cannot see, one can at all events hear. Calder looked thoughtfully at his friend. This was not the only occasion on which of late Durrance had surprised his friends by an unusual acuteness. Calder glanced uncomfortably at the letter which he was still holding in his hand. When was that letter written, said Durrance, suddenly, and immediately upon the question he asked another, what makes you jump? Calder laughed and explained hastily, why well, I was looking at the letter the moment when you asked and your question came so pat that I could hardly believe you did not see what I was doing. It was written on the 15th of May. Ah, said Durrance, the day I returned to Wadi Halfa blind. Calder sat in his chair without a movement. He gazed anxiously at his companion. It seemed almost as though he were afraid. His attitude was one of suspense. That's a queer coincidence, said Durrance with a careless laugh and Calder had an intuition that he was listening with the utmost intentness for some movement on his own part, perhaps a relaxation of his attitude, perhaps a breath of relief. Calder did not move, however, and he drew no breath of relief. End of chapter 12 Recording by David Wolfe
Chapter 13 of The Four Feathers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wolfe The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason Chapter 13 Durance Begins to See Ethne stood at the drawing-room window of the house in Hill Street. Mrs. Adair sat in front of her tea-table. Both women were waiting, and they were both listening for some particular sound to rise up from the street and penetrate into the room. The window stood open that they might hear it the more quickly. It was half-past five in the afternoon. June had come round with the exhilaration of its sunlight and London had sparkled into a city of pleasure and green trees. In the houses opposite, the windows were gay with flowers, and in the street below, the carriages rolled easily towards the park. A jingle of bells rose upward suddenly and grew loud. Mrs. Adair raised her head quickly. "'That's a cab,' she said. "'Yes.' Ethne leaned forward and looked down. "'But it's not stopping here.' And the jingle grew fainter and died away. Mrs. Adair looked at the clock. Colonel Durrance is late, she said, and she turned curiously towards Ethne. It seemed to her that Ethne had spoken her yes with much more of suspense than eagerness. Her attitude as she leaned forward at the window had been almost one of apprehension, and though Mrs. Adair was not quite sure, she fancied that she detected relief when the cab passed by the house and did not stop. I wonder why you didn't go to the station and meet Colonel Durrance, she asked slowly. The answer came promptly enough. He might have thought that I had come because I looked upon him as rather helpless, and I didn't wish him to think that. He has a servant with him. Ethne looked again out of the window, and once or twice she made a movement as if she was about to speak and then thought silence the better part. Finally, however, she made up her mind. You remember the telegram I showed to you? From Lieutenant Calder, saying that Colonel Durrance had gone blind? Yes. I want you to promise never to mention it. I don't want him to know that I ever received it. Mrs. Adair was puzzled, and she hated to be puzzled. She had been shown the telegram, but she had not been told that Ethne had written to Durrance, pledging herself to him immediately upon its receipt. Ethne, when she showed the telegram, had merely said, I am engaged to him. Mrs. Adair at once believed that the engagement had been of some standing, and she had been allowed to continue in that belief. "'Will you promise?' Ethne insisted. "'Certainly, my dear, if you like,' returned Mrs. Adair, with an ungracious shrug of the shoulders. "'But there is a reason, I suppose. I don't understand why you exact the promise. Two lives must not be spoilt because of me.' There was some ground for Mrs. Adair's suspicion that Ethne expected the blind man to whom she was betrothed with apprehension. It is true that she was a little afraid. Just twelve months had passed since, in this very room, on such a sunlit afternoon. Ethne had bidden Durrance not to forget her, and each letter which she had received had shown that, whether he tried or not, he had not forgotten. Even that last one received three weeks ago, the note scrawled in the handwriting of a child, from Wadi Halfa, with the large, unsteady words straggling unevenly across the page, and the letters running into one another wherein he had told his calamity and renounced his suit, even that proved, and perhaps more surely than its hopeful forerunners, that he had not forgotten. As she waited at the window, she understood very clearly that it was she herself who must buckle to the hard work of forgetting, or if that was impossible, she must be careful always that by no word let slip in a forgetful moment she betrayed that she had not forgotten. No, she said, two lives shall not be spoilt because of me. And she turned toward Mrs. Adair. Are you quite sure, Ethne, said Mrs. Adair, that the two lives will not be more surely spoilt by this way of yours, the way of marriage? Don't you think that you will come to feel Colonel Durrance, in spite of your will, something of a hindrance and a drag? Isn't it possible that he may come to feel that too? I wonder. I very much wonder. No, said Ethne, decisively. I shall not feel it, and he must not. 
The two lives, according to Mrs. Adair, were not the lives of Durrance and Harry Faversham, but of Durrance and Ethne herself. There she was wrong, but Ethne did not dispute the point. She was indeed rather glad that her friend was wrong, and she allowed her to continue in her wrong belief. Ethne resumed her watch at the window, foreseeing her life, planning it out so that never might she be caught off her guard. The task would be difficult, no doubt, and it was no wonder that in these minutes while she waited fear grew upon her lest she should fail. But the end was well worth the effort, and she set her eyes upon that. Durrance had lost everything which made life to him worth living the moment he went blind. Everything except one thing. What should I do if I were crippled? He had said to Harry Faversham on the morning when, for the last time, they had ridden together in the row. A clever man might put up with it. But what should I do if I had to sit in a chair all my days? Ethne had not heard the words, but she understood the man well enough without them. He was by birth the inheritor of other places, and he had lost his heritage. The things which delighted him, the long journeys, the faces of strange countries, the campfire, a mere spark of red light amidst black and empty silence, the hours of sleep in the open under bright stars, the cool night wind of the desert, and the work of government, all these things he had lost. Only one thing remained to him, herself and only, as she knew very well, herself so long as he could believe she wanted him. And while she was still occupied with her resolve, the cab for which she waited stopped unnoticed at the door. It wasn't until Durrance's servant had actually rung the bell that her attention was again attracted to the street. "'He has come,' she said with a start. Durrance, it was true, was not particularly acute. He had never been inquisitive. He took his friends as he found them. He put them under no microscope. It would have been easy at any time, Ethne reflected, to quiet his suspicions, should he have ever come to entertain any. But now it would be easier than ever. There was no reason for apprehension. Thus she argued, but in spite of the argument she rather nerved herself to an encounter than went forward to welcome her betrothed. Mrs. Adair slipped out of the room, so that Ethne was alone when Durrance entered at the door. She did not move immediately. She retained her attitude and position, expecting that the change in him would for the first moment shock her. But she was surprised, for the particular changes which she had expected were noticeable only through their absence. His face was worn, no doubt. His hair had gone gray, but there was no air of helplessness or uncertainty and it was that which for his own sake she most dreaded. He walked forward into the room as though his eyes saw. His memory seemed to tell him exactly where each piece of the furniture stood. The most that he did was once or twice to put out a hand where he expected a chair. Ethne drew silently back into the window, rather at a loss with what words to greet him, and immediately he smiled and came straight towards her. Ethne, he said, it isn't true, then, she exclaimed. You have recovered. The words were forced from her by the readiness of his movement. It is quite true, and I have not recovered, he answered. But you moved at the window, and so I knew that you were there. How did you know? I made no noise. No, but the windows open. The noise in the street became suddenly louder, so I knew that someone in front of the window had moved aside. I guessed that it was you. Their words were thus not perhaps the most customary greeting between a couple meeting on the first occasion after they had become engaged, but they served to hinder embarrassment. Ethne shrank from any perfunctory expression of regret, knowing that there was no need for it, and Durrance had no wish to hear it. For there were many things through which these two understood each other well enough to take as said. They did no more than shake hands when they had spoken and Ethne moved back into the room. "'I will give you some tea,' she said. "'Then we can talk.' "'Yes, we must have a talk, mustn't we?' Durrance answered seriously. He threw off his serious air, however, and chatted with good humor about the details of his journey home. He even found a subject of amusement in his sense of helplessness during the first days of his blindness, 
and Ethne's apprehensions rapidly diminished. They had indeed almost vanished from her mind when something in his attitude suddenly brought them back. I wrote to you from Wadi Halfa, he said. I don't know whether you could read the letter. Quite well, said Ethne. I got a friend of mine to hold the paper and tell me when I was writing on it or merely on the blotting pad, he continued with a laugh. Calder of the Sappers. But you don't know him. He shot the name out rather quickly, and it came upon Ethne with a shock that he had set a trap to catch her. The curious stillness of his face seemed to tell her that he was listening with an extreme intentness for some start, perhaps even a checked exclamation, which would betray that she knew something of Calder of the Soppers. Did he suspect? she asked herself. Did he know of the telegram? Did he guess that her letter was sent out of pity? She looked into Durrance's face and it told her nothing except that it was very alert. In the old days, a year ago, the expression of his eyes would have answered her quite certainly, however close he held his tongue. I could read the letter without difficulty, she answered gently. It was the letter you would have written, but I had written to you before, and of course your bad news could make no difference. I take back no word of what I wrote. Durrance sat with his hands upon his knees leaning forward a little. Again Ethne was at a loss. She could not tell from his manner or his face whether he accepted or questioned her answer, and again she realized that a year ago, while he had his sight, she would have been in no doubt. Yes, I know you. You would take nothing back, he said at length. But there is my point of view. Ethne looked at him with apprehension. Yes, she replied and she strove to speak with unconcern. Will you tell me it? Durrance assented, and began in the deliberate voice of a man who has thought out his subject, knows it by heart, and has decided, moreover, the order of words by which it will be most lucidly developed. I know what blindness means to all men, a growing, narrowing egotism unless one is perpetually on one's guard. And will one be perpetually on one's guard? Blindness means that to all men, he repeated emphatically. But it must mean more to me, who am deprived of every occupation. If I were a writer, I could still dictate. If I were a businessman, I could conduct my business. But I am a soldier, and not a clever soldier. Jealousy, a continual and irritable curiosity. There is no Paul Pry like your blind man a querulous claim against your attention. These are my special dangers. And Ethne laughed gently in contradiction of his argument. Well, perhaps one may hold them off, he acknowledged. But they are to be considered. I have considered them. I am not speaking to you without thought. I have pondered and puzzled over the whole matter night after night since I got your letter, wondering what I should do. You know how gladly, with what gratitude, I would have answered you, Yes, let the marriage go on, if I dared, if I dared. But I think, don't you, that a great trouble rather clears one's wits. I used to lie awake at Cairo and think, and the unimportant trivial considerations gradually dropped away, and a few straight and simple truths stood out rather vividly. One felt that one had to cling to them, and with all one's might, because nothing else was left. Yes, that I do understand, Ethne replied in a low voice. She had gone through just such an experience herself. It might have been herself, and not Durrance who was speaking. She looked up at him, and for the first time began to understand that, after all, she and he might have much in common. She repeated over to herself with an even firmer determination, Two lives shall not be spoilt because of me. Well? she asked. Well, here's one of the very straight and simple truths. Marriage between a man crippled like myself, whose life is done, and a woman like you, active and young, whose life is in its flower, would be quite wrong unless each brought to it much more than friendship. It would be quite wrong if it implied a sacrifice for you. It implies no sacrifice, she answered firmly. Durrance nodded. It was evident that the answer contented him and Ethne felt that it was the intonation to which he listened rather than the words. His very attitude of concentration showed her that. 
she began to wonder whether it would be so easy, after all, to quiet his suspicions, now that he was blind. She began to realize that it might possibly, on that very account, be all the more difficult. Then do you bring more than friendship? he asked suddenly. You will be very honest, I know. Tell me. Ethne was in a quandary. She knew that she must answer, and at once, and without ambiguity. In addition, she must answer honestly. There is nothing, she replied, and as firmly as before, nothing in the world which I wish for so earnestly as that you and I should marry. It was an honest wish, and it was honestly spoken. She knew nothing of the conversation which had passed between Harry Faversham and Lieutenant Such in the gill room of the Criterion restaurant. She knew nothing of Harry's plans. She had not heard of the Gordon letters recovered from the mud wall of a ruined house in the city of the Dervishes on the Nile bank. Harry Feversham had, so far as she knew and meant, gone forever completely out of her life. Therefore, her wish was an honest one, but it was not an exact answer to Durance's question, and she hoped that again he would listen to the intonation rather than to the words. However, he seemed content with it. Thank you, Ethne, he said, and he took her hand and shook it. His face smiled at her. He asked no other questions. There was not a doubt, she thought. His suspicions were quieted. He was quite content. And upon that, Mrs. Adair came with discretion into the room. She had the tact to greet Durrance as one who suffered under no disadvantage, and she spoke as though she had seen him only the week before. I suppose Ethne has told you of our plan, she said, as she took her tea from her friend's hand. No, not yet, Ethne answered. What plan? asked Durrance. It is all arranged, said Mrs. Adair. You will want to go home to Gessens in Devonshire. I am your neighbor. A couple of fields separate us, that's all. So Ethne will stay with me during the interval before you are married. That's very kind of you, Mrs. Adair. Durrance exclaimed, because, of course, there will be an interval. A short one, no doubt, said Mrs. Adair. Well, it's this way. If there's a chance that I may recover my sight, it would be better that I should seize it at once. Time means a good deal in these cases. Then there is a chance, cried Ethne. I am going to see a specialist here tomorrow, Durrance answered, and, of course, there's the oculus at West Baden but it may not be necessary to go so far. I expect that I shall be able to stay at Gessens and come up to London when it is necessary. Thank you very much, Mrs. Adair. It's a good plan. And he added slowly, From my point of view, there could be no better. Ethne watched Durrance drive away with his servant to his old rooms in St. James Street and stood by the window after he had gone, in much the same attitude and absorption as that which had characterized her before he had come. Outside in the street the carriages were now coming back from the park, and there was just one other change. Ethne's apprehensions had taken a more definite shape. She believed that suspicion was quieted endurance for today at all events. She had not heard his conversation with Calder and Cairo. She did not know that he believed there was no cure which could restore him to sight. She had no remotest notion that the possibility of a remedy might be a mere excuse. But none the less she was uneasy. Durrance had grown more acute. Not only his senses had been sharpened, that, indeed, was to be expected, but trouble and thought had sharpened his mind as well. It had become more penetrating. She felt that she was entering upon an encounter of wits, and she had a fear lest she would be worsted. Two lives shall not be spoilt because of me, she repeated, but it was a prayer now rather than a resolve. For one thing she recognized quite surely, Durrance saw ever so much more clearly now that he was blind. End of chapter 13、Chapter、14 of The Four Feathers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Ullman. 
the four feathers by a e w mason chapter fourteen captain willoughby reappears during the months of july and august ethne's apprehensions grew and once at all events they found expression on her lips i am afraid she said one morning as she stood in the sunlight at an open window of mrs adair's house upon a creek of the salcombe estuary in the room behind her mrs adair smiled quietly of what that some accident happened to colonel durrance yesterday in london no ethne answered slowly not of that for he is at this moment crossing the lawn towards us again mrs adair smiled but she did not raise her head from the book which she was reading so that it might have been some passage in the book which so abused and pleased her i thought so she said but in so low a voice that the words barely reached ethne's ears they did not penetrate to her mind whereas she looked across the stone flagged terrace and down the broad shallow flight of steps to the lawn she asked abruptly do you think he has any hope whatever that he will recover his sight the question had not occurred to mrs adair before and she gave to it now no importance in her thoughts would he travel up to town so often to see his oculist if he had none she asked in reply of course he hopes i'm afraid said ethne and she turned with a sudden movement toward her friend haven't you noticed how quick he has grown and is growing quick to interpret your silences to infer what you do not say from what you do to fill out your sentences to make your movements the commentary of your words laura haven't you noticed at times i think the very corners of my mind are revealed to him he reads me like a child's lesson book yes said mrs adair you are at a disadvantage you no longer have your face to screen your thoughts and his eyes no longer tell me anything at all ethne added there was truth in both remarks so long as durrance had had ethne's face with its bright color and her steady frank gray eyes visible before him he could hardly weigh her intervals of silence and her movements against her spoken words with the detachment which was now possible to him on the other hand whereas before she had never been troubled by a doubt as to what he meant or wished or intended now she was often in the dark durrance's blindness in a word had produced an effect entirely opposite to that which might have been expected it had reversed their positions mrs adair however was more interested in ethne's unusual burst of confidence there was no doubt of it she reflected the girl once remarkable for a quiet frankness of word and look was declining into a creature of shifts and agitations there is something then to be concealed from him she asked quietly yes something rather important something which at all costs i must conceal ethne exclaimed and was not sure even while she spoke that durrance had not already found it out she stepped over the threshold of the window onto the terrace in front of her the lawn stretched to a hedge on the far side of that hedge a couple of grass fields lifted and fell in gentle undulations and beyond the field she could see amongst a cluster of trees the smoke from the chimneys of colonel durrance's house she stood for a little while hesitating upon the terrace on the left the lawn ran down to a line of tall beeches and oaks which fringed the creek but a broad space had been cleared to make a gap upon the bank so that ethne could see the sunlight on the water and the wooded slope on the farther side and a sailing boat some way down the creek tacking slowly against the light ethne looked about her as though she were summoning her resources and even composing her sentences ready for delivery to the man who was walking steadily towards her across the lawn if there was hesitation upon her part there was none at all she noticed on the part of the blind man it seemed that durrance's eyes looked in the path which his feet trod and with the stick which he carried in his hand he switched at the blades of grass 
like one that carries it from habit rather than for any use ethne descended the steps and advanced to meet him she walked slowly as if to a difficult encounter but there was another who only waited an opportunity to gauge in it with eagerness for as ethne descended the steps mrs adair suddenly dropped the book from which she had pretended to resume and ran towards the window hidden by the drapery of the curtain she looked out and watched the smile was still upon her lips but a fierce light had brightened in her eyes her face had the drawn look of hunger something which at all costs she must conceal she said to herself and she said it in a voice of exultation there was contempt too in her tone contempt for ethne eustace the woman of the open air who was afraid who shrank from marriage with a blind man and dreaded the restraint upon her freedom it was that shrinking which ethne had to conceal mrs adair had no doubt of it for my part i am glad she said and she was fiercely glad that blindness had disabled durance for if her opportunity ever came as it seemed to her now more and more likely to come blindness reserved him to her as no man was ever reserved to any woman so jealous was she of his every word and look that his dependence upon her would be the extreme of pleasure she watched ethne and durrance meet on the lawn at the foot of the terrace steps she saw them turn and walk side by side across the grass towards the creek she noticed that ethne seemed to plead and in her heart she longed to overhear and ethne was pleading you saw your oculus yesterday she asked quickly as soon as they met well what did he say durrance shrugged his shoulders that one must wait only time can show whether a cure is possible or not he answered and then ethne bent forward a little and scrutinized his face as though she doubted that he had spoke the truth but must you and i wait she asked surely he returned it would be wiser on all counts and thereupon he asked her suddenly a question of which she did not see the drift it was mrs adair i imagine who proposed this plan that i should come home to gessens and that you should stay with her here across the fields ethne was puzzled by the question but she answered it directly and truthfully i was in great distress when i heard of your accident i was so distressed that at the first i could not think what to do i came to london and told laura since she is my friend and this was her plan of course i welcomed it with my heart and the note of pleading rang in her voice she was asking durrance to confirm her words and he understood that he turned towards her with a smile i know that very well ethne he said gently ethne drew a breath of relief and the anxiety passed for a little while from her face it was kind of mrs adair he resumed but it is rather hard on you who would like to be back in your own country i remember very well a sentence which harry feversham he spoke the name quite carelessly but paused just for a moment after he had spoken it no expression upon his face showed that he had any intention in so pausing but ethne suspected one he was listening she suspected for some movement of uneasiness perhaps of pain into which she might possibly be betrayed but she made no movement a sentence which harry feversham spoke a long while since he continued in london just before i left london for egypt he was speaking of you and he said she is of her country and more of her county i do not think she could be happy in any place which was not within reach of donegal and when i remember that it seems rather selfish that i should claim to keep you here at so much cost to you i was not thinking of that ethne exclaimed when i asked why we must wait that makes me out most selfish i was merely wondering why you preferred to wait why you insist upon it for of course although one hopes and prays with all one's soul that you will get your sight back the fact of a cure can make no difference she spoke slowly and her voice again had a ring of pleading this time durrance did not confirm her words 
and she repeated them with a greater emphasis. It can make no difference. Durant started like a man roused from an abstraction. I beg your pardon, Ethany, he said. I was thinking at the moment of Harry Feversham. There is something which I want you to tell me. You said a long time ago at Glenola that you might one day bring yourself to tell me, and I should rather like to know now. You see, Harry Feversham was my friend. I want you to tell me what happened that night at Lennon House to break off your engagement, to send him away an outcast. Ethne was silent for a while, and then she said gently, I would rather not. It is all over and done with. I don't want you to ask me ever. Durrance did not press for an answer in the slightest degree. Very well, he said cheerily. I won't ask you. It might hurt you to answer, and I don't want, of course, to cause you pain. It's not on that account that I wish to say nothing, Ethne explained earnestly. She paused and chose a word. It isn't that I am afraid of any pain, but what took place took place such a long while ago. I look upon Mr. Feversham as a man whom one has known well and who is now dead. They were walking towards the wide gap in the line of trees upon the bank of the creek, and as Ethne spoke she raised her eyes from the ground. She saw that the little boat which she had noticed tacking up the creek while she hesitated upon the terrace had run its nose into the shore. The sail had been lowered, the little pole mast stuck up above the grass bank of the garden, and upon the bank itself a man was standing and staring vaguely towards the house as though not very sure of his ground. A stranger has landed from the creek, she said. He looks as if he had lost his way. I will go on and put him right. She ran forward as she spoke, seizing upon the stranger's presence as a means of relief, even if the relief was only to last a minute. Such relief might be felt, she imagined, by a witness in a court when the judge rises for his half hour at lunchtime, for the close of an interview with Durrance left her continually with the sense that she had just stepped down from a witness box where she had been subjected to a cross-examination so deft that she could not quite clearly perceive its tendency, although from the beginning she suspected it. The stranger at the same time advanced to her. He was a man of the middle size, with a short snub nose, a pair of vacuous, protruding brown eyes, and a mustache of some ferocity. He lifted his hat from his head and disclosed a round forehead which was going bald. I have sailed down from Kingsbridge, he said, but I have never been in this part of the world before. Can you tell me if this house is called the Pool? Yes, and you will find Mrs. Adair if you go up the steps on to the terrace, said Ethne. I came to see Miss Eustace. Ethne turned back to him with surprise. I am Miss Eustace. The stranger contemplated her in silence. So I thought. He twirled first one mustache and then the other before he spoke again. I have had some trouble to find you, Miss Eustace. I went all the way to Glenola for nothing. Rather hard on a man whose leave is short. I am sorry, said Ethne with a smile. But why have you been put to this trouble? Again the stranger curled a mustache. Again his eyes dwelt vacantly upon her before he spoke. You have forgotten my name, no doubt, by this time. I do not think that I have ever heard it, she answered. Ah, yes, you have, believe me. You heard it five years ago. I am Captain Willoughby. Ethne grew sharply back. The bright color paled in her cheeks. Her lips set in a firm line, and her eyes grew up very hard. She glowered at him silently. Captain Willoughby was not in the least degree decomposed. He took his time to speak, and when he did, it was rather with the air of a man forgiving a breach of manners than of one making his excuses. I can quite understand that you do not welcome me, Miss Eustace, but none of us could foresee that you would be present when the three white feathers came into Feversham's hands. Ethne swept the explanation aside. How do you know I was present, she asked. Feversham told me. You have seen him? 
the cry leaped loudly from her lips it was just a throb of the heart made vocal it startled ethne as much as it surprised captain willoughby she had schooled herself to omit harry feversham from her thoughts and to obliterate him from her affections and the cry showed to her how incompletely she had succeeded only a few minutes since she had spoken of him as one whom she looked upon as dead and she had believed that she spoke the truth you have actually seen him she repeated in a wondering voice she gazed at her stolid companion with envy you have spoken to him and he to you when a year ago at suakin else why should i be here the question came as a shock to ethne she did not guess the correct answer she was not indeed sufficiently mistress of herself to speculate upon any answer but she dreaded it whatever it might be yes she said slowly and almost reluctantly after all why are you here willoughby took a letter case from his breast opened it with deliberation and shook out from one of its pockets into the palm of his hand a tiny soiled white feather he held it out to ethne i have come to give you this ethne did not take it in fact she positively shrank from it why she asked unsteadily three white feathers three separate accusations of cowardice were sent to feversham by three separate men this is actually one of those feathers which were forwarded from his lodgings to remington five years ago i am one of the three men who sent him i have come to tell you that i withdraw my accusation i take my feather back and you bring it to me he asked me to ethne took the feather in her palm a thing in itself so light and fragile and yet so momentous as a symbol and the trees and the garden began to whirl suddenly about her she was aware that captain willoughby was speaking but his voice had grown extraordinarily distant and thin so that she was annoyed since she wished very much to hear all that he had to say she felt very cold even upon that august day of sunlight but the presence of captain willoughby one of the three men whom she never would forgive helped her to command herself she would give no exhibition of weakness before any one of the detested three and with an effort she recovered herself when she was on the very point of swooning come she said i will hear your story your news was rather a shock to me even now i do not quite understand she led the way from the open space to a little plot of grass above the creek on three sides thick hedges enclosed it at the back rose the tall elms and poplars in front the water flashed and broke in ripples and beyond the water the trees rose again and were over topped by sloping meadows a gap in the hedge made an entrance into this enclosure and a garden seat stood in the centre of the grass now ethne said as she motioned to captain willoughby to take a seat at her side you will take your time perhaps you will forget nothing even his words if you remember them i shall thank you for his words she held that white feather clenched in her hand somehow harry feversham had redeemed his honour somehow she had been unjust to him and she was to learn how she was in no hurry she did not even feel one pang of remorse that she had been unjust remorse no doubt would come afterwards at present the mere knowledge that she had been unjust was too great a happiness to admit of abatement she opened her hand and looked at the feather and as she looked memory sternly repressed for so long regrets which she had thought stifled quite out of life longings which had grown strange filled all her thoughts the devonshire meadows were about her the salt of the sea was in the air but she was back again at the mist of that one season at dublin during a spring five years ago before the feathers came to remelton willoughby began to tell a story and almost at once even the memory of that season vanished ethne was in the most english of countries the county of plymouth and dartmouth and brixton and the start where the red cliffs of its coastline speak perpetually of dead centuries so that one cannot put into any harbour without some thought of the spanish main and of the little barks and pinnaces 
which had ventured manfully out on their long voyages with the tide up this very creek the clink of the shipbuilders hammers had rung and the soil upon its banks was vigorous with the memories of british soldiers but ethne had no thought for these associations the countryside was a shifting mist before her eyes which now and then let through a glimpse of that strange wide country in the east of which durrance had so often told her the only trees which she saw were the stunted mimosas of the desert the only cliffs the sharp pyramidal black rocks rising abruptly from its surface it was part of the irony of her position that she was able so much more completely to appreciate the trials which one lover of hers had undergone through the confidences which had been made to her by the other end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the four feathers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Craig. The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason. Chapter 15. The Story of the First Feather. I will not interrupt you, said Ethne, as Willoughby took his seat beside her, and he had barely spoken a score of words before she broke that promise. I am deputy governor of Suakin, he began. My chief was on leave in May. You are fortunate enough not to know Suakin, Miss Eustace, particularly in May. No white woman can live in that town. It has a sodden, intolerable heat peculiar to itself. The air is heavy with brine. You can't sleep at night for its oppression. Well, I was sitting in the veranda on the first floor of the palace about ten o'clock at night, looking out over the harbor and the distillation works, and wondering whether it was worthwhile to go to bed at all. When a servant told me that the man, who refused to give his name, wished particularly to see me. The man was Feversham. There was only a lamp burning in the veranda, and the night was dark, so that I did not recognize him until he was close to me. At once, Ethne interrupted. How did he look? Willoughby wrinkled his forehead and opened his eyes wide. Really, I do not know, he said doubtfully. Much like other men, I suppose, who have been a year or two in the Sudan. A trifle overtrained and that sort of thing. Never mind, said Ethne, with a sigh of disappointment. For five years she had heard no word of Harry Feversham. She fairly hungered for news of him, for the sound of his habitual phrases, for the description of his familiar gestures. She had the woman's anxiety for his bodily health. She wished to know whether he had changed in face or figure, and, if so, how and in what measure. But she glanced at the obtuse, unobservant countenance of Captain Willoughby, and she understood that however much she craved these particulars, she must go without. I beg your pardon, she said. Will you go on? I asked him what he wanted, Willoughby resumed, and why he had not sent in his name. You would not have seen me if I had, he replied, and he drew a packet of letters out of his pocket. Now those letters, Miss Eustace, had been written a long while ago by General Gordon in Khartoum. They had been carried down the Nile as far as Berber. But the day after they reached Berber, that town surrendered to the Mahdists. Abu Fatma, the messenger who carried them, hid them in the wall of the house of an Arab called Yusef, who sold rock salt in the marketplace. Abu was then thrown into prison on suspicion and escaped to Suakin. The letters remained hidden in that wall until Feversham recovered them. I looked over them and saw that they were of no value, and I asked Feversham bluntly why he, who had once not dared to accompany his regiment on active service, had risked death and torture to get them back. Standing upon that veranda, with the quiet pool of water in front of him, Feversham had told his story quietly and without exaggeration. 
He had related how he had fallen in with Abu Fatma at Suakim, how he had planned the recovery of the letters, how the two men had traveled together as far as Obak, and since Abu Fatma dared not go further, how he himself, driving his gray donkey, had gone on alone to Berber. He had not even concealed that access of panic which had loosened his joints when first he saw the low brown walls of the town and the towering date palms behind on the bank of the Nile, which had set him running and leaping across the empty desert in the sunlight, a marrowless thing of fear. He made, however, one omission. He said nothing of the hours which he had spent crouching upon the hot sand, with his coat drawn over his head while he drew a woman's face toward him across the continents and seas, and nerved himself to endure by the look of sorrow which it wore. He went down into Berber at the setting of the sun, said Captain Willoughby, and it was all that he had to say. It was enough, however, for Ethne Eustace. He drew a deep breath of relief. Her face softened. There came a light into her gray eyes and a smile upon her lips. He went down into Berber, she repeated softly, and found that the old town had been destroyed by the orders of the emir, and that a new one was building upon its southern confines, continued Willoughby. All the landmarks by which Feversham was to know the house in which the letters were hidden had gone. The roofs had been torn off, the houses dismantled, the front walls carried away, narrow alleys of crumbling five courts. That is how Feversham described the place, crossing this way and that, and gaping to the stars. Here and there perhaps a broken tower rose up, and the remnant of a rich man's house. But of any sign which could tell a man where the hut of Yusuf, who had once sold rock salt in the marketplace, had stood, there was no hope in those acres of crumbling mud. The foxes had already made the burrows there. The smile faded from Ethne's face, but she looked again at the white feather lying in her palm, and she laughed with a great contentment. It was yellow with the desert dust. It was a proof that in this story there was to be no word of failure. Go on, she said. Willoughby related the dispatch of the negro with the donkey to Abu Fatma at the wells of Wabak. Eversham stayed for a fortnight in Berber, Willoughby continued, a week during which he came every morning to the well and waited for the return of the negro from Obak, and a week during which that negro searched for Yusef, who had once sold rock salt in the marketplace. I doubt, Miss Eustace, if you can realize, however hard you try, what that fortnight must have meant to Feversham. The anxiety, the danger, the continued expectation that a voice would bid him to halt and a hand fall upon his shoulder, the urgent knowledge that if a hand fell, death would be the least part of his penalty. I imagine the town, a town of low houses and broad streets of sand, dug here and there into pits of mud wherewith to build the houses, and overhead the blistering sun and a hot shadowless sky. In no corner was there any darkness or concealment and all day a crowd jostled and shouted up and down these streets, for that is the Mahatist policy to crowd the towns so that all may be watched and every other man may be his neighbor's spy. Feversham dared not seek the shelter of a roof at night, for he dared not trust his tongue. He could buy his food each day at the booths, but he was afraid of any conversation. He slept at night in some corner of the old deserted town, in the acres of the ruined five courts. For the same reason he must not slink in the byways by day lest anyone should question him about his business, nor listen on the chance of hearing Yusef's name in the public places lest other loiters should joke with him and draw him into their talk. Nor dare he in the daylight prowl about those crumbled ruins. From sunrise to sunset he must go quickly up and down the streets of the town like a man bent upon urgent business, which permits of no delay. And that continued for a fortnight, Miss Eustace. A weary, trying life, don't you think? I wish I could tell you of it as vividly as he told me that night upon the balcony of the palace at Suakin. Ethne wished it, too, with all her heart. Harry Feversham had made his story very real that night to Captain Willoughby, 
so that even after the lapse of fifteen months this unimaginative creature was sensible of a contrast and a deficiency in the manner of his narration. In front of us was the quiet harbor and the Red Sea, above us the African stars. Eversham spoke in the quietest manner possible, but with a peculiar deliberation and with his eyes fixed upon my face, as though he was forcing me to feel with him and to understand. Even when he lighted his cigar, he did not avert his eyes, for by this time I had given him a cigar and offered him a chair. I had really, I assure you, Miss Eustace. It was the first time in four years that he had sat with one of his equals, or indeed with any of his countrymen on a footing of equality. He told me so. I wish I could remember all that he told me. Willoughby stopped and cudgeled his brains helplessly. He gave up the effort in the end. Well, he resumed, after Feversham had skulked for a fortnight in Berber, the Negro discovered Yusef, no longer selling salt, but tending a small plantation of Dura on the river's edge. From Yusef, Feversham obtained particulars enough to guide him to the house where the letters were concealed in the inner wall. But Yusef was no longer to be trusted. Possibly Feversham's accent betrayed him. The more likely conjecture is that Yusef took Feversham for a spy and thought it wise to be beforehand and confess to Mohammed el Kair, the emir, his own share in the concealment of the letters. That, however, is a mere conjecture. The important fact is this. On the same night Feversham went alone to Old Berber. Alone, said Ethne. Yes. He found the house fronting a narrow alley and the sixth of the row. The front wall was destroyed, but the two side walls and the back wall still stood. Three feet from the floor and two feet from the right-hand corner, the letters were hidden in that inner wall. Feversham dug into the mud bricks with his knife. He made a hole wherein he could slip his hand. The wall was thick. He dug deep, stopping now and again to feel for the packet. At last, his fingers clasped and drew it out. As he hid it in a fold of his jibba, the light of a lantern shone upon him from behind. Ethne started as though she had been trapped herself. Those acres of roofless five courts, with here and there a tower showing up against the sky, the lonely alleys, the dead silence here beneath the stars, the cries and the beating of drums and the glare of lights from the new town, Harry Feversham alone with the letters, with, and in a word, some portion of his honor redeemed, and finally the lantern flashing upon him in that solitary place. The scene itself and the progress of the incidents were so visible to Ethne at that moment that even with the feather in her open palm she could hardly bring herself to believe that Harry Feversham had escaped. Well, well, she asked. He was standing with his face to the wall. The light came from the alley behind him. He did not turn, but out of the corner of his eye he could see a fold of a white robe hanging motionless. He carefully secured the package, with a care indeed, and a composure which astonished him even at that moment. The shock had strung him to a concentration and lucidity of thought unknown to him till then. His fingers were trembling, he remarked, as he tied the knots, but it was with excitement, and an excitement which did not flurry. His mind worked rapidly, but quite coolly, quite deliberately. He came to a perfectly definite conclusion as to what he must do. Every faculty which he possessed was extraordinarily clear, and at the same time extraordinarily still. He had his knife in his hand. He faced about suddenly and ran. There were two men waiting. Feversham ran at the man who held the lantern. He was aware of the point of a spear. He ducked and beat it aside with his left arm. He leaped forward and struck with his right. The Arab fell at his feet. The lantern was extinguished. Feversham sprang across the white road body and ran eastward toward the open desert. But in no panic, he had never been so collected. He was followed by the second soldier. He had foreseen that he would be followed. If he was to escape, it was indeed necessary that he should be. He turned a corner, crouched behind a wall, and as the Arab came running by, he leaped out upon his shoulders and again, as he leaped, he struck. Captain Willoughby stopped at this point of his story and turned toward Ethne. He had something to say which perplexed and at the same time impressed him. 
and he spoke with a desire for an explanation. The strangest feature of those few fierce short minutes, he said, was that Feversham felt no fear. I don't understand that, do you? From the first moment when the lantern shone upon him from behind, to the last when he turned his feet eastward and ran through the ruined alleys and broken walls toward the desert and the wells of Wobach, he felt no fear. This was the most mysterious part of Harry Feversham's story to Captain Willoughby. He was a man who so shrank from the possibilities of battle that he must actually send in his papers rather than confront them. Yet when he stood in dire and immediate peril, he felt no fear. Captain Willoughby might well turn to Ethne for an explanation. There had been no mystery in it to Harry Feversham, but a great bitterness of spirit. He had sat on the veranda at Suakin, whittling away at the edge of Captain Willoughby's table with the very knife which he had used in Berber to dig out the letters, and which had proved so handy in a weapon when the lantern shone out behind him, the one glimmering point of light in that vast acreage of ruin. Harry Feversham had kept it carefully uncleansed of blood. He had treasured it all through his flight across the two hundred and forty-odd miles of the desert into Suakin. It was, next to the white feathers, the thing which he held most precious of his possessions. And not merely because it would serve as a corroboration of his story to Captain Willoughby, but because the weapon enabled him to believe and realize it himself. A brown clotted rust dulled the whole length of the blade, and often during the first two days and nights of his flight, when he traveled alone, hiding and running and hiding again, with a dread of pursuit always at his heels, he had taken the knife from his breast and stared at it with incredulous eyes, and clutched it close to him like a thing of comfort. He had lost his way amongst the sand hills of Obak on the evening of the second day, and had wandered vainly with his small store of dates and water exhausted, until he had stumbled and lay prone, parched and famished and enfeebled, with the bitter knowledge that Abu Fatma and the wells were somewhere within a mile of the spot on which he lay. But even at that moment of exhaustion, the knife had been a talisman and a help. He grasped the rough wooden handle, all too small for a western hand, and he ran his fingers over the rough rust upon the blade, and the weapon spoke to him and bade him to take heart. Since once he had been put to the test and had not failed. But long before he saw the white houses of Suakin, that feeling of elation vanished and the knife became an emblem of the vain tortures of his boyhood and the miserable folly which culminated in his resignation of his commission. He understood now the words which Lieutenant Such had spoken in the grill room of the Criterion restaurant when citing Hamlet as his example. The thing which he saw, which he thought over, which he imagined in the act and in the consequences that he shrank from, yet when the moment of action comes sharp and immediate, does he fail? And remembering these words, Harry Feversham sat one May night, four years afterward, in Captain Willoughby's veranda, whittling away at the table with his knife, and saying over and over again, in a bitter, savage voice, It was an illusion, but an illusion which caused a great deal of suffering to a woman I would have shielded from suffering. But I am well paid for it, for it has wrecked my life besides. Captain Willoughby could not understand any more than General Feversham could have understood, or than Ethne had. But Willoughby could at all events remember and repeat, and Ethne had grown by five years of unhappiness since the night when Harry Feversham in the little room off the hall at Lennon House had told her of his upbringing, of the loss of his mother, of the impassable gulf between his father and himself, and of the fear of disgrace which had haunted his nights and disfigured the world for him by day. Yes, it was an illusion, she cried. I understand. I might have understood a long while since, but I would not. When those feathers came, he told me why they were sent, quite simply with his eyes on mine. When my father knew of them, he waited quite steadily and faced my father. There was other evidence of the like kind not within Ethne's knowledge. Harry Feversham had journeyed down to Broad Place in Surrey and made his confession no less unflinchingly to the old general. But Ethne knew enough. 
It was the possibility of cowardice from which he shrank, not the possibility of hurt, she exclaimed. If only one had been a little older, a little less sure about things, a little less narrow, I should have listened. I should have understood. At all events, I should not, I think, have been cruel. Not for the first time did remorse for that fourth feather which she had added to the three seize upon her. She sat now crushed by it into silence. Captain Willoughby, however, was a stubborn man, unwilling upon any occasion to admit an error. He saw that Ethne's remorse by implication condemned himself, and that he was not prepared to suffer. Yes, but these fine distinctions are a little too elusive for practical purposes, he said. You can't run the world on fine distinctions, so I cannot bring myself to believe that we three men were at all to blame, and if we were not, you of all people can have no reason for self-reproach. Ethne did not consider what he precisely meant by the last reference to herself. For as he leaned complacently back in his chair, anger against him flamed suddenly hot in her. Occupied by his story, she had ceased to take stock of the storyteller. Now that he had ended, she looked him over from head to foot. An obstinate stupidity was the mark of the man to her eye. How dare he sit in judgment upon the meanest of his fellows, let alone Harry Feversham, she asked, and in the same moment recollected that she herself had endorsed his judgment. Shame tingled through all her blood. She sat with her lips set, keeping Willoughby under watch from the corners of her eyes, and waiting to pounce savagely the moment he opened his lips. There had been noticeable throughout his narrative a manner of condescension towards Feversham. Let him use it again, thought Ethne. But Captain Willoughby said nothing at all, and Ethne herself broke the silence. Who of you three first thought of sending the feathers? she asked aggressively. Not you? No, I think it was Trench, he replied. Ah, Trench, Ethne exclaimed. She struck one clenched hand the hand which held the feather viciously into the palm of the other. I'll remember that name. But I share his responsibility, Willoughby assured her. I do not shrink from it at all. I regret very much that we cause you pain and annoyance, but I do not acknowledge to any mistake in this matter. I take my feather back now, and I annul my accusation. But that is your doing. Mine, asked Ethne, what do you mean? Captain Willoughby turned with surprise to his companion. A man may live in the Sudan and even yet not be wholly ignorant of women and their great quality of forgiveness. You gave the feathers back to Feversham in order that he might redeem his honor. That is evident. Ethne sprang to her feet before Captain Willoughby had come to the end of his sentence and stood a little in front of him with her face averted and in an attitude remarkably still. Willoughby, in his ignorance, like many another stupid man before him, had struck with a shrewdness and a vigor which he could never have compassed by the use of his wits. He had pointed out abruptly and suddenly to Ethne a way which she might have taken and had not, and her remorse warned her very clearly that it was the way which she ought to have taken. But she could rise to the heights. She did not seek to justify herself in her own eyes nor would she allow Willoughby to continue in his misconception. She recognized that here she had failed in charity and justice, and she was glad that she had failed, since her failure had been the opportunity of greatness to Harry Feversham. Will you repeat what you said, she asked in a low voice, and ever so slowly, please. You gave the feathers back into Feversham's hand. He told you that himself? Yes, and Willoughby resumed. In order that he might, by his subsequent bravery, compel the men who sent them to take them back, and so redeem his honor. He did not tell you that? No, I guessed it. You see, Feversham's disgrace was, on the face of it, impossible to retrieve. The opportunity might never have occurred. It was not likely to occur. As things happened, Feversham still waited for three years in the bazaar at Suakin before it did. No, Miss Eustace, it needed a woman's faith to conceive that plan, a woman's encouragement to keep the man who undertook it to his work. Ethne laughed and turned back to him. 
Her face was tender with pride, and more than tender. Pride seemed in some strange way to hallow her, to give an unimagined benignance to her eyes, an unearthly brightness to the smile upon her lips and the color upon her cheeks, so that Willoughby looking at her was carried out of himself. Yes, he cried, you are the woman to plan this redemption. Ethne laughed again, and very happily. Did he tell you of the fourth white feather, she asked? No. I shall tell you the truth, she said, and she resumed her seat. The plan was of his devising from first to last, nor did I encourage him to its execution, for until today I never heard a word of it. Since the night of that dance in Donegal, I have had no message from Mr. Feversham and no news of him. I told him to take up those three feathers because they were his, and I wished to show him that I agreed with the accusations of which they were the symbols. That seems cruel, but I did more. I snapped a fourth white feather from my fan and gave him that to carry away too. It is only fair that you should know. I wanted to make an end for ever and ever, not only of my acquaintanceship with him, but of every kindly thought he might keep of me, of every kindly thought I might keep of him. I wanted to be sure myself, and I wanted him to be sure, that we should always be strangers now and afterwards. And the last words she spoke in a whisper. Captain Willoughby did not understand what she meant by them. It is possible that only Lieutenant Such and Harry Feversham himself would have understood. I was sad and sorry enough when I had done it, she resumed. Indeed, indeed, I think I have always been sorry since. I think that I have never at any minute during these five years quite forgotten that fourth white feather and the quiet air of dignity with which he took it. But today I'm glad. And her voice, though low, rang rich with the fullness of her pride. Oh, very glad. For this was his thought, his deed. They are both all his as I would have them be. I had no share, and of that I am very proud. He needed no woman's faith, no woman's encouragement. Yet he sent this back to you, said Willoughby, pointing in some perplexity to the feather which Ethne held. Yes, she said, yes. He knew that I should be glad to know. And suddenly she held it close to her breast. Thus she sat for a while with her eyes shining, until Willoughby rose to his feet and pointed to the gap in the hedge by which they had entered the enclosure. By Jove, Jack Durrance, he exclaimed. Durrance was standing in the gap, which was the only means of entering or going out. End of chapter 15、Chapter、16 Chapter of The Four Feathers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Ullman. The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason. Chapter 16 Captain Willoughby Retires. Ethne had entirely forgotten even Colonel Durrance's existence. From the moment when Captain Willoughby had put that Little soil feather, which had once been white and was now yellow, into her hand, she had no thought for any one but Harry Feversham. She had carried Willoughby into that enclosure, and his story had absorbed her and kept her memory on the rack as she filled out with this or that recollected details of Harry's gestures or voice or looks the deficiencies in her companion's narrative. She had been swept away from that august garden of sunlight and colored flowers, and those five most weary years during which she had held her head high and greeted the world with a smile of courage were blotted from her existence. How weary they had been, perhaps she never knew, until she raised her head and saw Durrance at the entrance of the hedge. Hush, she said to Willoughby, and her face paled and her eyes shut tight for a moment. With a spasm of pain, but she had no time to spare for any indulgence of her feelings. Her few minutes' talk with Captain Willoughby had been a holiday, but the holiday was over. 
she must take up again the responsibilities with which those five years had charged her and at once if she could not accomplish that hard task of forgetting and she now knew very well that she never would accomplish it she must do the next best thing and give no sign that she had not forgotten durrance must continue to believe that she brought more than friendship into the marriage account he stood at the very entrance to the enclosure he advanced into it he was so quick to guess it was not wise that he should meet captain willoughby or even know of his coming ethne looked about her for an escape knowing very well that she would look in vain the creek was in front of them and three walls of high thick hedge girt them in behind and at the sides there was but one entrance to this enclosure and durrance himself barred the path to it keep still she said in a whisper you know him of course we were together for three years of swarkin i heard that he had gone blind i am glad to know that it is not true this he said noticing the freedom of durrance's gait speak lower returned ethne it is true he is blind one would never have thought it consolation seemed so futile what can i say to him say nothing durrance was still standing just within the enclosure and as it seemed looking straight towards the two people seated on the bench ethne he said rather than called and the quiet unquestioning voice made the illusion that he saw extraordinarily complete it's impossible that he is blind said willoughby he sees us he sees nothing again durrance called ethne but now in a louder voice and a voice of doubt do you hear he is not sure whispered ethne keep very still why he must not know you are here and lest willoughby should move she caught his arm tight in her hand willoughby did not pursue his inquiries ethne's manner constrained him to silence she sat very still as she wished him to sit and in a queer huddled attitude she was even holding her breath she was staring at durrance with a great fear in her eyes her face was strained forward and not a muscle of it moved so that willoughby as he looked at her was conscious of a certain excitement which grew on him for no reason but her remarkable apprehension he began unaccountably himself to fear lest he and she should be discovered he is coming towards us he whispered not a word not a movement ethne durrance cried again he advanced further into the enclosure and towards the seat ethne and captain willoughby sat rigid watching him with their eyes he passed in front of the bench and stopped actually facing them surely thought willoughby he sees his eyes were upon them he stood easily as though he were about to speak even ethne though she very well knew that he did not see began to doubt her knowledge ethne he said again and this time in the quiet voice which he had first used but since again no answer came he shrugged his shoulders and turned towards the creek his back was towards them now but ethne's experience had taught her to appreciate almost indefinable signs in his bearing since nowadays his face showed her so little something in his attitude in the poise of his head even in the carelessness with which he swung his stick told her that he was listening and listening with all his might a grasp tightened on willoughby's arm thus they remained for the space of a minute and then durrance turned suddenly and took a quick step towards the seat ethne however by this time knew the man and his ingenuities she was prepared for some such unexpected movement she did not stir there was not audible the merest rustle of a skirt and a grip still constrained willoughby i wonder where in the world she can be said durrance to himself aloud and he walked back and out of the enclosure ethne did not free captain willoughby's arm until durrance had disappeared from sight that was a close shave willoughby said when at last he was allowed to speak suppose that durrance had sat down on the top of us why suppose since he did not ethne asked calmly you have told me everything so far as i remember and all that you have told me happened in the spring the spring of last year said willoughby yes i want to ask you a question why did you not bring this feather to me last summer last year my leave was short 
I spent it in the hills north of Sorkin, after Ibex. I see, Ethne said quietly. I hope you had good sport. It wasn't bad. Last summer, Ethne had been free. If Willoughby had come home with his good news instead of shooting Ibex on Jebel Araft, it would have made all the difference in her life. And the cry was loud at her heart. Why didn't you come? But outwardly she gave no sign of the irreparable harm which Willoughby's delay had brought about. She had the self-command of a woman who had been sorely tried, and she spoke so unconcernedly that Willoughby believed her questions, prompted by the merest curiosity. You might have written, she suggested. Feversham did not suggest that there was any hurry. It would have been a long and difficult matter to explain in a letter. He asked me to go to you when I had an opportunity, and I had no opportunity before. To tell the truth, I thought it was very likely that I might find Feversham had come back before me. Oh, no, returned Ethne. There could be no possibility of that. The other two feathers still remain to be redeemed before he will ask me to take back mine. Willoughby shook his head. Feversham can never persuade Castleton and Trench to cancel their accusations as he persuaded me. Why not? Major Castleton was killed when the square was broken at Tamai. Killed, cried Ethne, and she laughed in a short and satisfied way. Willoughby turned and stared at her, disbelieving the evidence of his ears, but her face showed him quite clearly that she was thoroughly pleased. Ethne was a Celt, and she had the Celt of feelings that death was not a very important matter. She could hate, too, and she could be hard as iron to the men she hated and these three men she hated exceedingly. It was true that she had agreed with them, that she had given a feather, the fourth feather, to Harry Feversham, just to show that she agreed, but she did not trouble her head about that. She was very glad to hear that Major Castleton was out of the world and done with. And Colonel Trench, too, she said? No, Willoughby answered. You are disappointed? But he is even worse off than that. He was captured when engaged on a reconnaissance. He is now a prisoner in Omdurman. Ah, said Ethne. I don't think you can have any idea, said Willoughby severely, of what captivity in Omdurman implies. If you had, however much you disliked the captive, you would feel some pity. Not I, said Ethne stubbornly. I will tell you something of what it does imply. No, I don't watch to hear of Colonel Trent's. Besides, you must go. I want you to tell me one thing first, said she, as she rose from her seat. What became of Mr. Feversham after he had given you that feather? I told him that he had done everything which could be reasonably expected, and he accepted my advice. For he went on board the first steamer which touched at Swakin on its way to Suez, and so left the Sudan. I must find out where he is. He must come back. Did he need money? No, he still drew his allowance from his father. He told me that he had more than enough. I am glad of that, said Ethne, and she bade Willoughby wait within the enclosure until she returned and went out by herself to see that the way was clear. The garden was quite empty. Durrance had disappeared from it, and the great stone terrace of the house and the house itself with its striped sunblinds looked a place of sleep. It was getting towards one o'clock, and the very birds were quiet among the trees. Indeed, the quietude of the garden struck upon Ethne's senses as something almost strange. Only the bees hummed drowsily about the flower beds, and a voice of a lad was heard calling from the slopes of meadow on the far side of the creek. She returned to Captain Willoughby. You can go now, she said. I cannot pretend friendship for you. Captain Willoughby, but it was kind of you to find me out and tell me your story. You are going back at once to Kingsbridge? I hope so, for I do not wish Colonel Durrance to know of your visit or anything of what you have told me. Durrance was a friend of Feversham's, his great friend, Willoughby objected. He is quite unaware that any feathers were sent to Mr. Feversham, so there is no need he should be informed that one of them has been taken back. Ethne answered, he does not know why my engagement to Mr. Feversham was broken off. 
i do not wish him to know your story would enlighten him and he must not be enlightened why asked willoughby he was obstinate by nature and he meant to have the reason for silence before he promised to keep it ethne gave it to him at once very simply i am engaged to colonel durrance she said it was a fear that durrance already suspected that no stronger feeling than friendship attached her to him and once he heard that the fault which broke her engagement to harry feversham had been most bravely atoned there could be no doubt as to the course which he would insist upon pursuing he would strip himself of her the one thing left to him and that she was stubbornly determined he should not do she was bound to him in honour and it would be a poor way of manifesting her joy that harry feversham had redeemed his honour if she stayed away sacrificed her own captain willoughby pursed his lips and whistled engaged to jack durrance he exclaimed then i seem to have wasted my time in bringing you that feather and he pointed towards it she was holding it in her open hand and she drew her hand sharply away as though she feared for a moment that he meant to rob her of it i am most grateful for it she returned it's a bit of a muddle isn't it willoughby remarked it seems a little tough on feversham perhaps it's a little rough on jack durrance too when you come to think of it then he looked at ethne he noticed a careful handling of the feather he remembered something of the glowing look with which she had listened to his story something of the eager tones in which she had put her question and he added i shouldn't wonder if it was rather rough on you too miss eustace ethne did not answer him and they walked together out of the enclosure towards the spot where willoughby had moored his boat she had hurried him down the bank to the water's edge intent that he should sail away unperceived but ethne had counted without mrs adair who all that morning had seen much in ethne's movements to interest her from the drawing-room window she had watched ethne and durrance meet at the foot of the terrace steps she had seen them walk together towards the estuary towards the estuary she had noticed willoughby's boat as it ran aground in the wide gap between the trees she had seen a man disembark and ethne go forward to meet him mrs adair was not the woman to leave a post of observation at such a moment and from the cover of the curtains she continued to watch with all the curiosity of a woman in a village who draws down the blind that unobserved she may get a better peep at the stranger passing down the street ethne and the man from the boat turned away and disappeared among the trees leaving durrance forgotten and alone mrs adair thought at once of that enclosure at the water's edge the conversation lasted for some while and since the couple did not promptly reappear a question flashed into her mind could the stranger could the stranger be harry feversham ethne had no friends in this part of the world the question pressed upon mrs adair she longed for an answer and of course for that particular answer which would convict ethne eustace of duplicity her interest grew into excitement when she saw durrance tired of waiting follow upon ethne's steps but what came after was to interest her still more durrance reappeared to her supplies alone and came straight to the house up the terrace into the drawing-room have you seen ethne he asked is she not in the little garden by the water mrs adair asked no i went into it and called to her it was empty indeed said mrs adair then i don't know where she is are you going yes home mrs adair made no effort to detain him at that moment perhaps you will come in and dine to-night eight o'clock thanks very much i shall be pleased said durrance but he did not immediately go he stood by the window idly swinging to and fro the tassel of the blind i did not know until to-day that it was your plan that i should come home and ethne stay with you until i found out whether a cure was likely or possible it was very kind of you mrs adair and i am grateful it was a natural plan to propose as soon as i heard of your ill luck and when was that he asked unconcernedly the day after calder's telegram reached her from Gaddafi halfa 
I suppose. Mrs. Adair was not deceived by his attitude of carelessness. She realized that his expression of gratitude had deliberately led up to this question. Oh, so you know of that telegram, she said. I thought you did not. For Ethne had asked her not to mention it on the very day when Durrance returned to England. Of course I knew it, he returned, and without waiting any longer for an answer, he went out on to the terrace. Mrs. Adair dismissed for the moment the mystery of the telegram. She was occupied by a conjecture that in the little garden by the water's edge, Durrance had stood and called aloud for Ethne, while within twelve yards of him, perhaps actually within his reach, she and someone else had kept very still and had given no answer. Her conjecture was soon proved true. She saw Ethne and her companion come out again on to the open lawn. Was it Feversham? She must have an answer to that question. She saw them descend the bank towards the boat, and, stepping from her window, ran. Thus it happened that as Willoughby rose from loosening the painter, he saw Mrs. Adair's disappointed eyes gazing into his. Mrs. Adair called to Ethne who stood by Captain Willoughby and came down to the bank to them. I notice you crossed the lawn from the drawing-room window, she said. Yes, answered Ethne, and she said no more. Mrs. Adair, however, did not move away, and an awkward pause followed. Ethne was forced to give in. I am talking to Captain Willoughby, and she turned to him. You do not know Mrs. Adair, I think. No, he replied as he raised his hat but I know Mrs. Adair very well by name. I know friends of yours, Mrs. Adair, Durant, for instance, and of course I knew. A glance from Ethne brought him abruptly to a stop. He began vigorously to push the nose of his boat from the sand. Of course what? asked Mrs. Adair with a smile. Of course I knew of you, Mrs. Adair. Mrs. Adair was quite clear that this was not what Willoughby had been on the point of saying, when Ethne turned her eyes quietly upon him and cut him short. He was on the point of adding another name. Captain Willoughby, she repeated to herself. Then she said, You belong to Colonel Durrance's regiment, perhaps. No, I belong to the North Surrey, he answered. Ah, Mr. Feversham's old regiment, said Mrs. Adair pleasantly. Captain Willoughby had fallen into a little trap with a guilelessness which provoked in her a desire for a closer acquaintance. Whatever Willoughby knew it would be easy to extract. Ethne, however, had disconcertingly ways which at times left Mrs. Adair at a loss. She looked now straight into Mrs. Adair's eyes and said calmly, Captain Willoughby and I have been talking of Mr. Feversham. At the same time, she held out her hand to the captain. Goodbye, she said. Mrs. Adair hastily interrupted. Colonel Durrance has gone home, but he dines with us tonight. I came out to tell you that, but I am glad that I came, for it gives me the opportunity to ask your friend to lunch with us if he will. Captain Willoughby, who already had one leg over the bow of his boat, withdrew it with alacrity. It's awful good of you, Mrs. Adair, he began. It is very kind indeed, Ethne continued, but Captain Willoughby has reminded me that his leave is very short, and we have no right to detain him. Goodbye. Captain Willoughby gazed with a vain appeal upon Miss Eustace. He had travelled all night from London. He had made the scantiest breakfast at Kingsbridge, and the notion of lunch appealed to him particularly at that moment but her eyes rested on his with a quiet and inexorable command. He bowed, got ruefully into his boat, and pushed off from the shore. It's a little rough on me too, perhaps, Miss Eustace, he said. Ethne laughed, and returned to the terrace with Mrs. Adair. Once or twice she opened the palm of her hand and disclosed to her companion's view a small white feather, at which she laughed again and with a clear and rather low laugh, which he gave no explanation of Captain Willoughby's errand. Had she been in Mrs. Adair's place, she would not have expected one. It was her business, and only hers. End of chapter 16
Chapter Seventeen of the Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. The Mussolini Overture. Mrs. Adair, on her side, asked for no explanations. She was naturally, behind her pale and placid countenance, a woman of a torturous and intriguing mind. She preferred to look through a keyhole, even when she could walk straight in at the door, and knowledge which could be gained by a little maneuvering was always more desirable and precious in her eyes than any information which a simple question would elicit. She avoided, indeed, the direct question on a perverted sort of principle, and she thought a day very well spent if, at the close of it, she had outwitted a companion into telling her spontaneously some trivial and unimportant piece of news which a straightforward request would have at once secured for her at breakfast time therefore though she was mystified by the little white feather upon which ethne seemed to set so much store and wondered at the good news of harry feversham which captain willoughby had brought and vainly puzzled her brain in conjecture as what in the world could have happened on that night at ramelton so many years ago she betrayed nothing whatever of her perplexity all through lunch on the contrary she plied her guest with conversation upon indifferent topics mrs adair could be good company when she chose and she chose now but it was not to any purpose i don't believe that you hear a single word i am saying she exclaimed. Ethne laughed and pleaded guilty. She betook herself to her room as soon as lunch was finished and allowed herself an afternoon of solitude, sitting at her window. She repeated slowly the story which Willoughby had told her that morning, and her heart thrilled to it as to the music divinely played. The regret that he had not come home and told it a year ago when she was free was a small thing in comparison with the story itself. It could not outweigh the great gladness which that brought to her. It had indeed completely vanished from her thoughts, a pride which had never recovered from the blow which Harry Feversham had dealt to her in the hall at Lennon House, and by the man who had dealt the blow. She was aglow with it, and most grateful to Harry Feversham for that he had, at so much peril to himself, restored it. She was conscious of a new exhilaration in the sunlight, of a quicker pulsation in her blood. Her youth was given back to her upon that August afternoon. Ethne unlocked a drawer in her dressing case and took from it the portrait which alone of all Harry Feversham's presents she had kept. She rejoiced that she had kept it. It was the portrait of someone who was dead to her, that she knew very well, for there was no thought of disloyalty towards Durrance in her breast. But the someone was a friend. She looked at it with a great happiness and contentment, because Harry Feversham had needed no expression of faith from her to inspire him, and no encouragement from her to keep him through the years on the level of his high inspiration. When she put it back again, she laid the white feather in the drawer with it and locked the two things up together. She came back to a window. Out upon the lawn, a light breeze made the shadows from the high trees dance. The sunlight mellowed and reddened. But Ethne was of her country, as Harry Feversham had long ago discovered, and her heart yearned for it at this moment. It was the month of August. The first of the heather would be out upon the hillsides of Donegal, and she wished that the good news had been brought to her there. The regret that it had not was not her crumpled rose leaf. Here she was in a strange land. There the brown mountains with their outcroppings of granite and the voices of the streams would have shared, she almost thought, in her new happiness. Great sorrows and great joys had this in common for Ethne Eustace. They both drew her homewards, since their endurance was more easy and gladness more complete. 
she had however one living tie with donegal at her side for dermard's old collie dog had become her inseparable companion to him she made her confidence and if at times her voice broke in tears why the dog would not tell her she came to understand much which willoughby had omitted and which feversen had never told those three years of concealment in the small and crowded city of Suekin, for instance with the troops marching out to battle and returning dust-strewn and bleeding and laurelled with victory harry feversham had to slink away at their approach lest some old friend of his durrance perhaps or willoughby or trench should notice him and penetrate his disguise the panic which had beset him when first he saw the dark brown walls of berber the night in the ruined acres the stumbling search for the well amongst the shifting sand hills of obak ethne had vivid pictures of these incidents and as she thought of each she asked herself where was i then what was i doing she sat in a golden mist until the lights began to change upon the still water of the creek and the rooks reeled noisily out from the treetops to sort themselves for the night and warned her of evening she brought to the dinner table that night a buoyancy of spirit which surprised her companions mrs adair had to admit that seldom had her eyes shone so starrily or the colour so freshly graced her cheeks she was more than ever certain that captain willoughby had brought stirring news she was more than ever tortured by her vain effort to guess at its nature but mrs adair in spite of her perplexities took her share in the talk and that dinner passed with a freedom from embarrassment unknown since durrance had come home to gessens for he too threw off a burden of restraint his spirits rose to match ethne's he answered laugh with laugh and from his face that habitual look of tension the look of a man listening with all his might that his ears might make good the loss of his eyes passed altogether away you will play on your violin tonight i think he said with a smile as they rose from the table yes she answered i will with all my heart durrance laughed and held open the door the violin remained locked in its case during these last two months durrance had come to look upon that violin as a gauge and test if the world was going well with ethne the case was unlocked the instrument was allowed to speak if the world went ill it was kept silent lest it should say too much and open old wounds and lay them bare to other eyes ethne herself knew it for an indiscreet friend but it was to be brought out tonight. mrs adair lingered until ethne was out of earshot you have noticed a change in her tonight she said yes have i not answered durrance one has waited for it hoped for it despaired of it are you so glad of the change durrance threw back his head do you wonder that i am glad kind friendly unselfish these things she has always been but there is more than friendliness evident tonight and for the first time it's evident there came a look of pity upon mrs adair's face and she passed out of the room without another word durrance looked at her durrance took all of that great change in ethne to himself mrs adair drew up the blinds of the drawing-room opened the window and let the moonlight in and then as she saw ethne unlocking the case of her violin she went out on to the terrace she felt that she could not sit patiently in her company so that when durrance entered the drawing-room he found ethne alone there she was seated in the window and already tightening the strings of a violin durrance took a chair behind her in the shadows what shall i play for you she asked the mousseline overture he answered you played it on the first evening when i came to ramelton i remember so well how you played it then play it again tonight i want to compare i have played it since never to me they were alone in the room 
the window stood open it was a night of moonlight ethne suddenly crossed to the lamp and put it out she resumed the seat while durrance remained in the shadow leaning forward with his hands upon his knees listening but with an intentness of which he had given no sign that evening he was applying as he thought a final test upon which his life and hers should be decided ethne's violin would tell him assuredly whether he was right or no would friendship speak from it or the something more than friendship ethne played the overture and as she played she forgot that durrance was in the room behind her in the garden the air was still and summer warm and fragrant on the creek the moonlight lay like a solid floor of silver the trees stood dreaming to the stars and as the music floated loud out across the silent lawn ethne had a sudden fancy that it might perhaps travel down the creek and over the salcom bar and across the moonlight seas and strike small yet wonderfully clear like fairy music upon the ears of a man sleeping somewhere far away beneath the brightness of the southern stars with the cool night wind of the desert blowing upon his face if he could only hear she thought if he could only wake and know that what he heard was a message of friendship and with this fancy in her mind she played with such skill as she had never used before she made of a violin a voice of sympathy the fancy grew and changed as she played the music became a bridge swung in mid-air across the world upon which just for these few minutes she and harry feversham might meet and shake hands they would separate of course forthwith and each one go upon the allotted way but these few minutes would be a help to both along the separate ways the chords rang upon silence it seemed to ethne they declaimed the pride which had come to her that day a fancy grew into a belief it was no longer if he should hear but he must hear and so carried away was she from the discretion of thought that a strange hope suddenly sprang up and enthralled her if he could answer she lingered upon the last bars waiting for the answer and when the music had died down to silence she sat with a violin upon her knees looking eagerly out across the moonlight garden and an answer did come but it was not carried up the creek and across the lawn it came from the dark shadow of the room behind her and it was spoken through the voice of durrance ethne where do you think i heard that overture last played ethne was roused with a start to the consciousness that durrance was in the room and she answered like one shaken suddenly out of sleep why you told me at ramelton when you first came to lennon house i have heard it since though it was not played by you it was not really played at all but a melody of it not even that really but a suggestion of a melody i heard stumble out upon a zither with many false notes by a greek in a bare little whitewashed cafe lit by one glaring lamp at wadi halfa this overture she said how strange not so strange after all for the greek was harry feversham so the answer had come ethne had no doubt that it was an answer she sat very still in the moonlight only had anyone bent over her with eyes to see he would have discovered that her eyelids were closed there followed a long silence she did not consider why durrance having kept this knowledge secret so long should speak of it now she did not ask what harry feversham was doing that he must play the zither in a mean cafe at wadi halfa but it seemed to her that he had spoken to her as she to him the music had after all been a bridge it was not even strange that he had used durrance's voice wherewith to speak to her when was this she asked at length in february of this year i will tell you about it yes please tell me and durrance spoke out of the shadows of the room end of chapter seventeen
Chapter 18 of The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. The Answer to the Overture. Ethne did not turn towards Durrance or move at all from her attitude. She sat with him, violin upon her knees, looking across the moonlight garden to the band of silver in the gap of the trees, and she kept her position deliberately, for it helped her to believe that Harry Feversham himself was speaking to her. She was able to forget that he was speaking through the voice of Durrance. She almost forgot that Durrance was even in the room. She listened with Durrance's own intentness, and anxious that the voice should speak very slowly, so that the message might take a long time in the telling, and she gather it all jealously to her heart. It was on the night before I started eastward into the desert, for the last time, said Durrance, and the deep longing and regret with which he dwelt upon that last time, for once left Ethne quite untouched. Yes, she said, that was in February, the middle of the month, wasn't it? Do you remember the day? I should like to know the exact day, if you can tell me. The 15th, said Durrance, and Ethne repeated the date meditatively. I was at Glenola all February, she said. What was I doing on the 15th? It does not matter. She had felt a queer sort of surprise all the time when Willoughby was telling his story that morning, that she had not known by some instinct of these incidents at the actual moment of their occurrence. The surprise returned to her now. It was strange that she should have had to wait for this August night and this summer garden of moonlight and closed flowers before she learned of the meeting between Feversham and Durrance on February 15th and heard the message. And the remorse came to her because of that delay. It was my own fault, she said to herself. If I had kept my faith in him, I should have known at once. I am well punished. It did not at all occur to her that the message could convey any but the best of news. It would carry on the good tidings which she had already heard. It would enlarge and complete, so that this day might be rounded to perfection. Of this she was quite sure. Well, she said, go on. I have been busy all day in my office finishing up my work. I turned the key in the door at ten o'clock, thinking with relief that for six weeks I should not open it, and I strolled northward out of the Wadi Halfa along the Nile bank into the little town of Tufike. As I entered the main street, I saw a small crowd, Arabs, Negroes, a Greek or two, and some Egyptian soldiers standing outside the cafe and lit up by a glare of light from within. As I came nearer, I heard the sound of a violin and a zither, but most vilely played, jingling out a waltz. I stood at the back of the crowd and looked over the shoulders of the men in front of me into the room. It was a place of four bare whitewashed walls. A bar stood in one corner. A wooden bench or two were ranged against the walls, and a single unshaded paraffin lamp swung and glared from the ceiling. A troop of itinerant musicians were playing to that crowd of Negroes and Arabs and Egyptians for a night's lodging and the price of a meal. There were four of them, and, so far as I could see, all four were Greeks. Two were evidently man and wife. They were both old, both slatternly, and almost in rags. The man, a thin, sallow-faced fellow with gray hair and a black mustache. The woman, fat, coarse of face, unwieldy of body. Of the other two, one, it seemed, must be their daughter. A girl of seventeen and not good-looking, really, but dressed and turned out with a scrupulous care, which in those sordid and mean surroundings lent her good looks. The care, indeed, with which she was dressed assured me she was their daughter, and to tell the truth, I was rather touched by the thought that the father and mother would go in rags so that she, at all costs, might be trim. A clean ribbon bound back her hair, an untorn frock of some white stuff clothed her tidily. Even her shoes were neat. 
the fourth was a young man he was seated in the window with his back towards me bending over his zither but i could see that he wore a beard when i came up the old man was playing the violin though playing it is not indeed the word the noise he made was more like the squeaking of a pencil of a slate it set one's teeth on edge the violin itself seemed to squeal with pain and while he fiddled and the young man hammered at his zither the old woman and girl slowly revolved in a waltz it may sound comic to hear about it but if you could have seen it fairly plucked at one's heart i do not think that i have ever in my life witnessed anything quite so sad the little crowd outside negroes mind you laughing at the troop passing clumsy heavy-footed shining with heat lumbering round slowly panting with her exertions the girl lissom and young the two men with their discordant torturing music and just above you the great planets and stars of an african sky and just about you the great silent and spacious dignity of the moonlit desert imagine it the very ineptness of the entertainment actually hurt one he paused for a moment while ethne pictured to herself the scene which he had described she saw harry feversham bending over the, his zither she saw harry feversham bending over his zither and at once she asked herself what was he doing with that troop it was intelligible enough that he would not care to return to england it was certain that he would not come back to her unless she sent for him and she knew from what captain willoughby had said that he expected no message from her he had not left with willoughby the name of any place where a letter could reach him but what was he doing at wadi Haffa, masquerading with this itinerant troop he had money so much willoughby had told her you spoke to him she asked suddenly to whom oh to harry returned duras yes afterwards when i found out it was he who was playing the zither yes and how did you find out ethne asked the waltz came to an end the old woman sank exhausted upon the bench against the whitewashed wall the young man raised his head from his zither the old man scraped a new chord upon his violin and the girl stood forward to sing her voice had youth and freshness, but no other quality of music. Her singing was as inept as the rest of the entertainment. Yet the old man smiled. The mother beat time with a heavy foot and nodded at her husband with pride in their daughter's accomplishment. And again in the throng, the ill-conditioned talk, the untranslatable jests of the Arabs and the Negroes went their round. It was horrible, don't you think? yes answered ethne but slowly in an absent voice as she had felt no sympathy for durance when he began to speak so she had none to spare for these three outcasts of fortune she was too absorbed in the mystery of, of harry feversham's present at wadi Haffa. she was listening too closely for the message which he sent to her though through the open window the moon threw a broad panel of silver light upon the floor of the room close to her feet she sat gazing into it as she listened as though it was itself a window through which if she looked but hard enough she might see very small and far away that lighted cafe blazing upon the street of the little town of tufaike on the frontier of the sudan well she asked and after the song was ended the young man with his back towards me durant resumed began to fumble out a solo upon the zither he struck so many false notes no tune was to be apprehended at first the laughter and noise grew amongst the crowd and i was just turning away rather sick at heart when some notes a succession of notes played correctly by chance suddenly arrested me i listened again and sort of haunting melody began to emerge a weak thin thing with no soul in it a ghost of a melody and yet familiar i stood listening in a street of sand between the hovels fringed by a row of stunted trees and i was carried away out of the east to ramelton 
and to a summer night beneath the melting sky of Donegal, when you sat by the open window as you sit now and played the Mousseline overture which you have played again tonight. It was a melody from this overture, she exclaimed. Yes, and it was Harry Feversham who played the melody. I did not guess it at once. I was not very quick in those days. But you are now, said Ethne, quicker. At all events, I should have guessed it now. Then, however, I was only curious. I wondered how it was that an itinerant Greek came to pick up the tune. At all events, I determined to reward him for his diligence. I thought that you would like me to. Yes, said Ethne in a whisper. So, when he came out from the cafe, and with his hat in his hand passed through the jeering crowd, I threw a sovereign into the hat. He turned to me with a start of surprise. In spite of his beard, I knew him. Besides, before he could check himself, he cried out, Jack, you can have made no mistake then, said Ethne in a wondering voice. No, the man who strummed upon the zither was. The Christian name was upon her lips but she had the wit to catch it back unuttered, was Mr. Feversham, but he knew no music. I remember very well. She laughed with a momentary recollection of Feversham's utter inability to appreciate any music except that which she herself evoked from her violin. He had no ear. You couldn't invent a discord harsh enough even to attract his attention. He could never have remembered any melody from the Mousseline Overture. Yet it was Harry Feversham, he answered. Somehow he had remembered, I can understand it, he would have so little he cared to remember, and that little he would have striven with all his might to bring clearly back to mind. Somehow, too, by much practice, I suppose, he had managed to elicit from his zither some sort of resemblance to what he remembered. Can't you imagine him working the scrap of music out in his brain, humming it over, whistling it unaccounted times with perpetual errors and confusion until some fine day he got it safe and sure and fixed it in his thoughts? I can. Can't you imagine him then picking it out seditiously and laboriously on the strings? I can. Indeed I can. Thus Ethne got her answer, and Durrance interpreted it to her understanding. She sat silent and very deeply moved by the story he had told to her. It was fitting that this overture, a favorite piece of music, should have conveyed the message that he had not forgotten her, that in spite of the fourth white feather he thought of her with friendship, Harry Feversham had not striven so laboriously to learn that melody in vain. Ethne was stirred as she had thought nothing would ever again have the power to stir. He wondered whether Harry, as he sat in the little bare whitewashed cafe and strummed out his music to the Negroes and Greeks and Arabs gathered about the window, had dreamed, as she had done tonight, that somehow, thin and feeble as it was, some echo of the melody might reach across the world. She knew not how, for very certain that, however much she might in the future pretend to forget Harry Feversham, it would never be more than a pretense. The vision of the lighted cafe in the desert town would never be very far from her thoughts, but she had no intention of relaxing on that account from a determination to pretend to forget. The mere knowledge that she had at one time been unjustly harsh to Harry made her yet more resolved that Durrance should not suffer for any fault of hers. I told you last year, Ethne, at Hill Street, Durrance resumed, that I never wished to see Feversham again. I was wrong. The reluctance was all on his side and not at all on mine. For the moment that he realized he had called out my name, he tried to edge backwards from me into the crowd. He began to gabble Greek, but I caught him by the arm, and I would not let him go. He had done you some great wrong that I knew, but I could not remember it then. 
i only remember that years before harry feversham had been my friend my one great friend that we had rowed in the same college boat at oxford he at stroke i at seven that the stripes on his jersey during three successive eights had made my eyes dizzy during those last hundred yards of spurt past the barges we had bathed together in sanford lasher on summer afternoons we had had supper on kennington island we had cut lectures and paddled up the share to islip and here he was at wadi hoffa herding with that troop an outcast sunk to such a depth of ill fortune that he must come to that squalid little town and play the zither vilely before a crowd of natives and a few greek clerks for his night's lodging and the price of a meal no ethne interrupted suddenly it was not for that reason that he went to wadi haifa why then asked durrance i cannot think but he was not in any need of money his father had continued his allowance and he had accepted it you are sure quite sure i heard it only to-day said ethne it was a slip but ethne for once was off her guard that night she did not even notice that she had made a slip she was too engrossed in durrance's story durrance himself however was not less preoccupied and so the statement passed for the moment unobserved by either so you never knew what brought mr feversham to haifa she asked did you not ask him why didn't you why she was disappointed and the bitterness of her disappointment gave passion to her cry here was the last news of harry feversham and it was brought to her incomplete like the half sheet of a letter the omission might never be repaired i was a fool said durrance there was almost as much regret in his voice now as there had been in hers and because of that regret he did not remark the passion with which she had spoken i shall not easily forgive myself he was my friend you see i had him by the arm and i let him go i was a fool and he knocked upon his forehead with his fist he tried arabic durrance resumed pleading that he and his companions were just poor peaceable people that if i had given him too much money i should take it back and all the while he dragged away from me but i held him fast i said harry feversham that won't do and upon that he gave in and spoke in english whispering it let me go jack let me go there was the crowd about us it was evident that harry had some reason for secrecy it might have been shame for all i knew shame at his downfall i said come up to my quarters in haifa as soon as you are free and i let him go all that night i waited for him on the veranda but he did not come in the morning i had to start across the desert i only spoke of him to a friend who came to see me dot to calder in fact you know of him the man who sent you the telegrams said durrance with a laugh yes i remember ethne answered it was the second slip she had made that night the receipt of calder's telegram was just one of the things that durrance was not to know but again she was unaware that she had made a slip at all she did not even consider how durrance had come to know or guess that the telegram had ever been dispatched at the very last moment durrance resumed when my camel had risen from the ground i stooped down to speak to him to tell him to see feversham but i did not you see i knew nothing about his allowance i merely thought that he had fallen rather low it did not seem fair to him that another should know of it so i rode on and kept silence ethne nodded her head she could not but approve however poignant her regret but a lost news so you never saw mr feversham again i was away nine weeks i came back blind he answered simply and the very simplicity of his words went to ethne's heart he was apologizing for his blindness which had hindered him from inquiring she began to wake to the comprehension that it was really durrance who was speaking to her but he continued to speak and what he said drove her quite out of all caution 
i went at once to cairo and called the came with me there i told him of harry feversham and how i had seen him at tufika i asked calder when he got back to haifa to make inquiries to find and help harry feversham if he could i asked him too to let me know the result i received a letter from calder a week ago and i am troubled by it very much troubled what did he say ethne asked apprehensively and she turned in her chair away from the moonlight towards the shadow of the room and durance she bent forward to see his face but the darkness hid it a sudden fear struck through her and chilled her blood but out of the darkness durance spoke that the two women and the old greek had gone back northward on a steamer to assuan mr feversham remained at wadi hafa then that is so isn't it she said eagerly no durrance replied harry feversham did not remain he slipped past haifa the day after i started towards the east he went out in the morning and to the south into the desert yes but the desert to the south the enemy's country he went just as i saw him carrying his zither he was seen there can be no doubt ethne was quite silent for a while then she asked you have that letter with you yes i should like to read it she rose from her chair and walked across to durrance he took the letter from his pocket and gave it to her and she carried it over to the window the moonlight was strong ethne stood close to the window with a hand pressed upon her heart and read it through once and again the letter was explicit the greek who owned the cafe at which the troupe had performed admitted that giuseppe under which name he knew feversham had wandered south carrying a water skin and a store of dates though why he either did not know or would not tell ethne had a question to ask but it was some time before she could trust her lips to utter it distinctly and without faltering what will happen to him at the best capture at the worst death death by starvation or thirst or at the hands of the dervishes but there is just a hope that it might be only capture and imprisonment you see he was white if caught his captures might think him a spy they would be sure he had knowledge of our plans and our strength i think that would most likely send him to Omdurman. i have written to calder spies go out and in from wadi hafa we often hear of things which happen in Omdurman. if feversham is taken there sooner or later i shall know but he must have gone mad it is the only explanation ethne had another and she knew hers to be the right one she was off her guard and she spoke it aloud to durrance colonel trench she said is a prisoner at omdurman oh yes answered durrance feversham will not be quite alone there is some comfort in that and perhaps something may be done when i hear from calder i will tell you perhaps something may be done it was evident that durrance had misconstrued her remark he at all events was still in the dark as to the motive which had taken feversham southward beyond the egyptian patrols and he must remain in the dark for ethne did not even now slacken in her determination still to pretend to have forgotten she stood at the window with the letter clutched in her hand she must utter no cry she must not swoon she must keep very still and quiet and speak when needed with a quiet voice even though she knew that harry feversham had gone southward to join colonel trench and omdurman but so much was beyond her strength for as colonel durrance began to speak again the desire to escape to be alone with this terrible news became irresistible the cool quietude of the garden the dark shadows of the trees called to her perhaps you will wonder said durrance why i have told you to-night what i have up to now kept to myself i did not dare to tell it to you before i want to explain why ethne did not notice the exultation in his voice she did not consider what his explanation might be she only felt that she could not now endure to listen to it the mere sound of a human voice had become an unendurable thing she hardly knew indeed that durrance was speaking she was only aware that a voice spoke and that the voice must stop 
she was close by the window a single silent step and she was across the sill and free durrance continued to speak out of the darkness engrossed in what he said and ethne did not listen to a word she gathered her skirts carefully so that they should not rustle and stepped from the window this was the third slip which she made upon that eventful night end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the four feathers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by gary Ullman. the four feathers by a e w mason mrs adair interferes ethne had thought to escape quite unobserved when Mrs. Adair was sitting upon the terrace in the shadow of the house, not very far from the open window of the drawing room, she saw Ethne lightly cross the terrace and run down the steps into the garden, and she wondered at the precipitancy of her movements. Ethne seemed to be taking flight and in sort of desperation. The incident was singular, and remarkably singular to Mrs. Adair, who, from the angle in which she sat, commanded a view of that open window through which the moonlight shone. She had seen Ethne turn out the lamp and the swift change in the room from light to dark with its suggestion of secrecy, and the private talk of lovers had been a torture to her, but she had not fled from the torture. She had sat listening, and the music as it floated out upon the garden with its thrill of happiness its accent of yearning and the low hushed conversation which followed upon its cessation in that darkened room had struck upon a chord of imagination in mrs adair and had kindled her jealousy into scorching flame then suddenly ethne had taken flight the possibility of a quarrel mrs adair dismissed from her thoughts she knew very well that ethne was not of the kind which quarrels nor would she escape by running away, should she be entangled in a quarrel. But something still more singular occurred. Durrance continued to speak in that room from which Ethne had escaped. The sound of his voice reached Mrs. Adair's ears, though she could not distinguish the words. It was clear to her that he believed Ethne to be still with him. Mrs. Adair rose from her seat and walking silently upon the tips of her toes came close to the open window she heard durrance laugh light-heartedly and she listened to the words he spoke she could hear them plainly now though she could not see the man who spoke them he sat in the shadows i began to find out he was saying even on the first afternoon at hill street two months ago that there was only friendship on your side my blindness helped me with your face and your eyes in view, I should have believed without question just what you wished me to believe. But you had no longer these defenses. I, on my side, had grown quicker. I began in a word to see. For the first time in my life, I began to see. Mrs. Adair did not move. Durrance, upon his side, appeared to expect no answer or acknowledgment. He spoke with the voice of enjoyment which a man uses recounting difficulties which have ceased to hamper him, perplexities which have been long since unraveled. I should have definitely broken off our engagement, I suppose, at once, for I still believed, and as firmly as ever, that there must be more than friendship on both sides. But I had grown selfish. I warned you, Ethne. Selfishness was the blind man's particular fault. I waited and deferred, the time of marriage. I made excuses. I led you to believe that there was a chance of recovery when I knew there was none, for I hoped, as a man will, that with time your friendship might grow into more than friendship. So long as there was a chance of that, I, Ethne, could not let you go. So I listened for some softness in your voice, some new buoyancy in your laughter, some new deep thrill of the heart in the music which you played, longing for it. How much? Well, tonight I have burnt my boats. 
I have admitted to you that I knew friendship limited your thoughts of me. I have owned to you that there is no hope my sight will be restored. I have even dared tonight to tell you what I have kept secret for so long, my meeting with Harry Feversham and the peril he has run. And why? Because for the first time I have heard tonight just those signs for which I waited. The new softness, the new pride in your voice, the buoyancy in your laughter. They have been audible to me all this evening. The restraint and the tension were gone from your manner, and when you played it was as though someone with just your skill and knowledge played. But someone who let her heart speak resonantly through the music as until tonight you have never done. Ethne, Ethne! But at that moment Ethne was in the little enclosed garden whither she had led Captain Willoughby that morning. Here she was private. Her collier dog had joined her. She had reached the solitude and the silence which had become necessities for her. Few more words from Durrance and her prudence would have broken beneath the strain. All that pretense of affection which during these last months she had so sedulously built up about him like a wall, which he was never to look over, would have been struck down and leveled to the ground. Durrance, indeed, had already looked over the wall, was looking over it with amazed eyes at this instant. But that Ethne did not know, and to hinder him from knowing it, she had fled. The moonlight slept in silver upon the creek. The tall trees stood dreaming to the stars. The lapping of the tide against the bank was no louder than the music of a river. She sat down upon the bench and strove to gather some of the quietude of that summer night into her heart, and to learn from the growing things of nature about her something of their patience and their extraordinary perseverance. But the occurrence of the day had overtaxed her, and she could not. Only this morning, and in this very garden, the good news had come, and she had regained Harry Feversham. For in that way she thought of Willoughby's message. This morning she had regained him and this evening the bad news had come and she had lost him and most likely right to the very end of more life harry feversham meant to pay for his fall to the uttermost scruple and ethne cried out against his thoroughness which he had learned from no one other than herself surely she thought he might have been content in redeeming his honour in the eyes of one of the three he has done enough he has redeemed it in the eyes of all but he had gone south to join Colonel Trench in Omdurman, of that squalid and shallowless town, of its hideous barbarities, of the horrors of its prison house. Ethne knew nothing at all, but Captain Willoughby had hinted enough to fill her imagination with terrors. He had offered to explain to her what captivity in Omdurman implied, and she wrung her hands as she remembered that she had refused to listen. What cruelties might not be practiced? Even now, at that very hour, perhaps, on this night of summer, but she dared not let her thoughts wander that way. The lapping of the tide against the banks was like the music of a river. It brought to Ethne's mind one particular river which had sung and babbled in her ears when five years ago she had watched out another summer night till dawn never had she so hungered for her own country and the companionship of its brown hills and streams no not even this afternoon when she had sat at her window and watched the lights change upon the creek donegal held a sanctity for her it seemed when she dwelled in it to set her in a way apart from and above earthly taints and as her heart went out in a great longing towards it now a sudden fierce loathing for the concealments, the shifts and maneuvers which she had practiced, and still must practice, sprang up within her. A great weariness came upon her, too, but she did not change from her fixed resolve. Two lives were not to be spoiled because she lived in the world. Tomorrow she could gather up her strength and begin again, for Durrance must never know that there was another whom she placed before him in her thoughts. Meanwhile, however, Durrance, within the drawing-room, brought his confession to an end. So you see, he said, I could not speak of Harry Feversham until tonight. 
for I was afraid that what I had to tell you would hurt you very much. I was afraid that you still remembered him, in spite of those five years. I knew, of course, that you were my friend, but I doubted whether in your heart you were not more than that to him. Tonight, however, I could tell you without fear. Now, at all events, he expected an answer. Mrs. Adair, still standing by the window, heard him move in the shadows. Ethne, he said, with some surprise in his voice. And since again no answer came, he rose and walked towards the chair in which Ethne had sat. Mrs. Adair could see him now. His hands fell for and grasped the back of the chair. He bent over it, as though he thought Ethne was leaning forward with her hands upon her knees. Ethne, he said again, and there was in this iteration of her name more trouble and doubt than surprise. It seemed to Mrs. Adair that he dreaded to find her silently weeping. He was beginning to speculate whether, after all, he had been right in his inference from Ethne's recapture of her youth tonight, whether the shadow of Feversham did not, after all, fall between them. He leaned further forward, feeling with his hand, and suddenly a string of Ethne's violin twanged loud. She had left it lying on the chair, and his fingers had touched it. Durance drew himself up straight and stood quite motionless and silent, like a man who had suffered a shock and is bewildered. He passed his hand across his forehead once or twice, and then, without calling upon Ethne again, he advanced to the open window. Mrs. Adair did not move, and she held her breath. There was just the width of the sill between them. The moonlight struck full upon Durrance, and she saw a comprehension gradually dawn in his face that someone was standing close to him. Ethne, he said a third time, and now he appealed. He stretched out a hand timidly and touched her dress. It is not Ethne, he said with a start. No, it is not Ethne, Mrs. Adair answered quickly. Durrance drew back a step from the window and for a little while was silent. Where had she gone, he asked at length. Into the garden. She ran across the terrace and down the steps very quickly and silently. I saw her from my chair. Then I heard you speaking alone. Can you see her now in the garden? No. She went across the lawn towards the trees and their great shadows. There is only the moonlight in the garden now. Durrance stepped across the window stand and stood by the side of Mrs. Adair. The last slip which Ethne had made betrayed her inevitably to the man who had grown quick. There could be only one reason for a sudden, unexplained and secret flight. He had told her that Feversham had wandered south from Wadi Halfa into the savage country. He had spoken out his fears as to Feversham's fate without reserve, thinking that she had forgotten him and indeed rather inclined to blame her for the callous indifference with which she received the news the callousness was a mere mask and she had fled because she no longer had the strength to hold it up before her face his first suspicions had been right feversham still stood between ethne and himself and held them at arm's length she ran as though she was in a Great trouble, and hardly knew what she was doing, Mrs. Adair continued. Did you cause the trouble? Yes. I thought so, from what I heard you say. Mrs. Adair wanted to hurt, and in spite of Durrance's impenetrable face, she felt that she had succeeded. It was a small sort of compensation for the weeks of mortification which she had endured. There is something which might be said for Mrs. Adair. Extenuations might be pleaded even if no deference was made for she like ethne was overtaxed that night that calm pale face of ours hid the quick passions of the south and she had been racked by them to the limits of endurance there had been something grotesque something rather horrible in the outbreak and confessions by durrance after ethne had fled from the room he was speaking out his heart to an empty chair she herself had stood without the window with a bitter longing that he had spoken so to her and a bitter knowledge that he never would. She was sunk deep in humiliation. The irony of the position tortured her. It was like a jest of grim, selfish gods played off upon ineffectual mortals to their hurt. 
and at the bottom of all the thoughts rankled that memory of the extinguished lamp and the low hushed voices speaking one to the other in darkness therefore she spoke to give pain and was glad that she gave it even though it was to the man whom she coveted there's one thing which i don't understand said durrance i mean the charge which we both noticed in ethne tonight i mistook the cause of it that's evident i was a fool but there must have been a cause the gift of laughter has been restored to her her gravity her air of calculation had vanished she became just what she was five years ago exactly mrs adair answered just what she was before mr feversham disappeared from ramelton you are so quick colonel durrance ethne had good news of mr feversham this morning durrance turned quickly towards her and mrs adair felt a pleasure at his abrupt movement she had provoked the display of some emotion and the display of emotion was preferable to his composure are you quite sure he asked as sure as that you gave her the worst news tonight she replied but durrance did not need the answer ethne had made another slip that evening and though unnoticed at the time it came back to durrance's memory now she had declared that feversham still drew an allowance from his father i heard it only today she had said yes ethne heard news of feversham today he said slowly did she make a mistake five years ago there was some wrong thing harry feversham was supposed to have done but was there really more misunderstanding than wrong did she misjudge him has she today learnt that she misjudged him i will tell you what i know and it is not very much but i think it is fair that you should know it wait a moment please mrs adair said durrance sharply he had put his questions rather to himself than to his companion and he was not sure that he wished her to answer them he walked abruptly away from her and leaned upon the balustrade with his face towards the garden it seemed to him rather treacherous to allow mrs adair to disclose what ethne herself evidently intended to conceal but he knew why ethne wished to conceal it she wished him never to suspect that she retained any love for harry feversham on the other hand however he did not falter from his own belief marriage between a man crippled like himself and a woman active and vigorous like ethne could never be right unless both brought more than friendship he turned back to mrs adair i am no casuist he said but here disloyalty seems the truest loyalty of all tell me what you know mrs adair something might be done perhaps for feversham from ashuan or sorkin something might be done this news this the good news came i suppose this afternoon when i was at home no this morning when you were here it was brought by captain willoughby who was once an officer in mr feversham's regiment he is now deputy governor of swarkin said durrance i know the man for three years we were together in that town well he sailed down the from kingsbridge you and ethne were walking across the lawn when he landed from the creek ethne left you and went forward to meet him i saw them meet because i happened to be looking out of this window at the moment yes ethne went forward there was a stranger whom she did not know i remember they spoke for a few moments and then ethne led him towards the trees at once without looking back as though she had forgotten said mrs adair that little stab she had not been able to deny herself but it evoked no sign of pain as though she had forgotten me you mean said durrance quite quietly completing her sentence no doubt she had they went together into the little enclosed garden on the bank and durrance started as she spoke yes you followed them continued mrs adair curiously she had been puzzled as to how durrance had missed them they were there then he said slowly on that seat in the enclosure all the while mrs adair waited for a more definite explanation of the mystery but she got none well he asked they stayed there for a long while you had gone home across the fields before they came outside into the open 
I was in the garden, and indeed happened to be actually upon the bank. So you saw Captain Willoughby. Perhaps you spoke to him? Yes, Ethne introduced him, but she would not let him stay. She hurried him into his boat and back to Kingsbridge at once. Then, how did you know Captain Willoughby brought good news of Harry Feversham? Ethne told me that they had been talking of him. His manner and her laugh showed me no less clearly that the news was good. Yes, said Durrance, and he nodded his head in assent. Captain Willoughby's tidings had begotten that new pride and buoyancy in Ethne which he had so readily taken to himself. Signs of the necessary something more than friendship, so he had accounted them. And he was right so far, but it was not he who had inspired them. His very penetration and insight had led him astray. He was silent for a few months, and Mrs. Adair searched his face in the moonlight for some evidence that he resented Ethne's secrecy, but she searched in vain. And that is all, said Durrance. Not quite. Captain Willoughby brought a token from Mr. Feversham. Ethne carried it back to the house in her hand. Her eyes were upon it all the way. Her lips smiled at it. I do not think there is anything half so precious to her in all the world. A token? A little white feather, said Mrs. Adair, all soiled and speckled with dust. Can you read the riddle of that feather? Not yet, Durrance replied. He walked once or twice along the terrace and back, lost in thought. Then he went into the house and fetched his cap from the hall. He came back to Mrs. Adair. It was kind of you to tell me this, he said. I want you to add to your kindness. When I was in the drawing room alone and you came to the window, how much did you hear? What were the first words? Mrs. Adair's answer relieved him of a fear. Ethne had heard nothing whatever of his confession. Yes, he said. She moved to the window to read a letter by the moonlight. She must have escaped from the room the moment she had read it. Consequently, she did not hear that I had no longer any hope of recovering my sight, and that I merely used the pretense of a hope in order to delay our marriage. I am glad of that, very glad. He shook hands with Mrs. Adair and said good night. You see, he added absently, if I hear that Harry Feversham is in Omdurman, something might perhaps be done from Sorkin or a Suan. something might be done which way did ethne go over to the water she had a dog with her i hope the dog followed her said mrs adair i am glad said durrance he knew quite well what comfort the dog would be to ethne in this bad hour and perhaps he rather emptied the dog Mrs. Adair wondered that at a moment of such distress to him he could still spare a thought for so small an alleviation of Ethne's trouble. She watched him cross the garden to the stile in the hedge. He walked steadily forward upon the path like a man who sees. There was nothing in his gait or bearing to reveal that the one thing left to him had that evening been taken away. End of chapter 19。Chapter 20 of The Four Feathers。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lewis. The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason. Chapter 20 West and East. Durrance found his body servant waiting up for him when he had come across the fields to his own house of Gessens. You can turn the lights out and go to bed, said Durrance, and he walked through the hall into his study. The name hardly described the room, for it had always been more of a gun room than a study. He sat for some while in his chair, and then began to walk gently about the room in the dark. There were many cups and goblets scattered about the room, which Durrance had won in his past days. He knew them, each one by their shape and position, 
and he drew a kind of comfort from the feel of them. He took them up one by one and touched them and fondled them, wondering whether, now that he was blind, they were kept as clean and bright as they used to be. This one, a thin-stemmed goblet, he had won in a regimental steeplechase at Colchester. He could remember the day, with its clouds and gray sky and the dull look of the plowed fields between the hedges. That pewter, which stood upon his writing desk and which had formed a convenient holder for his pens, when pens had been of use, he had acquired very long ago in his college fours when he was a freshman at Oxford. The hoof of a favorite horse mounted in silver made an ornament upon the mantelpiece. His trophies made the room a gigantic diary. He fingered his records of good days gone by and came at last to his guns and rifles. He took them down from their racks. They were to him much what Ethne's violin was to her and had stories for his ear alone. He sat with a Remington across his knees and lived over again one long hot day in the hills to the west of Berenice, during which he had stalked a lion across stony open country and killed him at three hundred yards just before sunset. Another talked to him, too, of his first ibex shot in the Cor Baraka and of antelope stalked in the mountains northward of Suakin. There was a little greener gun, which he had used upon midwinter nights in a boat upon this very creek of the Salcombe estuary. He had brought down his first mallard with that, and he lifted it and slid his left hand along the underside of the barrel and felt the butt settle comfortably into the hollow of his shoulder. But his weapons began to talk over loudly in his ears even as Ethne's violin in the earlier days after Harry Feversham was gone and she was left alone, had spoken with too penetrating a note to her. As he handled the locks and was aware that he could no longer see the sights, the sum of his losses was presented to him in a very definite and incontestable way. He put his guns away, and was seized suddenly with a desire to disregard his blindness, to pretend that it was no hindrance, and to pretend so hard that it should prove not to be one. The desire grew and shook him like a passion, and carried him winged out of the countries of dim stars straight to the east. The smell of the east, and its noises, and the domes of its mosques, the hot sun, the rabble in its streets, and the steel blue sky overhead caught at him till he was plucked from his chair and set pacing restlessly about his room. He dreamed himself to Port Said and was marshaled in the long procession of steamers down the waterway of the canal. The song of the Arabs coaling the ships was in his ears, and so loud that he could see them as they went at night time up and down the planks between the barges and the deck, an endless chain of naked figures, monotonously chanting and lurid in the red glare of the braziers. He traveled out of the canal, past the red headlands of the Sinaitic Peninsula, into the chills of the Gulf of Suez. He zigzagged down the Red Sea, while the Great Bear swung northward, low down in the sky above the rail of the quarter-deck, and the southern cross began to blaze in the south. He touched at Tor and at Yambo. He saw the tall white houses of Yetta lift themselves out of the sea and admired the dark brine weathered woodwork of their carved casements. He walked through the dusk of its roofed bazaars with the joy of the homesick after long years come home. And from Yetta he crossed between the narrowing coral reefs into the landlocked harbor of Suakin. Westward from Suakin stretched the desert. 
with all that meant to this man whom it had smitten and cast out the quiet padding of the camel's feet in sand the great rock cones rising sheer and abrupt as from a rippleless ocean towards which you march all day and get no nearer the gorgeous momentary blaze of sunset colors in the west the rustle of the wind through the short twilight when the west is a pure pale green and the east the darkest blue and the downward swoop of the planets out of nothing to the earth the inheritor of the other places dreamed himself back into his inheritance as he tramped to and fro forgetful of his blindness and parched with desire as with a fever until unexpectedly he heard the blackbirds and the swallows bustling and piping in the garden and knew that outside his window the world was white with dawn he waked from his dream at the homely sound there were to be no more journeys for him affliction had caged him and soldered a chain about his leg he felt his way by the balustrade up the stairs to his bed he fell asleep as the sun rose but at dongola on the great curve of the nile southwards of wadi halfa the sun was already blazing and its inhabitants were awake there was sport prepared for them this morning under the few palm trees before the house of the emir wad el nijurmi a white prisoner captured a week before close to the wells of el agia on the great arbane road by a party of arabs had been brought in during the night and now waited his fate at the emir's hands the news spread quick as a spark through the town already crowds of men and women and children flocked to this rare and pleasant spectacle in front of the palm trees an open space stretched to the gateway of the emir's house behind them a slope of sand descended flat and bare to the river harry feversham was standing under the trees guarded by four of the ansar soldiery his clothes had been stripped from him he wore only a torn and ragged jebba upon his body and a twist of cotton on his head to shield him from the sun his bare shoulders and arms were scorched and blistered his ankles were fettered his wrists were bound with a rope of palm fiber an iron collar was locked about his neck to which a chain was attached and this chain one of the soldiers held he stood and smiled at the mocking crowd about him and seemed well pleased like a lunatic that was the character which he had assumed if he could sustain it if he could baffle his captors so that they were at a loss whether he was a man really daft or an agent with promises of help and arms to the disaffected tribes of the cordofan then there was a chance that they might fear to dispose of him themselves and send him forward to omdurman but it was hard work inside the house the emir and his counsellors were debating his destiny on the river bank and within his view a high gallows stood out black and most sinister against the yellow sand harry feversham was very glad of the chain about his neck and the fetters on his legs they helped him to betray no panic by assuring him of its futility these hours of waiting while the sun rose higher and higher and no one came from the gateway were the worst he had ever as yet endured all through that fortnight in berber a hope of escape had sustained him and when that lantern shone upon him from behind in the ruined acres what had to be done must be done so quickly there was no time for fear or thought here there was time and too much of it he had time to anticipate and foresee he felt his heart sinking till he was faint just as in those distant days when he had heard the hounds scuffling and whining in a covert and he himself had sat shaking upon his horse he glanced furtively towards the gallows and foresaw the vultures perched upon his shoulders fluttering about his eyes but the man had grown during his years of probation 
the fear of physical suffering was not uppermost in his mind nor even the fear that he would walk unmanfully to the high gallows but a greater dread that if he died now here at dongola ethne would never take back that fourth feather and his strong hope of the afterwards would never come to its fulfillment he was very glad of the collar about his neck and the fetters on his legs he summoned his wits together, and standing there alone, without a companion to share his miseries, laughed and scraped and grimaced at his tormentors. An old hag danced and gesticulated before him, singing the while a monotonous song. The gestures were pantomimic, and menaced him with abominable mutilations. The words described in simple and unexpurgated language the grievous death agonies which immediately awaited him, and the eternity of torture in hell which he would subsequently suffer. Feversham understood and inwardly shuddered, but he only imitated her gestures and nodded and mowed at her as though she were singing to him of paradise. Others, taking their war trumpets, placed the mouths against the prisoner's ears and blew with all their might do you hear kaffir cried a child dancing with delight before him do you hear our ombayas blow louder blow louder but the prisoner only clapped his hands and cried out that the music was good finally there came to the group a tall warrior with a long heavy spear a cry was raised at his approach and a space was cleared he stood before the captive and poised his spear swinging it backwards and forward to make his arm supple before he thrust like a bowler before he delivers a ball at a cricket match feversham glanced wildly about him and seeing no escape suddenly flung out his breast to meet the blow but the spear never reached him for as the warrior lunged from the shoulder one of the four guards jerked the neck chain violently from behind and the prisoner was flung half throttled upon his back three times and each time to a roar of delight this pastime was repeated and then a soldier appeared in the gateway of najumi's house bring him in he cried and followed by the curses and threats of the crowd the prisoner was dragged under the arch across the courtyard into a dark room for a few moments Feversham could see nothing. Then his eyes began to adapt themselves to the gloom, and he distinguished a tall bearded man who sat upon an angarb, the native bedstead of the Sudan, and two others who squatted beside him on the ground. The man on the angarb was the emir. "'You are a spy of the government from Wadi Hafa,' he said. "'No, I am a musician,' returned the prisoner." and he laughed happily like a man that has made a jest. Najumi made a sign, and an instrument with many broken strings was handed to the captive. Feversham seated himself upon the ground, and with slow, fumbling fingers, breathing hard as he bent over the zither, he began to elicit a wavering melody. It was the melody to which Dorrance had listened in the streets of Talfiki on the eve of his last journey into the desert and which ethne eustace had played only the night before in the quiet drawing-room at southpool it was the only melody which feversham knew when he had done nizumi began again you are a spy i have told you the truth answered feversham stubbornly and nizumi took a different tone he called for food and the raw liver of a camel covered with salt and red pepper was placed before Feversham. Seldom had a man had smaller inclination to eat, but Feversham ate none the less, even of that unattractive dish, knowing well that reluctance would be construed as fear, and that the signs of fear might condemn him to death. And while he ate, Najumi questioned him in the silkiest voice about the fortifications of Cairo and the strength of the garrison at Asoan and the rumors of dissension between the Kedev and the Siddhar. But to each question Feversham replied, How should a Greek know of these matters? 
Nijumi rose from his angerib and roughly gave an order. The soldiers seized upon Feversham and dragged him out again into the sunlight. They poured water upon the palm rope which bound his wrist so that the thong swelled and bit into his flesh. Speak, Kafir. You carry promises to the Kordofan. Feversham was silent. He clung doggedly to the plan over which he had so long and so carefully pondered. He could not improve upon it, he was sure, by any alteration suggested by fear, at a moment when he could not think clearly. A rope was flung about his neck, and he was pushed and driven beneath the gallows. Speak, Kafir, said Najumi. So shall you escape death. Feversham smiled and grimaced and shook his head loosely from side to side. It was astonishing to him that he could do it that he did not fall down upon his knees and beg for mercy. It was still more astonishing to him that he felt no temptation so to demean himself. He wondered whether the oft-repeated story was true that criminals in English prisons went quietly and with dignity to the scaffold, because they had been drugged. For without drugs he seemed to be behaving with no less dignity himself. His heart was beating very fast, but it was with a sort of excitement. He did not even think of Ethne at that moment. And certainly the great dread that his strong hope would never be fulfilled did not trouble him at all. He had his allotted part to play, and he just played it, and that was all. Najumi looked at him sourly for a moment. He turned to the men, who stood ready to draw away from Feversham the anger reb on which he was placed. Tomorrow, said he, the Kaffir shall go to Omdurman. Feversham began to feel then that the rope of palm fiber tortured his wrist. End of chapter 20「Twenty One of the Four Feathers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lewis. The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason. Chapter 21. Ethne Makes Another Slip. Mrs. Adair speculated with some uneasiness upon the consequences of the disclosures which she had made to Durrance. She was in doubt as to the course which he would take. It seemed possible that he might frankly tell Ethne of the mistake which he had made. He might admit that he had discovered the unreality of her affection for him and the reality of her love for Feathersham and if he made that admission, however carefully he tried to conceal her share in his discovery, he would hardly succeed. She would have to face Ethne, and she dreaded the moment when her companion's frank eyes would rest quietly upon hers, and her lips demand an explanation. It was, consequently, a relief to her, at first, that no outward change was visible in the relations of Ethne and Durrance. They met and spoke as though that day on which Willoughby had landed at the garden, and the evening when Ethne had played the Mousseline overture upon the violin had been blotted from their experience. Miss Adair was relieved at first, but when the sense of personal danger passed from her, and she saw that her interference had been apparently without effect, she began to be puzzled. A little while, and she was both angry and disappointed. Durrance, indeed, quickly made up his mind. Ethne wished him not to know. It was some consolation to her in her distress to believe that she had brought happiness to this one man whose friend she genuinely was and of that consolation Durrance was aware. He saw no reason to destroy it for the present. He must know, certainly, whether a misunderstanding or an irreparable breach separated Ethne from Feathersham before he took the steps he had in mind. 
he must have sure knowledge, too, of Harry Feathersham's fate. Therefore, he pretended to know nothing. He abandoned even his habit of attention and scrutiny, since for these there was no longer any need. He forced himself to a display of contentment. He made light of his misfortune, and professed to find in Ethne's company more than its compensation. "'You see,' he said to her, "'one can get used to blindness and take it as a natural thing. But one does not get used to you, Ethne. Each time one meets you, one discovers something new and fresh to delight one. Besides, there's always the possibility of a cure.' He had his reward— for Ethne understood that he had laid aside his suspicions, and she was able to set off his indefatigable cheerfulness against her own misery. And her misery was great. If for one day she had recaptured the likeness of heart which had been hers before the three white feathers came to Ramelton, she had now recaptured something of the grief which followed upon their coming. A difference there was, of course, her pride was restored, and she had a faint hope, born of Durrance's words, that Harry, after all, might perhaps be rescued. But she knew again the long and sleepless nights and the dull, hot misery of the head as she waited for the gray of the morning, for she could no longer pretend to herself that she looked upon Harry Feathersham as a friend who was dead. He was living and in what straits she dreaded to think, and yet thirsted to know. At rare times, indeed, her impatience got the better of her will. I suppose that escape is possible from Omdurman, she said one day, constraining her voice to an accent of indifference. Possible? Yes, I think so, Durrance answered cheerfully. Of course it is difficult, and would in any case take time, Attempts, for instance, have been made to get Trench out and others, but the attempts have not yet succeeded. The difficulty is the go-between. Ethne looked quickly at Durrance. The go-between? she asked. And then she said, I think I begin to understand, and pulled herself up abruptly. You mean the Arab who can come and go between Abdurman and the Egyptian frontier? Yes, he is usually some dervish peddler or merchant trading with the tribes of the Sudan who slips into Wadi Halfa or Asawan or Suakin and undertakes the work. Of course, his risk is great. He would have short shrift in Omdurman if his business were detected. So it is not to be wondered at that he shrinks the danger at the last moment. As often as not, too, he is a rogue. You make your arrangements with him in Egypt and hand him over the necessary money. In six months or a year, he comes back alone with a story of excuses. It was summer and the season unfavorable for an escape, or the prisoners were more strictly guarded, or he himself was suspected, and he needs more money. His tale may be true, and you give him more money, and he comes back again, and again he comes back alone. Ethne nodded her head. Exactly. Durrance had unconsciously explained to her a point which till now she had not understood. She was quite sure that Harry Feathersham aimed in some way at bringing help to Colonel Trench, but in what way his own capture was to serve that aim she could not determine. Now she understood. He was to be his own go-between and her hopes drew strength from this piece of new knowledge, for it was likely that he had laid his plans with care. He would be very anxious that the second feather should come back to her, and if he could fetch Trent safely out of Omdurman, he would not himself remain behind. Ethne was silent for a little while. They were sitting on the terrace, and the sunset was red upon the water of the creek. Life would not be easy, I suppose, in the prison of Omdurman, she said, and again she forced herself to indifference. Easy, exclaimed Durrance. No, it would not be easy. 
a hovel crowded with arabs without light or air and the roof perhaps two feet above your head into which you were locked up from sundown to morning very likely the prisoners would have to stand all night in that foul den so closely packed would they be imagine it even here in england on an evening like this think what it would be like on an august night in the sudan especially if you had memories say of a place like this to make the torture worse ethne looked out across that cool garden at this very moment harry feathersham might be struggling for breath in that dark and noisome hovel dry of throat and fevered with the heat with a vision before his eyes of the grass slopes of ramelton and with the music of the linen river liquid in his ears one would pray for death said ethne slowly unless she was on the point of adding unless one went there deliberately with a fixed thing to do but she cut the sentence short durrance carried it on unless there was a chance of escape he said and there is a chance if feathersham is in omdurman he was afraid that he had allowed himself to say too much about the horrors of the prison in omdurman and he added of course what i have described to you is mere hearsay and not to be trusted we have no knowledge prisoners may not have such bad times as we think and thereupon he let the subject drop nor did ethne mention it again it occurred to her at times to wonder in what way durrance had understood her abrupt disappearance from the drawing-room on the night when he had told her of his meeting with harry feversham but he never referred to it himself and she thought it wise to imitate his example the noticeable change in his manner the absence of that caution which had so distressed her allayed her fears it seemed that he had found for himself some perfectly simple and natural explanation at times too she asked herself why durrance had told her of that meeting in wadi halfa and of feversham's subsequent departure to the south but for that she found an explanation a strange explanation perhaps but it was simple enough and satisfactory to her she believed that the news was a message of which durrance was only the instrument it was meant for her ears and for her comprehension alone and durrance was bound to convey it to her by the will of a power above him his real reason she had not stayed to hear during the month of september then they had kept up the pretense every morning when durrance was in devonshire he would have come across the field to ethne at the pool and mrs adair watching them as they talked and laughed without a shadow of embarrassment or estrangement grew more angry and found it more difficult to hold her peace and to let the pretense go on it was a month of strain and tension to all three and not one of them but experienced a great relief when durrance visited his oculist in london and those visits increased in number and lengthened in duration and ethne was grateful for them she could throw off the mask for a little while she had an opportunity to be tired she had solitude wherein to gain strength to resume her high spirits upon durrance's return there came hours when despair seized hold of her shall i be able to keep up the pretense when we are married when we are always together she asked herself but she thrust the question back unanswered she dared not look forward lest even now her strength should fail her after the third visit durrance said to her do you remember that i once mentioned a famous oculist at wiesbaden it seems advisable that i should go to him you are recommended to go yes and to go alone ethne looked up at him with a shrewd quick glance you think that i should be dull at wiesbaden she said there is no fear of that i can rout out some relative to go with me no it's on my own account answered durrance i shall perhaps have to go into a home it's better to be quiet and to see no one for a time you are sure ethne asked it would hurt me if i thought you proposed this plan because you felt i would be happier at glenella no that is not the reason durrance answered 
and he answered quite truthfully. He felt it necessary for both of them that they should separate. He, no less than Ethne, suffered under the tyranny of perpetual stimulation. It was only because he knew how much store she set upon carrying out her resolve that two lives should not be spoilt because of her that he was able to hinder himself from crying out that he knew the truth. I am returning to London next week, he added, and when I come back I shall be in a position to tell you whether I am to go to Wiesbaden or not. Durrance had reason to be glad that he had mentioned his plan before the arrival of Calder's telegram from Wadi Halfa. Ethne was unable to connect his departure from her with the receipt of any news about Feversham. The telegram came one afternoon, and Durrance took it across to the pool in the evening and showed it to Ethne. There were only four words to the telegram. Feversham imprisoned at Omdurman. Durrance, with one of his new instincts of delicacy, which had been born in him lately by reason of his sufferings and the habit of thought, had moved away from Ethne's side as soon as he had given it to her, and had joined Mrs. Adair, who was reading a book in the drawing-room. He had folded up the telegram besides, so that by the time Ethne had unfolded it and saw the words, she was alone upon the terrace. She remembered what Durrance had said to her about the prison, and her imagination enlarged upon his words. The quiet of a September evening was upon the fields. A light mist arose from the creek and crept over the garden bank across the lawn. Already the prison doors were shut in that hot country at the junction of the Niles. He is to pay for his fault ten times over then, she cried, in revolt against the disproportion and the fault was his father's and mine too more than his own for neither of us understood she blamed herself for the gift of that fourth feather she leaned upon the stone balustrade with her eyes shut wondering whether harry would outlive this night whether he was still alive to outlive it the very coolness of the stones on which her hands pressed became the bitterest of reproaches something can now be done Durrance was coming from the window of the drawing-room and spoke as he came to warn her of his approach. He was and is my friend. I cannot leave him there. I shall write tonight to Calder. Money will not be spared. He is my friend, Ethne. You will see. From Suakin or from Assouan, something will be done. He put all the help to be offered to the credit of his own friendship. Ethne was not to believe that he imagined she had any further interest in Harry Feversham. She turned to him suddenly, almost interrupting him. Major Castleton is dead, she said. Castleton, he exclaimed. There was a Castleton in Feversham's regiment, is that the man? Yes, he is dead. He was killed at Tamai. You are sure, quite sure? He was within the square of the 2nd Brigade on the edge of the great gully when Osman Digma's men sprang out of the earth and broke through. I was in that square, too. I saw Castleton killed. I am glad, said Ethne. She spoke quite simply and distinctly. The first feather had been brought back by Captain Willoughby. It was just possible that Colonel Trench might bring back the second. Harry Feversham had succeeded once under great difficulties in the face of great peril. The peril was greater now, the difficulties more arduous to overcome, that she clearly understood. But she took the one success as an augury that another might follow it. Feversham would have laid his plans with care. He had money wherewith to carry them out, and besides, she was a woman of strong faith but she was relieved to know that the sender of the third feather could never be approached. Moreover, she hated him, and there was an end of the matter. Durrance was startled. He was a soldier of a type not so rare as the maker of war stories wished their readers to believe. Hector of Troy was his ancestor. He was neither hysterical in his language nor vindictive in his acts. He was not an elderly schoolboy with a taste for loud talk but a quiet man who did his work without noise, who could be stern when occasion needed, and of an unflinching severity. 
but whose nature was gentle and compassionate and this barbaric utterance of ethne eustace he did not understand you disliked major castleton so much he exclaimed i never knew him yet you are glad that he is dead i am quite glad said ethne stubbornly she made another slip when she spoke thus of major castleton and durrance did not pass it by unnoticed he remembered it and thought it over in his gun-room at gesson's it added something to the explanation which he was building up of harry feversham's disgrace and disappearance the story was gradually becoming clear to his sharpened wits captain willoughby's visit and the token he had brought had given him the clue a white feather could mean nothing but an accusation of cowardice durrance could not remember that he had ever detected any signs of cowardice in harry feversham and the charge startled him perpetually into incredulity but the fact remained something that happened on the night of the ball at lennon house and from that date harry had been an outcast suppose that a white feather had been forwarded to lennon house and had been opened in ethne's presence or more than one white feather ethne had come back from her long talk with willoughby holding that white feather as though there was nothing so precious in all the world so much mrs adair had told him it followed then that the cowardice was atoned or in one particular atoned ethne's recapture of her youth pointed inevitably to that conclusion she treasured the feather because it was no longer a symbol of cowardice but a symbol of cowardice atoned but harry feversham had not returned he still slunk in the world's byways willoughby then was not the only man who had brought the accusation there were others two others one of the two durrance had long since identified when durrance had suggested that harry might be taken to obdurman ethne had at once replied colonel trench is in obdurman she needed no explanation of harry's disappearance from wadi haffa into the southern soudan it was deliberate he had gone out to be captured to be taken to obdurman moreover ethne had spoken of the untrustworthiness of the go-between and there again had helped durrance in his conjectures there was some obligation upon feathersham to come to trench's help suppose that feathersham had laid his plans of rescue and had ventured out into the desert that he might be his own go-between it followed that a second feather had been sent to ramelton and that trench had sent it to-night durrance was able to join major castleton to trench and willoughby ethne's satisfaction at the death of a man whom she did not know could mean but the one thing there would be the same obligation resting upon feathersham with regard to major castleton if he lived it seemed likely that a third feather had come to lennon house and that major castleton had sent it durrance pondered over the solution of the problem and more and more he found it plausible there was one man who could have told him the truth and who had refused to tell it who would no doubt still refuse to tell it but that one man's help durrance intended to enlist and to this end he must come with the story pat upon his lips and no request for information yes he said i think that after my next visit to london i can pay a visit to lieutenant stutch End of chapter 21